Who wants to take the best shit of their entire life? Right here, I do. How do you do that? You go with Bub's Naturals Collagen Protein. You rip the thing open, you put it in your coffee, you stir it up, and you're on your way. Now, if taking the best shit of your entire life doesn't interest you, Collagen will also give you beautiful hair, great skin, and nails to die for. So, and you'll recover a lot quicker in between workouts if that's your thing. So now that we got the good shit out of the way, get it? <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about Bubs the company. Bubs is a tribute company to Glenn Bubs Doherty, who was a Navy SEAL and a CIA contractor who died defending American freedom in Benghazi, Libya. Bubs donates 10% of all proceeds to veteran organizations like the Glenn Doherty Foundation and 100% of all proceeds on Veterans Day. Let me tell you about Bubs' latest product that helps with energy, healthy digestion, your immune system, and your metabolism. Bub's Naturals Apple Cider Vinegar Gummies, which actually taste so damn good that I ate all 60 of them the first, <laughs> the first night I got them. They taste amazing, and man, I got a lot of energy now. Anyways, go to bubsnaturals.com, use promo code SEAN to take 20% off your order Thank you, Bubs Naturals, for being a sponsor of The Sean Ryan Show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. This week, we have a very special guest for you guys, something completely different, way out of the norm of what we usually do. This guy spent over 30 years behind bars and is still married to the same woman. I had the pleasure of meeting his beautiful bride, Maury. Ladies and gentlemen, Roger Reeves, the most prolific international drug smuggler in the world, is on The Sean Ryan Show. He used to run cocaine out of Colombia for Pablo Escobar, Ochoa, and the Medellin cartel. He ran hashish out of Pakistan. He's run just about every kind of drug you can think of from every nook and cranny corner of the world. Roger Reeves. It's a hell of a story. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment to the channel. And you guys remember these? Vigilance Leap Gummy Bears. They're coming back. It's going to be right around Black Friday. The only way to get these gummy bears to be able to find the link is one, either join my Patreon because they're going to get first dibs, or two, Sign up for our email newsletter. It's in the description. You can find it down there. We put all kinds of good stuff. There's gonna be an EDC pocket dump coming out soon, but if you wanna be notified on this and you wanna get the link on where to get these tasty gummy bears that are made right here in the USA, you gotta be subscribed to the email list. All right, love you all. Enjoy the show. I want to see the comments of what you think about this episode, and if you're feeling extra generous, go leave us a review on iTunes, and if you're feeling even more generous, head over to Spotify and leave us a review there too. All right, love you guys, enjoy the show, lots of good stuff coming, cheers.
Roger Reeves, welcome to the show. Mighty proud to be here. Thanks for thanks for making the trip. I really appreciate it. So you're one of the most prolific drug smugglers in the world. You broke out of prison five times. Moonshiner, smuggled cocaine, marijuana, worked for Pablo Escobar, the Medellin cartel, the Ochoa brothers. Is there anything you haven't done? I hope. <laughs> <laughs> but um, man, what a story. I've been listening to a lot of your podcasts lately, uh, doing some research on you. Skimmed through your book, didn't have the time to read it. It got a little late, but um, but I cannot wait to dive in on this. So once again, I just really appreciate you coming All down. Right. You, you just ask the questions, and I'll try to answer them. Perfect. Well, everybody starts off with a gift here. And uh, so here's the first part. Those are uh, Vigilance Elite Gummy Bears. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and... Just regular gummy bears, nothing funny going on. Oh, in there. why? We'll save that for after the show. Okay, good, good. Perfect. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the And then, day. because you spent so much time in Colombia, I got you a oh, little my. bottle. Cumbia. Cumbia. What in the world is that? That is a guariente. Oh, my God. Yeah. I have had to drink that a few times. <laughs> <laughs> I tried bring to bring back memories. I tried to find the original aguardiente, but uh, it's, after I drank that first, I thought about going down to South America and opening a a, a bourbon place yeah. and making whiskey because they need it back. They definitely need it, but, uh, <laughs> it but yeah, will, it will do the job. It's hard to find guaro in uh, in the middle you. of Tennessee. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We can crack into that at the end, but um, but I just want to start. I want to get a little bit of your childhood. That's one thing I didn't hear anything about in uh, the stuff that I read or listened to. And so we'll start with childhood, go through your whole career into prison when you got out, and um, that'll be it. But All right. I was born in uh, St. Augustine Hospital in the uh, East Coast Railroad Hospital back uh, January 26, 1943. Uh, my father worked... Uh, in a veneer mill, my mother and uh, uh, that was during the war effort. They, they, they was making boxes for shells to ship overseas. And uh, my great grandparents had a big farm up in Georgia in, in 1945 after the war was over. We moved up there. That's the earliest memories I have is, is going up there on the train and all that uh, dining car and riding with my grandma. And I slept with my grandma from the time I was just a little fella until I was 14 years old and she died. So uh, big old feather bed. So we moved up to Georgia to a three-mule farm. And uh, things, were, things were wonderful. The mules, I mean, I'd, I'd ride those mules to the field and cry if I couldn't go. And I'd ride to plow with my daddy plowing. And he'd say, it's hard right now. Sit hard. He'd make a little board on front of the plow for me to hold. And I'd put my little butt down real hard and to help him put the plow in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, life was great. And then my father started drinking, and he became an absolute hopeless alcoholic. But he's a wonderful man. He's intelligent. He was just, but he just loved that bottle better than he did life. How old were you when he became an alcoholic? I guess about eight or ten years old, and he Young. just come come right on and he died by the time I was seventeen years old. And uh, so I had seven little brothers and sisters, and. Uh, so my mother worked hard. She worked hard. She hated his drinking. And we lived in the house with his mother, my grandma, that I slept with. And my grandma, for some reason, got cross with my mother, and they didn't speak all my life. So uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I, I kept, I wanted a horse. And so uh, my grandma, well, I'm going to buy you a horse, Roger. We're going to go to town, and we're going to buy you a horse. She just was sweet and talking. Just, so I kept telling my mother about it. And she said, Roger, your grandma's not going to buy you a horse. Just hush about it. Grandma, mother said you ain't never going to buy me a horse. <laughs> they go get your Uncle G. And we went to Fitzgerald, Georgia, and went to the mule and horse lot. And there he was, a beautiful pinto back in the back. And they said, a little boy can't handle that. Boy, I didn't want nothing else. And they brought that horse. 
for $145. And man, he was just way too mean for me to handle. So my daddy came out there and tied him to a corner post and gave me a switch, said, ride him forever. <laughs> <laughs> so me and that horse rode for a long time with a three-foot lead. <laughs> Finally, I got work a horse, and I think that toughened me up to life for that little little, little horse. Really? Yeah, I do. I, I really do. That thing would bite me, and I'd bite him. He bit me, and I bit his ear, and he nearly jerked my head off. <laughs> <laughs> so that was life on the farm. <clears throat> and uh, I cropped a back and hoed and worked in the field hard. I mean, I, I would, and... Uh, we had three mules, and then later on we got a John Deere tractor, pop, pop, pop. You could hear it a mile. If anybody quit plowing, you could know he quit. So uh, my daddy died when I was 17 years old, and he, he died from an aneurysm. And one day, and it was a terrible, sad thing for a man 54 years old with seven little brothers and children. And, seven and, uh, of you guys. They called us in one by one. He just came in the morning. He came in and sat down, and it was, in his stomach, it, it, it had blown out. And... Uh, I don't want to delve into the sadness, but anyway, it was really sad. And he, they come in, uh, they said he can't live. So he said goodbye to all of us. And he told me, uh, I, I don't mind, son, dying that you can help your mom and these little little, little sisters and brothers you have. So uh, I tell that story to say that uh, a, a most unusual thing happened there shortly there after that. I had a sister a year younger than I was. She was 16. There was a fella from across the river, a big fella. He uh, asked her out on a date. These two of the guys, we knew them. So they uh, took her out and her cousin Barbara, and they went to the picture show, and it was all nice. And afterwards, she came in all clawed up, her clawed up, bloody on around her neck, and her said, and so, wow. She said they took her out and, uh, and tried to rape her. One of them sat on her head, and the other one tried to tear her clothes. And wow, well, what in the world to do? I didn't have a car or any way to go, but I knew I was had to do something. So the next day I walked down to a little village of Jacksonville, Georgia, and there was Stanley Wells. And uh, his daddy owned the, and him owned a little store, and he had an old Chrysler. And he said, you want to ride across the river to the skating rink? And I said, sure, Stanley, let's ride across there. We went across, and there was that man roller skating with a woman in a long white dress. And they was going around, ur, ur, around the corners. So I just went up and paid my dime for one of them large Coca-Colas, and I dried it off. <laughs> I didn't say nothing to nobody. And I walked out, and when he came by, I hit him in between the eyes with the bottom of that Coca-Cola bottle, and it ranged his head. <laughs> and I ran along beside him and kind of rearranged his face. And the only guy that owned the uh, skating rink, Bill Newman, he came along, grabbed my arm, and fell down in all the blood and broke his glasses. And everybody, the whole world just stopped. They must have been 100 skaters in that it's a cotton candy world just kept playing. <laughs> oh, man. And they come with a knife, and I thought, oh, oh boy, I grabbed that bottle. And uh, somebody cut his skates off to drag him out of all that mess. And so I walked out, and they said, why did you do it, Roger? And I said, April Fool. It was the first day of April. <laughs> no shit. My sisters couldn't get a date after that. <laughs> well, that's probably a good thing. <laughs> <clears throat> so that was my first brush with the law. Wow. Yeah. So when did you, when did you start studying to become a pilot? Uh, I back up there. I went on um, tell you about how I met Mari over there. Okay. I uh, uh, it was like in the grapes of wrath at John Steinbeck. They was advertising for tobacco, tobacco harvesters. We called it cropping tobacco. Yet you, you crop it, take the leaves off three or four at the time as it ripens. You have to look at the stalk and tell what it is. And. Uh, I was raised on a tobacco farm, so I knew how. So it was pay they was paying $20 a day room and board in Canada. Okay. And that was after our season finished down in Georgia. A lot of the boys here from South North Carolina went up there also and during those years. And so uh, it was $20 a day, and so it was like you could make six or $700 a year in six weeks. In after, Canada. In Canada after I was finished. That was, a, that was a huge amount of money. Why was everybody going to Canada to grow tobacco? Uh, I think the here. Dutch uh, and the Belgians, they found out that it would grow just north of uh, Lake Erie. It was kind of the banana belt of Canada. Okay. And it was just like 200 miles of solid tobacco and huge tobacco barns and beautiful. And it was beautiful farms. And so, But they had so much tobacco, they didn't have people to harvest it. So they advertised all far and wide. So I hitchhiked up there, and uh, I... Uh, 
after after a, a, a few a week or so, you get rid of the sand lugs and you go really fast. And so we could we'd finish by twenty two o'clock in the afternoon, and then I would pull suckers. And so I make thirty dollars a day. They pay you by the road. So some of the boys came from a neighboring farm and they said, "Roger, you want to go to the fair? Is a fair in Tilsonburg?" And I said, "Sure." I took a shower every evening after I came in in the greenhouse anyway, and I put on a pair of black slates and a shirt, and off to the carnival we went. Well, what a place it was. First, we went to the Hoochie Coochie Show for 50 cents, <laughs> and I'd never seen anything like that. It was just delightful. So then we go on down the road, and there's a man, a great big fellow with a long flowing beard. He must have weighed 350, 400 pounds, five brand new $100 bills, Anybody to wrestle my bear and get all four feet off the ground. $10 to anybody that's got guts enough to give it a try. What's your name, young man? <laughs> Roger Reeves. How much you weigh, Roger? <laughs> 145 pounds. 145 pound man against 600 pound beast. And the crowd's flocking in. And he opened that circus door, that little circus wagon, and threw me in with that little black bear. And when that black bear got you getting up, he wasn't little at all. <laughs> so I ran into that bear, and uh, we, we had a round or two, but the bear won. And I lost most of my clothes, and I asked the man for my money, and he told me to go to hell. I'd hurt that bear. <laughs> so I couldn't work for two days. So I went down, <clears throat> it was Sunday, and I went down to the uh, Turkey Point on the beach at Lake Erie. And I walked out on the pier, and... Uh, there was three girls sitting on a on a towel. And I tipped my hat to one of them, and it was Mari, and it was 60 years ago, a little over. And 60 been years? ever since, yes. You guys have been together for 60 years. 60 years. years uh -huh. Congratulations. That's yeah. amazing. So I took Mari back down to Georgia, and she come from Holland and lived in Canada, and to bring her down to that heat and them flies and ticks and rattlesnakes <laughs> That was it was really in a swamp area where I'm from. To Ackerfield, that was, that was something else. So, uh, Perina Company had really promoted chicken business down there, and so I got my mama to mortgage a farm, and we put in thirty six thousand laying hens. And that was just about the time that the curve was over; it was going down the other side. So every time we picked up a dozen eggs, we lost a nickel. Oh. So it wasn't long before we seventy-eight thousand dollars in debt to feed to Farina Company, and it looked like the farm might be go to the bank. Yeah. So I decided to turn some of that chicken feed into moonshine. So I started making moonshine whiskey, and I got up to a thousand gallons a week. You were making a. How old are you at this point? Twenty-four, twenty-five years old. Twenty-four, twenty-five years old, yeah. making a thousand gallons. Of, of moonshine, moonshine a week. A I'm week. selling it for $3 a gallon. It's talking, cost me maybe about a gallon to make it, a dollar a gallon to make. So I'm making $2,000 every week, 10 days, according to the temperature of the weather. What year is this? 1966, uh, 67. So, but they were, it was legal over in Florida, but they'd shoot and kill you over in Georgia if they caught you. So anyway, the steel, we, one of the bottles got too close to the steel, and they call it puking when it gets a little bit hot. It, it'll boom, the sides come out, and one of those big uh, butane bottles got knocked over, and there's 200 of them, and it looked like World War II with flamethrowers down. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> they going off, and I went back. I got, after I got the fire out, I went back to the house, and I was eating it behind our house. And uh, after, after all of them blown up, I, just, I thought the revenue was blowing it up, and I ran back there, but it wasn't. So I drew, took a hoe and pulled those tanks all in the creek, and it was cold. So uh, we heard, pow, pow, pow. Mari run to the back window there. Well, I was eating a second breakfast. And I let me look, and she said, it's Wayman the favor. He's, he's chasing lice. He's chasing lice. He, he, he fell down. His, his hat fell off. We knew the deputy sheriff. <laughs> and said, he's chasing lice. Lice is getting away. <laughs> so anyway, they brought the bloodhounds out, and oh, boy. Uh, so, uh, that was over, but then I started up again and then, and then, uh, a fella turned me in and I, I had to, uh, I had to run from them too. And the bloodhounds after me and they blew my steel up again, I had to swim across the Creek and, oh, everybody knew it was me. 
How long how long were you making moonshine before you got caught? About a year. A year? Mm-hmm. So then we was ashamed to go to church. We were ashamed to go to town. Everybody pointed their finger at us. It was all in the news. It covered Dixie like to do. The front page of the Atlanta Journal and all. So and uh so the the long chain men came and took my tractor, they took my truck, I had a big old ten wheeler, they took that. They just I mean, I didn't have nothing. I was paralyzed, broke. Yeah. And I what in the world can we do? My sister was out there from California. She said, Roger, they they need laborers out there. They they making seven dollars an hour. So we went out to California. So I say when I quit running, I was in I was in Redondo Beach, California. And I went to work uh doing construction <clears throat> framing and uh, uh so I, I mean, I, it was killing me doing that framing. There was a elect, electrician there, an Italian man. He said, Roger, why don't you be an electrician? I said, I don't know much about it. He said, I'll teach you. So every day at lunch, he would say, this is flex. Here's how you cut it. And here's a handy box. And this is a 4S box. And this is that. And he, so he taught me whatever. He said, now go get some used tools and go down to Wilmington and sign the right to work book. So I down, went down and signed it, and they sent me out on the job, and they never knew I wasn't a real electrician. I worked there two years, and then I got on the Redondo Beach Fire Department, and uh, I, was, I was real happy with that job. <clears throat> so I, I continued to do the electrical work, and then I'm buying, I was one of the first pickers. I'd go down into the Los Angeles area where the, uh, the people were moving out and, and getting rather slummy, and I'd park my truck, and I'd walk a block or two just on the corner, and I mean, within an hour or two, I'd have it completely loaded with junk and antique, not junk, but, and I'd take it down to Antique Road and make me $200 and I'd be home. <laughs> and that was on my days off from the fire department. So I made, uh, made quite a bit of money. Then I came back here just across the river. And you might not know, but uh, the settlers, when they came from New York and Atlanta, wherever, they came on a train here to, to the river. And then they had to take a ferry across, and then they they put it into wagons on the other side, and those wagons were Studebakers, the ones that went across the, the schooners, and later on they made the cars. But anyhow, that's what the wagons, the good wagons that they took. Well, they couldn't get half of the stuff that they brought on the train in those little wagons, so they left pieces here by the millions. Really? So I started hauling it back. I had other firemen here buying it for me and putting it in a big barn, and I'd fly it once a month and rent a truck and take it back. And I was bouncing along the highway there with a load of those antiques, and I was reading a National Geographic paper and, and magazine, and it said that mercury was 13 times higher and more expensive in the United States than it was Mexico. And I told my friend Mike there driving, I said, I believe I'll go down and get me some of that mercury. And he said, man, that'll, that's so heavy, it'll knock a hole in the bottom of your airplane. I had a little airplane then. And so, uh, you were flying. I, I, yeah, I'd, I'd by that time I'd backed up. I forgot to tell you, so I'll back up and tell you. I started flying in Georgia. I had read a book called Jungle Pilot, and it was uh, about Nate Saint, and I, he had a, a a bad knee and he couldn't fly in World War II. But he was a Christian, so he wanted to. He, he saw about the missionaries and how that they took. Sometimes they'd take two or three weeks to walk out to get their mail and to get their medicine. And so he wanted to help those people. So he got a little little cub, and he started flying them, and he would, he would uh, I don't know where it's in Borneo or South America, but he'd put a rope out, and he'd put a, a bucket with a lid on it, and like a, a cowboy can take a rope and do that, he'd put the bucket right at their feet as he circled. And they'd say, I need penicillin, and he'd give them their, their mail, and they'd put the mail back in, he'd wind it back up, and I thought, oh, Boy, I would just love to do something like that. I'm not worthy to be a preacher, but I could certainly help those people and do it. So I learned to fly in a little airplane called Death Trap. Rode down the trap, a $700 airplane. Holy cow. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, that, but that's how I learned. So now then I, things didn't work out like I was planning. And so now I go out and I'm on the fire department and I, do the antiques, and I and I bought an airplane. I bought two or three of them and traded them off until now. I got a Cessna 182, pretty nice little twin engine airplane. Still my favorite for a family plane. It just it's just the Volkswagen of the sky. It just does it. Yeah. So uh, I says, "What does it pay?" He said, "I don't know. I'll introduce you to someone." 
So we went, met a fellow. He was so nice. He was paralyzed. I didn't realize. Start with that beautiful voice. He spoke Spanish. He said, "You got an airplane?" I said, "You'd fly some pot?" I said, "I don't know. What do you pay? I'll see what the deal is." He said, "Let me introduce you to somebody." So he introduced me to this guy, Wild Bill. A nice looking young man. He said, I'll give you $10,000 to fly down there and bring some pot back. I said, let's go. Did you ask how much pot? I go, well, you know, can't put much in there. It's about as big as just two chairs in the back seat, you know. So okay. It wasn't a very big airplane. Were you were you nervous at all? Not a bit. Not a bit. Not a bit. I, well, I've been going down there flying, getting uh, fishing in Baja and stuff. You fly back sometime. It'd be dark. I decided not even stop for for the border. Ain't nobody bother you. There was nothing separating Mexico and California or the United States but a barbed wire fence. There was nothing. Okay. So <clears throat> I went down there and flew a load and come back. And the guy gave me $10,000, and I took it home, and I didn't need that money. I had two houses, a nice car, an airplane. What in the world? Beautiful wife, two little girls. Just, it was just, just something to do. It's sort of, sort of thing, and so... But that was a lot of money, $10,000, just fall in your pocket at that time. So I shook it on the bed, and my wife put her hand over her mouth like, oh, my goodness. And the baby grabbed some $100 bills and was crawling around with them, and we just laughed. And <laughs> I told my wife, let's go out to dinner. Well, we we go out to dinner if we wanted to. We just didn't. We just, you know, working people. So we went. I said, don't you dare look at the right-hand side. Just look at the, just look at whatever whatever you got on the list. So we put that money in the lockbox. And I went to see a lawyer, and I put a $100 bill on his desk, and I said, Mr. Lawyer, I got one question. If I got caught bringing marijuana back from Mexico in my airplane, <clears throat> what would they do? What, what, what would the penalty be? He said, what's your criminal history? I said, I don't have one. He said, nothing. I said, I've never even had a speeding ticket. I didn't even had a parking ticket my whole life. He said, you work on the fire department? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, for sure you'd get probation. But the worst, if it, the worst happened to worst, you'd get one year and you'd spend four months raking leaves on some military camp. And I said, no, that ain't, that, that's, that's pretty good odds. So I went and bought me a Cessna 207, a really big Cessna, the biggest they made back then. So I could go down and make $40,000 a day. So I told Mario, I said, we're going to make $300,000 and we're going back to the farm and we're going to farm. And it was like a thermometer with a match under it. I made three hundred thousand dollars so quick. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't. You turn your head, and that was done. I'm a couple of months. I had it. How much was this new Cessna? You remember? I, I, uh, yeah, I paid fifty-five thousand dollars for a used one. You could get a it, it was two hundred seven with the wing off. I had to put the wing back on to get it to fly. Damn. <laughs> so uh, I uh, I bought me a new Cadillac like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> It was pretty. So I called my mother and my baby sister. I said, come out, yeah, I got, I got something to show you. So they, they flew out, and I flew them out, and I took them to Disneyland. And so my mother looked at me kind of funny, and she was a sport now. And she said, what you doing, boy? I said, I'm hauling pot, Ma. She said, how much you making? I said, I'm making $40,000 any day I want to go down there. She said, my goodness, what would they do if they catch you? And I told her what the lawyer said. She said, my, I said, what do you think, Ma? She said, do you need a co-pilot, son? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so that's how my marijuana day started. Wow. It was just so, I was just, I, the maximum sentence would have been five years. And, and it was just like, they were nothing, DEA wasn't even started. They were just nothing to stop you. If you went across the border with your airplane and cleared customs at the first place and got the permit for your airplane, you could fly in Mexico just like it was a Mexican plane for six months. Fly back and forth with that. If you run out of gas and had to go into town, just show that, and you were just welcome as, as any tourist. Wow. How many How many $10,000? Did you only do one $10,000 trip? I did two $10,000, and I went to $40,000. And then I went to, uh, I bought a twin beach airplane. <clears throat> and I, I guess I must have made sixty or $70,000 a trip on that. I always just flew it for somebody else. I didn't like to buy it. I didn't like to sell it. I did a little bit, but I just was absolutely a trucking company. And so I must have, I did it over a hundred times. You did it over a hundred times? A hundred times. Were you ever, you, you were never nervous? It was so lax back oh, then. Well, it was lax, but I, I got shot down twice. And so I, I'll get to that a little bit later. But I'd like to tell you how I, 
how I come about being able to do it and not get caught. Uh, they formed the DEA and, and they, they put up trucks across the southern border between Mexico and the United States, probably on every little hill or, or a lot of them. And they had a little radar on those trucks. And they called it Operation Star Trek. And they caught lots and lots of planes coming across. Really? So I said, oops, I can't go across there. So I thought, where don't they come across? They don't come across between San Diego and Hawaii. <laughs> they don't have them out there. So I started, I started flying and uh, uh, way out through, I'd come up and uh, there was a place in central Baja that I have to tell you about. And I call it Juan's Goat Ranch. 22, 22 minutes south, southwest of, of, of Mulahay. And it was over 20 miles to the nearest road, and it was a goat ranch where they made cheese. And, 20 uh, miles to the nearest road? road? To the nearest road, yes. And it was a beautiful runway. Many, many years ago, they used to haul meat out of there when somebody had a huge ranch there. And, and mesquite trees just thick all over the place, just beautiful. And I'd land there, and the doves would just fly out just like it was in, in a movie. It was so pretty. And I would land there, and, and uh, this guy, Juan, would come up on his mule riding fast, and I'd unload the load. We'd put it under the mesquite trees, and he'd, he would uh, look after it all day. And I'd fly into Moolah Hay, and he'd wash my plane, and clean the windshield, and fill it up with gas. And I'd eat barbecue or whatever was there, and I'd get a room and take a nap for a few hours. Then I'd fly back out to the goat ranch, and we'd load the plane back up, and I'd take off heavy and uh, go out. And there's some islands 200 miles off the coast of Baja called Guadalupe. <clears throat> and uh, I would go over Guadalupe Island, and then I would go northwest out of there. And so when I came to the border of the United States, I was 300 miles off the coast of San Diego. Okay. And I put it right down on the deck. So when I came in, there was a quarter inch of salt on my windshields. Wow. So, <clears throat> and I would, uh, then I would fly all the way up to the, the Santa Barbara Islands, uh, Santa Rosa. And I would come in <clears throat> late in the afternoon, just about dark. And I'd come up from a runway there and I'd pull it right up and just fly like I'd just taken off from there, and I'd go out to the desert and unload. <clears throat> I never, ever had a one ounce of problems, except with the airplanes sometimes. Nothing? Nothing. How many, how many pounds of pine? I would you know, carry from 22 to 2,500 pounds at a time. 2,500 pounds? Yeah. And then I got a DC-3, and I'd carry three tons. Three tons? Yeah. How many pounds is three tons? Is this like six thousand six thousand pounds? Six thousand pounds, yes. How long does it take to unload six thousand pounds of pot? Not long. I'm really? telling you what, you can throw it out of there real quick. <laughs> Must be one hell of a two wheeler. <laughs> back truck back up there. We had rollers. Just put it on there and just put those rollers. I bet twenty minutes it was done. How how did you know? Did you always know who you were picking up from? And yeah, who I had you were one guy that I was to? partners with. Okay. And uh, I was partners, except he was stealing more than his share. But anyhow, <laughs> and, and he, it was his responsibility to, to load it and to sell it. And I didn't have anything to do with it. Who was, who was paying the bills? Was it Mexican well, cartels? I, see, I owe my airplane. It was about $50,000. Well, I meant who was paying your paycheck. Was it a Mexican no, cartel? No, it, it was right well, here. It was real simple. I, he would load it. And bring it up, and he had a fellow that unloaded it, that drove the truck, and they took it to town. They had a guy sell it, and it was some, oh, it would just go disappear just like zip. People would be mad with you if you didn't save them some more. Like they'd come really? back next week, why didn't you bring me out, man? I wanted to, you know, this and that and other. It, that's, that's how it sold, and it was no problem at all. Wow. <clears throat> so you, then, uh, so I, I would, I, he, he was always, he was trying to, uh, build a big restaurant down in Mazatlan. He didn't want to pay me, so I'd go and had to, had to go and run him down to get my share of it. I just give you $50,000 last week. I said, you didn't give me nothing. You just paid me what you owe me, man. That wasn't my part of it. <laughs> <clears throat> and I'll tell you about that fellow. That's the most unusual thing in the world. Uh, I hired a pilot to fly for me. 
And him and that pilot got together and decided to cut me out. Hmm. So he had a fellow work, work for him named Peter, and I've never been talked to so ugly in my life. You sit on your pile of puff ass in Santa Barbara, you out of the deal. Well, he owed me about $300,000, and they had my DC-3, and... And no, no, you 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 out the deal. <clears throat> we got your pilot, and we got your plane, and we got your contact, and bye bye. Don't come down here. We'll dust you for a nickel. Oh, really? Well, I hate to say this because I'm not a violent man. I never went to shoot nobody in my life, but that was just a little bit too much to swallow. So I had an old leather suitcase, and I had a nine nine millimeter Brown and high power and a thirty eight big Smith and Buster. I put them both in there. And I took off to the airport in Los Angeles. <clears throat> well, I got to the airport, and there were no flights to Mazatlan that night. So I had to go to Houston, I believe it was, and change planes. And when I got there, there was a terrible thunderstorm. That plane, I mean, the wings almost touched the ground, scraped the runway, and bounced down that runway, and finally got stopped, and it just flooded all night long. And I went down, and my suitcase didn't come. So I went down there two or three times at night to see if it had come in. It didn't come in. So the next morning, I knew I was going to have to go buy a new suitcase and new guns and dart over again. So I called down there to tell them, just hold your horses. I'm on my way. So I called down there, and that Peter answered the phone. Oh, Roger. Oh, Roger. Somebody shot and killed Mark last night. God had somebody kill him in my place. No way. Surely did. Interesting. The only time I ever picked up arms for anybody. <laughs> Damn. Interesting. Any idea who did it? Yeah, we know exactly who did it. The guy that we uh, bought marijuana from was a guy named Roberta. He was the nicest man you could imagine. He just was just a farmer that put it together, him and his brothers, and we could get it from them, and he'd give a lot of credit. He didn't care. And he had a bunch of ranches out. And so this Mark was building a... Elephant bar and grill. He needed a couple of million dollars, so he was slow on paying him. He's slow on paying me, and he was doing what his thing was. I, I kind of understood it. I wasn't mad with Mark, but uh, so I guess Roberta was drinking that Saturday night, and he sent uh, three of his cowboys in. And when Mark closed up his place, he went across the street there. Well, I understand it, and the cowboy says, "Hey, the boss wants to see you." Nah, I'm a boss. I ain't. Yeah, 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 yeah. So one of them pulled a pistol out and says, the boss wants to see you. And Mark was a tough guy. He just reached and took the guy's pistol away from him and shot him. And the other boys jumped on him and took the pistol and shot and killed Mark. Right oh, there. Damn. Yeah, right, right there in the street. So that's how that happened. It was just so, nobody wanted to hurt anybody. I mean, it was just like, Roberta Stowe didn't want to kill nobody. I was taken off of my airplane one time, and, and the Federalists came, and they shot Roberta down, and he spent five years in Kuyakon, kept his mouth shut. Wow. And I just, I was just taken off. Let's hear about that. That was all there was to it. That's it? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> loaded up, and I was there, and they just swarmed in on him while he was leaving. Is that when you got shot down? No, I got shot down another time. I'll tell you about that. That was, that was lively. That was in Mexico. Yes. Same time period. Uh, a little bit before this is back when I had the two hundred seven, the the long, the big air signal engine plane. Uh, there was a, a, a little village, a starving village, starving donkeys, where I'd got a contract to, to buy the marijuana, and uh, had an ugly little hair lip man came walking, that said he had the federalists paid off. You know, nobody paid off. <laughs> so. I, uh, I'd land there on that little village that had about an eight or 900 foot runway in a, in a ox bow of a river. And the river wasn't as deep as, knee deep. But it was just beautiful. Cactus out there. And even all the fences were made with cactus so a goat couldn't even get through. And uh, I'd land there on that little sand bed on the bend of the river. And just up there was a waterfall. It was pretty. It was not high, but high as this ceiling here. Just enough to just be picturesque. And I'd, so, but I couldn't take off of the load. And Mari would uh, get all kind of toys and, and uh, goodies and candies and red apples, what the children like. 
And I saw how starving they was. They had, they had nothing. I mean, they were just poverty. And I'd bring that airplane down, loaded with these goodies and these candies and little toys, and give it to those children. And I noticed every week there was more and more children. They was hearing about that American Santa Claus coming. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that might have been my undoing. <laughs> so I remember I did 12 loads in a row. And uh, on that 13, I had that little thing going off in the ding of your stomach. Ding, 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 ding. Don't do it. Don't do it. And I landed, and so I, I uh, the children were there by, by the gobs. So I landed about halfway down the strip. And I went by the starving donkeys and up the road to the place. And I asked this Walt King, do you have the Federalists paid off? Oh, yes, they're completely paid off. So I spent the night in the hammock in this barn-like structure and the donkeys braying and the roosters crowing. And <laughs> the next morning, it, it, just at daylight, just before daylight, they'd wake me up and we'd walk down to my airplane, which was a quarter of a mile, I reckon. And uh, I'd brush my teeth in that river and, and they had a young fella uh, Pedro, that he didn't probably weigh 120 pounds, and he'd get in the plane with me. We'd we'd fuel up the night before I'd take fuel with me. And uh, then he would show me where they had a roadblock. <clears throat> so he'd take off, and I'd, I'd take off with that empty airplane, and I'd go 20, 30 miles or maybe, and they would block a road. They had a two-ton truck, and they'd come out with all the guns on it, and they'd block the road, and then you'd see about a mile up there, another big truck would come across and block it, and the road would be clear. And I'd land between them, and they'd come up with the truck and put the marijuana in the airplane, and I'd shake hands with all of them. <laughs> and I'd get in the truck and take over, off over the other one. Okay, so you were landed in the highway. I landed in the highways because right. that was the only place down there that was on a runway long enough to take off with a load like that. Yeah. We didn't have any place that you could take off, so I, I'd always on the highway. And sometimes they wouldn't be six inches from the wheels on that side to the to the little berm, so I had to keep it right dead center. And... uh so that morning, when we got in the plane, to, I was going to taxi back to the end to start. Bow! I thought a wheel blew out. They kind of stick out there. And I'm looking, and Pedro's yelling, Policia! Policia, Roger! Policia! And it dawned on me, uh-oh. No, I don't want none of this. <laughs> so I just pushed it to the firewall, and I only had a full 500 feet in front of me. And I went tearing off down that dusty, sandy place, and... Uh, when I got to the end of it, I pulled up real strong and just hoping it would fly off. I had to. And it took off, and it was just hanging on a stall on its nose. And they riddled that airplane with machine guns. I mean, there was 80 bullet holes in there. One took the top of my head, creased it, took my kneecap off, took the end of my toe off. Oh, you got shot. I got shot three times. Three times. Yeah, and uh, Pedro, I didn't see it at the time, I tell you. But anyway... Uh, the airspeed indicator just went away. That's what I was looking at to see where I was and the instrument I was watching at the time. It just disappeared. And the bullets went up above me over my head. They were just all over. I don't know how I didn't die. And they shredded up the top and the wings are high and the gasoline from that left wing was just pouring in on me like you just pouring it out of a bucket. It was all over me. And somehow or another, it scared me so bad until time almost stopped. Things turned yellow. The only time in my life I was, that's crisis. I thought I was fixing to burst into flames any second. Yeah. Those bullets was hitting so hard. <laughs> it was like a hailstorm. And it was over just like that. Could you see them down there shooting at I you? I didn't see them, see them shooting them because it was, I went through them. Now, I'm, I'm up at the end, and I looked ahead of me, and the river is maybe 18 inches deep or so. And it looks like it's huge turtles on the river, those rocks had made shapes, you know how diamonds and other stuff make, they're just laying there in that river like that. And I pull that power and I cut the f electricity off so that there wouldn't be any sparks, hopefully, till I could get down there. I knew I was fixing to die. And I hit, bam, I hit hard and the wings came off and then it bounced again. And when it bounced the next time, the whole firewall under came under the airplane and I'm sitting in the middle of the river and I'm not, I guess, unconscious because Pedro's hit me in the ribs. Come on, Roger, come on, Roger. <laughs> well, I undid my seatbelt and stepped out. And now there's four Federalists running down the runway, and they're quite a ways from me, and they're still shooting. They hit the plane twice while we start. Well, it just happened to so that I had that 9 millimeter taped to the top of the radio, so I'd have it in case of crashing in the jungle or whatever. 
Well, I just reached now. It's just there in the holster <laughs> in the most conspicuous place. And I popped a few black down the runway. <laughs> and they ran, into, they ran into rocks. I didn't see the federales no more. <laughs> when the rabbit got the f gun, the farmer, he run. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so we took off down the thing, and I looked, and Pedro's foot had turned. It came under his... It, when the AK 47s came in his ankle and blew it out the other side, it wasn't even bleeding. It was just white. So, oh my goodness gracious. So, I, I want to go. He said, No, no, we got to go up the hill. The federal is to go down here, the easy place. Let's go up. So, we went up and got into a path of cactus. There's a big old cactus there everywhere. And there was a donkey. She must have been 30 years old with long hair. And Pedro just runs up to her, Charlotte, Charlotte, and starts petting her. And we jump on the back of that donkey and we go for several hours, a couple hours, and we come to a place, um, uh, a, little, a little farm, a white house in a clearing. It's just like where the indigenous people will just make a place for themselves. And the trees was down, and it had been burned. And a man was plowing there, and he had a uh, he had a cow and a, a little mule. And the and the thing over the neck was sideways like this. And he had a little plow, and he was plowing with them, trying to make him a living. And uh, Pedro knew him, so then he put us in his house, and his wife and his daughter were in there, and and he went for help. So uh, we were there all day long, and and the woman got. Uh, some cloth and put over our wounds, remember on my head, and then she poured diesel over all over it. Oh. She thought it, well, it did keep the flies off. So anyhow, we sat there all day long. I mean, just in a straight chair all day long. I guess I was in some kind of shock. And about dark, were you uh, worried about anything? I wasn't worried. I did. You weren't worried about getting well, caught. I, 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 about there was a hunting rifle on that wall, and I wanted to go back over there <laughs> and take care of business, tell you the truth. But I must have been out of my mind. Uh, but somebody <laughs> shooting me, I ain't particularly in, uh, in favor of them. But uh, so late in the afternoon, a bunch of horses and mules come walking fast up into that yard. <laughs> Might have been 20 of them. They was help come. And there was a young man there. He spoke English, Dr. Benjamin Soso. He was a Red Cross doctor from 20, 30 miles away. And he came in there and, boy, he, he gave us tetanus shots and gave me a big shot of morphine and same thing for Pedro. And that, that these things up right quick. And uh, he worked as a, as a slug in the, my foot back in the ankle bone. He, he looked for that for a while. I think he did more damage looking than the slug did. But uh, he says, you got to get to you got to get to hospital. And Pedro, you'll die if you don't get to hospital quick. And he said, they uh, got the roads blocked all the way north. They're looking for an American pilot that they think's dead. There was so much blood, blood in that airplane. So he said, you've got to go south. He knew you were a pilot. Yeah, he knew I was. Of course, he, he come for the help. He got the story. So and he said, it's all over. He said, so they, there's roadblocks everywhere. So there's, three, there's a platoon of soldiers in here looking for you. So we, I got on a, I think a horse or a mule, I don't know, and I, we rode a long way. And we came to a road, a, a dirt road, and there was a big 10-wheeler truck, and it was loaded full of corn, corn in the shuck. And they dug holes on one side for me in that corn. I got down in it, and they, on the other side, they dug one for Pedro. And these people sitting all over the truck, and there's rapids and their big sombreros. And uh, that truck, that, ro that, that ro road was rough. And every time that truck would roll, that corn would roll over my face, and they'd dig me back out. <laughs> <laughs> we must have rode 20 miles, and we came to the highway, and we run through three roadblocks, soldiers all over it. Nobody said a word. So we came to the road, and they took me in a house and uh, stripped me off and got me some, I remember the pan, had a little chip in it. I must have changed the water 20 times to get the blood and the crud off of me from all day and all that stuff. And finally it got clean, and they put, got me some clothes and put on me. And uh, so they needed a... a Taxi to take me to Guadalajara. I don't know how much, how long it is, but it took all night. So, the long way. So they had to go to Mazatlan to find a taxi. And so finally, they had to find hard to find one that would go that far with something like this. So finally, they come up with a brand new car, and they made a bed in the back seat for me and laid me up there. And that doctor gave me a, they give me those pills, and I was I was buzzing. So uh, the the man was a dwarf. What kind of pills? What do they give oh, you? I guess something morphine or something to keep, something the, uh, to keep take the, the pain down. Was, yeah. I was shot. I was, I was hurting. 
<laughs> and one was in in the, in the middle of my foot, was lodged in there. It was it was rough, it was rough, right in right in the joint of the ankle bone. So uh, I uh, I got in the back seat and I lay down in there, and, and he started off to Guadalajara, and he was a small man, dwarf, and he talked all night. And I'd like to tell you what he said. I said uh, I said, do you have a family? He said, Oh, I have a lovely family. Let me tell you about my beautiful wife, Dora, and how I got her. He said, I was in the village, and you know, look at me. No girl would even look at me. But I had my eye on this girl across the way. And one day, she's playing the flute in the back of the band, and she comes by, and I go out, and I grab her, and I pull her in the gate, and my mother helps me pull her in the house. And I tell her I love her. But she sat straight in that chair all night and won't even look at us. So, Senor, the next morning, what could I do? I have to send her home. So I send her home, and I follow her at a distance. And she knocks on her father's door, her door, and her father, get away from here, you prostitute. You spent the night with some man. You know, daughter of mine, get away from that door. So Dora left with her hair, head hanging low. And I went up and said, Dora, let's go talk to the Padre. And Senor, that's how I got my beautiful wife, Dora. He said, and you won't believe it. But one year later, we have a beautiful boy. And I was di driving a new Ford. So we named him Ford. <laughs> and Senor, the next year, we have another boy. And that year, I just bought me a new Dodge, so we named him Dodge. <laughs> and, Senor, I know you're not going to believe it, but the third year, we had another boy, and I had just bought a new Chevrolet. And that priest wouldn't name him Chevrolet. I had to teach that son of a bitch to drive before he'd name him Chevrolet. <laughs> and that's how I got my three boys, Ford, Dodge, and Chevrolet. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So you see some of the tales I've had, and they're all true. Yeah. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. <clears throat> you also went to prison in Mexico. Yes. Is that around this time? Yes. It's right during that time. <laughs> right after that time. I uh, I'd paid $17,000 to Joaquin for that load that I didn't get. So... I went back down to get my load, and I had a, a fella, an older guy, that I said, bring me an airplane, and we'll go partners. He had, he had, his, he had an airplane. I said, now, here's $5,000. You land at the, the, the strip just south of um, Hermosillo. It's a huge cattle feed lot, and you give them $5,000 both ways, and they'll give you all the gasoline you want. He wasn't paying attention. He landed the international and tried to give him five thousand dollars. He did what? Uh -huh. Can you repeat that? So, I'm I'm at uh, a real nice five star hotel, and uh, a gentleman I was I was, had a phony name Ardell, and he, really nice looking gentleman. You never dreamed it. And he said, "Are you Mr. Ardell, sir?" I was in the swimming pool. I said, "Yes, sir." And he shook hand me and put handcuffs on. <laughs> And he took me to jail. They all came over and took me to jail. I went, went up and got some clothes. And they took me in there. And of course, they, they took my clothes and my suitcase. I had $300 in my wallet. And the guy took a blackjack and took that from me when I went. And so I didn't have nothing. So I stayed there about, <clears throat> about three days in a, in a cage. And sometimes there's 18 people in that little old room. And, oh, it's filthy. And uh, then they took me back to the back and started the torture deal. What did they start with? with they, they, if they want you to confess, they, they don't wait around for the court. They make you confess. So, and then, then when you confess, you get to go before the judge, and he'll give you two, three, four, five, six years. If you don't, they can keep you up to four years for oh, wow. major crimes. They call it, you know. So, uh, I, uh, first off, I went back there, and they, they just put me in a cell about six foot square and 14 feet high, and it was really hot. I mean, hot, over 100 degrees there at that time. So I heard the torture and the carrying on, the begging and the crying and stuff out right in front of me. They do that to soften you up so they don't have to work so hard on you. So then, then they come got me, and uh, they, they keep you naked. They put you in there naked, and that supposed to take take away your dignity. Grit. Yeah. But uh, 
So they, they took me out and wanted me to sign it, and, and they, they started off on the bottom of my feet with blackjacks and rubber hose, and they beat me yellow. <laughs> so I, I wasn't, about, wasn't about to sign that thing with a beat. So uh, they got a, a, a tub of water, and they had some kind of, I guess that was the first water board <laughs> that they ever did, and they had some kind of seltzer in that water. I mean, if you go whiff of it, it took the top of your head off. Your eyes stung and your nose and ears, I guarantee you, Three of them couldn't hold you down. So I found out just before that happened, you, you scream and you carry on just like that and get a good whiff of air. That didn't work. So uh, they, uh, they they came after a while and, and uh, took me out naked and, and they put a change on me with a little click, 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 then they pulled me apart and they put butter or something on my backside and they just packed me full of hot chili pepper, ground up. And they just they showed it to you and just with their thumb just poked poked my colon full of it. I mean that was some kind of terrible. Now it's, it's it's common. They do it. Yeah. So anyway, I begged and cussed and carried on till finally they washed it out, but I didn't do it. And then they came and uh, I don't know if it's that day or the next, but they hung a dead man in the cell with me, and he was frozen, and he was wrapped in uh, wrapped in newspaper strips of it like a mummy from his feet all the way to his head. And uh, they put him on a meat hook onto a bolt on the side of the wall and hung him there, said, you next, son of a bitch, you next. And I said, all right, dead man in the cell with me, okay, but so, but then he started to thaw out. It was so hot. And the first thing he thaw out was looked like his eyes and the paper started to unrun. He was a black man and it started running down his face. The tears looked like for the formaldehyde running out of him. Oh man. And then, Stuff started unwrapping off of his private parts, and it looked like he was peeing on the floor. <laughs> and it puddled down there. Oh, what an awful smell. And then as he opened up, you could see the, the hook was on his ribs here, and it pulled it apart, and you could see his liver good and clear. <laughs> so, How I long mean, is all this? Pardon? How, how many hours is this all? I don't know. Is this days? No, just one, just day? one day, yes. Okay. But I, there was a little hole, and it wasn't even a, maybe a quarter inch under the door. That thing was filthy. There was blood spatters, crap all over the floor. It was a filthy place. I lay down in there naked on, under there, and I put my lips just as far as I could under that door, trying to breathe. And I had the, the darnest dreams you've ever seen, or, or hallucinations. I was sleeping completely, and I, had, I remember pink flying pigs. They were really pink with big wings. And they were just flying around. And whenever I came to, I didn't know which was real and which was the, uh, which was a hallucination or the, because, and so, but I, I didn't really come to, they took me to the hospital and I woke up then, I had an oxygen mask over me. And you and woke they, up was, in the hospital? Yeah, and the from infirmary, and there was a, a doctor there and he was concerned that they had gone too far, that I was gonna die from that formaldehyde fixture. So they took me then and put me into general population. And I stayed out there for a while until my wife came down and paid a bribe and I got out and went out the back door. What did your wife think about all this? I don't know. Did you ever she, ask her? She was glad she was glad I got home. I'll bet. Was she upset? <laughs> Not particularly. She just I did it so many times and I think that she just had such faith in me that she just thought, surely he can do it. I, I, th I think it was, and she just never took it so, and it was marijuana at that time, and it wasn't, wasn't any big deal in the United States. And I was, a, everywhere we went, I was a hero. Did like, you tell her everything that happened to you when they were oh, torturing yeah. you? She, she, she made sandwiches for me, and I'd get love notes in them. I'd be eating one of them, and there was a little love note in that thing. So she knew what was going on. I didn't tell her what, exactly what I was doing. I mean, yeah, she knew what I was doing, but yeah. I didn't have, I didn't let her get close to it, nothing, not even no, so she, not guilty in any way. Okay. But uh, mo there was there was about half of the people in California voted for the referendum to legalize that stuff way back there in the early 70s. So there was, there was nobody mad at me, not not in my side of the fence anyway. Yeah. Did, did your wife want you to keep making these trips? No, she she didn't want to. She wanted me to quit. But I had such real estate deals going, I just had to keep supporting her. <laughs> I was going to make a billion dollars. Gotcha. I went and, went and bought Moreno Valley, the whole, every foot of that land out there. Got an option of 6,000 acres. Now I want to see this. If I could have helped that, <laughs> wow. it would have been worth Yeah.
So you, you said you did hundreds of loads, right? About 100 loads of marijuana. 100 I mean. loads of marijuana. Was it always for the same entities? Was it always for the same? It was same? always for me, but I mean, I had different people load me and, and, and sell it. So how does that, how does it work? Okay, I, f I figured that I had an airplane worth fifty or $60,000 at the time. Mm -hmm. That was what the load cost down there. And I'd say, all right, Bill or Bob, you load me. We, we, in, I got, we, we're both risking the same amount. Okay. You load me, and then we'll sell it, and we'll take the price of the pot out of it, and we'll split what's left over. But I do not want to sell it. I don't want to come down here, and I don't mind being in the jungle and loading it, but I, if you come and you get a load and you come back for it, it's not the same stuff. You need to stay there. Okay. So it's better to have a partner in this. Okay. So that that's what I did, and it didn't matter. And so that's how I got away with it a long time because I, I didn't touch it. I'd come back on a dry lake in the desert, throw that stuff out real quick, and I'd wait till the truck leaves and it gets, it gets away, and then I'd take off and go back to town. <clears throat> did your name get spread around everywhere? And I mean, Not were really. There's a lot of knew. There was a DEA agent that followed me for years. He had really nice things to say about me. He never told any lies. He just, <laughs> he had a stack of papers 16 feet high when, when I went to court. It was 16 bucks. So he had me all over the world <laughs> in different airplanes. Wow. What would, a, what would a phone call be? Was it a phone call? Was it a, what was it back then? How did you know, all right, load's ready to be picked up? I don't even remember. We didn't talk much on the telephone. I know that. How are you communicating? We'd come see each other and talk, and you should go down there. And, and it must have been a phone call, though, somewhere or another. It was, all, it was face to face, say, too. You know, we say something that I know it ready. Okay. But I, I knew it'd be ready anyhow. But, and uh, sometimes the weather would stop me. I didn't want to go if it was bad weather. I didn't want to fly through thunderstorms. Did they know when you were arriving, or they just. Yeah, and I would, you could set my clock by me. If I said I was going to be there at 6 o'clock, I would be with there within 10 seconds. I'd put my wheels down. I'd adjust it just out there. Just <laughs> I, I enjoyed being on time. Roger that. So then what happened? I, uh, I got in trouble in Mexico. I, uh, uh, I was in a... Uh, woke up knocked on the door one morning and big red face water. Oh, I'd, I'd ordered breakfast down, Huevo's Ranchero and some coffee and uh, bam, bam, bam on the door. And I went there in my blue jeans and big red faced waiter, Buenos Dias. And he put that thing down and put a 45 right between my eyes and says, federal police to Mexico, you're under arrest. And then he went to looking through my stuff and I got me a Coca Cola out of the bar. I started knocking him in the head and then run but I was on the sixth floor and I didn't know how many was out that door. So I said, oops, I better go. So they took, he put her gun in my ribs and went down the elevator and put me in a car and there was one behind and one in front. And they went through town. I thought he was gonna put me into prison where I'd been sometime earlier, a year or two earlier. So they went on out and uh, went across a railroad track and went down a rough road and they stopped right in the middle of a, about an acre of dead animals and all kind of decomposition. And that's where the, these trucks that pick up the dead burrows and cows on the highway and bring them there. And they're just a stinking place. I mean, blow flies everywhere. But this was just at daylight. Well, he got out and says, uh, Don just two avions, where are your airplanes? And I says, I don't speak Spanish. And boy, he's a great big red-faced fellow. <laughs> he hit me upside the head with his flat and knocked me plumb off my feet. <laughs> My uh, Spanish rather improved. <laughs> so uh, he grabbed me by my hair and slapped me around, busted my nose, and uh, they want me to sign this confession. They say they're there with a, uh, a joint group from Mexico City of American DEA, and they have orders to stop me, that I have two airplanes and a, and a yacht that I'm hauling marijuana with. Of course, I tell them I don't know what they're talking about. And... They continue. I mean, they uh, put me down in right just in that car, and I don't know how he stood it. And I remember he had a white shirt, and he had a, a big old gold chain, and he had a, a, a sailfish with a big red eye on it that just dangled in front of my eyes as he's doing his work on me. 
So then they, they bring out a cattle prod, and they burn me up with that thing. I mean, they eat me alive, and they start just about my knees, and they stop about my waist, and they come and put a cigar out on my, my neck. Well, I'm not too happy with those fellows. <laughs> I can imagine. So the, the, uh, it, the cattle prod gets, runs out of electricity and it's got that, about that many batteries in it. It's a bull prod. I mean, it burns. It just... And there's red rocks everywhere. I mean, these big old rocks and clay around. And I guess once a year, the bulldozer just comes and pushes all that corn off into a big pile. And you can see it's about that high dirt and all bones sticking out of it and cow hides and uh, gourds were growing thick. And then beyond that was the jungle. And those three cars was parked up there a little bit. So uh, he keeps every once in a while grabbing by my hair and tail, puts that paper under me to sign it'll all be over. Well, I done been through that and that other deal. So uh, I fooled around there and he had my hands tied with my belt. And now I'm all sweat and slobby and sticky and bloody and and I get my hand loose. It pulls some skin off of one hand. Now I got a hand loose, but I can't let them see it. And I fooled around there and I got a rock loose under my, I'm down with my feet this way and this way the whole way. They got me and got my shirt pulled up and it's all bloody. And uh, I get that rock in my hand. And so the other ones go back to get the, some batteries and I said, oh, I'll sign, I'll sign. And he'd been a what? And I came up with that rock loaded and I hit him in the head with it. <laughs> and I ran out of my shoes trying to get, get away. And they started shooting at me. There was about eight of them. And they emptied their guns at me. I wasn't 100, 150 feet away. And it was dry ground. They were just getting in there, opened up with a, and just as I went across that, those, over across that pile of dirt, a little machine gun pistol or a MAC-10 or something opened up and it was just tearing it up all over me. And a vine caught me across that nose and it's still a cave, it crushed my nose in right there. And I caught that nut and, and when I went, my feet kept going and I went and hit the ground hard, whoop! And I went, oh, oh, I went to screaming like a dog that had been shot. And all shooting stopped. Run through that jungle and got away. You got away. I got away. So uh, there was something about I killed that man in Mexico, but I know I didn't. They, I didn't kill him. Of course I did. They, they extradited me back down there, all sort of stuff. But the, the DEA said that and just make make things work for me. So I thought it's best I not to go back to Mexico. Probably a good idea. So I uh, I didn't go back. Well, you had mentioned you also had a yacht. Yes. Re I didn't know, I thought the yacht didn't come into play until later on. So you were doing, you were smuggling marijuana in both planes and yachts yes. at this time. Let's, let's, let's talk about the yacht. Oh, it was just too slow and too dangerous. I'd get away with an airplane. I didn't like that yacht stuff. So I, uh, uh, um, probably after that time, I went to Pakistan and I, 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 I bought a, a 80 foot shrimper. I didn't know the difference. You went all the way to Pakistan to and buy around the world. And uh it's like a bulldozer going around the world. I, I should have bought a fishing boat like some tuna boat. It'd have burnt about one tenth of the fuel. I didn't know. Here's a brand new beautiful boat that's been seized by the uh bank and I can get it just for a little bit of payments. It took more fuel I could have oh my goodness. If I'd have just known. That How did you find a boat in Pakistan? I mean, there was no internet back then. But I was, I, uh, I went to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. I decided to quit the, uh, probably after the Mexican deal. I went down there and started one of the first hydro blasting business in the world. I uh, went to Shell, went, went down there, I bought a, a Wheatley pump that pumps up uh, pipelines. And I put the, got the right hoses and stuff and I would go in those ships and spray them down and clean the inside of them. And uh, I, I, so I got a contract to clean the Russian grain ships that was coming into America. They had been they had been uh, loading ships with dirty grain that had oil and fertilizer in it. And the United States had to pay the Eastern Bloc $7 billion and they just stopped. I think there was ships backed up from here to the mouth of the Mississippi. Wow. And I threw my hat in the pot and I went to clean the ships. So anyway, 
I didn't like that business. It was just, it was all right. It was a million dollars per ship to clean them, but you couldn't make much money by the people just wouldn't work. Just, they just wouldn't. It was union and they, yeah. more of them crawled off of the ship than got on. <laughs> just, just about it. So, uh, I, uh, there was a fellow there and he ha had a boat that had been seized by the, uh, the bank, the bank of Mobile, a brand new, beautiful shrimper. Needed $60,000 to get it out of Hawk. So I got it out of Hawk and I went to Pakistan and uh, got uh, three and a half tons of hashish and went on around through Singapore and through the Straits there with Japan and uh, anyhow. Hold on, hold on, hold on. How did you make a connection that, the, did you just say three and a half tons? Yes. Th how did you make a connection in Pakistan from the U.S. that had three and a half tons of hashish? I flew over there and we rode camels around. <laughs> <laughs> met a guy named Diesel that was a taxi driver that knew the guy to meet the guy. And, and so I, I went over there and did that. What a terrible place. That's the only place in the world I never didn't like. Well, I didn't like Pakistan. I don't blame you. So uh, I'm not a big fan either. No, I didn't like that place. So anyway, I, we, we came back there and got, got the hashish and then went on around through by Singapore and went on through the Straits of Magellan. We ran on through and came, came back and unloaded in British Columbia. And uh, I bought a float plane out of... Hood, Alaska, uh, out of Anchorage, and cut it out of the ice with some blow torches, and took off across the ice and went down there, and I flew that into Washington State. It took me load after load in that snotty wolf weather in a Cessna 206 hauling 700 pounds at the time. And how, my... how many, okay, where else did you smuggle marijuana into other than the U.S.? And well, British I did a Columbia. twenty ton load out of Thailand twice, a ten, and then I went back to Pakistan, did a ton, ten ton load, and then I went after I was later on. You're going to see that I was uh, in some trouble, and I was on the on the lamb and on the DEA's ten most wanted list, and I hauled a hashish and out of Morocco uh, into England. How are you making that? This is how are you making all these connections? I met this gentleman. The Worst contact ever met in my life was the famous Howard Marks that wrote the book, Mr. Nice. You ever hear of him? I have. Well, he hired me to do all these things and he turned me in so he wouldn't have to pay me. He was the biggest mistake of my life. Really? Really, for sure. Just one thing after the other. So he was the gatekeeper. <clears throat> He's the one that had all these connections in yeah. all these different countries right, uh -huh. and put it all together. Yes. How much did he owe you? I don't know. It was just everything that he did. Uh, oh, on that last one was $2 million. But on another load, he put another load with a DEA agent behind us, and, uh, and the unloaders were supposed to pay us $30 million, and they never paid us because they said, you brought the heat on us. Well, we didn't bring the heat on. He brought the heat on us by putting somebody else behind us with the same unloaders. Damn. So he was, just, he, was just, he was just bad news, just yeah. everything you touched. Did you, did you like him before you figured out what was happening? I, uh, I liked Howard. I, I, of course, he, he just knew a lot. He, he was an educated person. But he went, I, I don't know what it. I liked him. It was just like, okay, here's somebody. Hey, this is somebody that knows you can, you can work with. And... Uh, <clears throat> on the of the two million dollars that he owed me, uh, I had carried the uh, the load from three and a half three and a half tons from Morocco to England, and it sold, and everything was. And I I went to England to pick up the money, and uh, Howard gave me the passport, a British passport because I wanted one because I've been had a Brazilian one. I kind of a little strange with a Brazilian one, so. Uh, he gave me a good English one. So when I got to England, and I got to Holland to pick up my money, a, a Dutchman, a tall man, young fella, he just, is this your passport, sir? I yes. And he just put, get closing, and came around and grabbed me by my arm really hard. Come with me. Well, I knew <laughs> the game was up because I'm wanted in the United States, too, and where else? I didn't know what he's after. But bam, 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 bam. So he put me in a little room, and there's uh, three or four more agents, and he stuck his stuck my passport under a bleach, and there's certain guys in there with the turbans. And I opened that door, and I ran through that crowd like crazy. 
I knocked people sideways and so forth. And I went into a room and I looked and I'd bought some books and I still had the books and I threw them on the floor and there was a little window and I crawled through that and there was a wide card a long way. And I ran like crazy down the corridor, nobody in. At the end, there was a big elevator door and it said, you know, forbidden to enter. And I pushed it and it opened up. And I pushed it down and I went down. And there was hanging there a, a KLM cap and jacket from a captain. Boy, I put that on right quick. And I walked out on the time rack and there was a, a crew coming by, about 20 people from a 747, all of them, they walking along. And I, all right, I got right in behind them. <laughs> and we got way down there to the gate, and all of them are holding up their badges, and there's two police or two guards, and I, oops, that won't work. <laughs> and I turned around and went back. And I got back, I said, they are going to be looking. They got my passport picture right there. They know who I am. I got to do something quick. So right before I got back to that terminal part, there was a four-lane highway that goes under the runway, the, under the airport, air, skip hole in Holland. So... I just there was a high high chain link fence there with a, a big barbed wires on the top of it. So I just I just crawled up that thing and grabbed that barbed wire and pull up and get over on it. And I jumped down into the roses on the other side. I screamed bloody murder. I mean, they were there for something. They weren't roses. They was a hedge let that high with spines that long. They just eat my legs alive. Just I mean, just tore my clothes up. It was you couldn't move. So I took that KLM jacket off and I, <laughs> I started stomping. And here comes a blue van with the Dutch police. And they were right there and the young fellas with their pistols in the air. Halt, halt, halt. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm stomping and I had to get 10 or 12 feet through that scrub. And that made the big stop thing. It was hard. I mean, you just, I don't care who you are, you couldn't go through it. And so when I came to the, to the highway, it cars was just zipping in like a freeway in and out. So I ran between those cars and I had to slow down on the other side because there's four policemen there. And I remember the one woman had a lot of cleavage and a cross between her, she had to twist. You just see things like that when you just, and I just walked calmly by them and went back into the terminal where it looked like 500 people waiting for their loved ones to get. And I, I mingled with that crowd. And then I got on the uh, little escalator that went down. It says, Nardy trains to the trains. And I said, there's one to Amsterdam, and there's one to Rotterdam. They're looking for me. I'm going to get on one to Rotterdam. So I went, I went back several cars. There was nobody there. I was waiting. And I went into a bathroom and took that coat off. Oh, I took that coat off where I probably had it. I shoved it in the thing. And I mean, I went to pulling thorns out of me, and I sat down on the toilet, and I closed that door and went, shh. And I said, my feelings exactly. <laughs> oh, man. So I went to where I was supposed to go, to the train station, and of course nobody showed up. So Howard comes to Mari and says, oh my, my, what happened? That passport, oh, it was nothing to do with that. I got the $2 million for Roger, tell him to come see me. So I went back to, I disguised myself and went on the ferry back to Mallorca, Spain and to meet him. And I go to one place and uh, we go to breakfast, and he said, do you have the plate, still have the Andorra plates on your car? And I said, yes. He said, well, they're looking for them really hard in Holland here, or in Spain here. So he said, but I'll get you the money later today. So I went back to my car, and there's four policemen there with a the gun. Boom. Take your keys out of the car when I went to open it, and put your hands on the car. And I turned around and looked, and they was all old men. <laughs> <laughs> one of them was big and fat, and the other two just looked like they wouldn't be. Well, the one that looked like might be something, I got him right on the nose and went over him. <laughs> oh. And through the crowd I went, and there was tourists everywhere, and they didn't last long. So I went into a hotel, jumped out the window on the other side, and went across a little creek, and went back into another hotel, and I stayed hidden there for an hour or so behind a stage in a curtain. So I went out and there was a fellow there with kind of glassy eyes and he said, hello, hello. And then I looked, there's that fat policeman that went <laughs> from the first and I had to go back through the hotel, back across the place. And I went into a place that had a, a little a workshop for wood. And they had a little three wheel pickup truck with the little front one on the front that they have in Spain and France. And I said, I'll give you a hundred dollars to take me Magaluf. And so we jumped in, just right in, back out and go, and police cars were sliding in from everywhere. He said, wonder what's going on? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I got away from Howard that time. 
So he cried and begged Mari, oh, Mari, I don't know what's happening. It's those Andorra plates. There's nothing to do with it. And they got a lawyer to tell Mari, tell Roger, I pay him and do this. And so we had lunch with him. And Mari told him we got, my son was having a little play. And I'm kind of believing, I know better, but still, you just, I couldn't believe it was him. We've done 10 ton load, 20 ton loads with him. Yeah. Why is he? So we go to the school. And of course, I'm the only father there. And here they come with their machine guns and all those children there. I just put my hands up, <laughs> took my watch off and took everything at it to Mari. And they still knocked me down in front of all the people. And my children couldn't go to the school anymore. And uh, they put me in prison. How long did you go to prison? Well, I didn't stay there very long because <laughs> they took me to court in, in Mallorca. And for the extradition, I found I was to be extradited both to Germany and to the United States. Double extradition. So they, they handcuffing me now this way, everywhere I go with my hands over my back like that so I can't get handcuffs. So that's rather painful when they leave you that way overnight somewhere. Anyway, the, the, they took me to court and they had to take and put the handcuffs in front of me. They can't have me that way. So they had four policemen now on me after I've escaped from them that many times. So we're waiting on the judge and it's high. It's the third floor. I heard later on it was 31 feet from the bottom of that window to the, to the ground. So I asked that lawyer, how, how high is it? And he said, you'll kill yourself. I said, I'm dead anyway. So I said, when two of those policemen go to smoke, I'm, I'm going out of here. He said, you're going to kill yourself. And I said, is it higher than the palm trees? And I could see the top of a palm tree below the window. So when two of them went to smoke, I bound across that, that courtroom and jumped up on the stenographer's desk. It was like a grand piano. And she was nine months pregnant, said she almost had that baby. And I kicked that window out. It was a big window. And you could hear that courtroom going. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked down, and there was a station wagon on the street down there. And it was parked kind of up on the curb, and I bailed out on that. And I, I hit the top of it, kind of like you do when your fireman hit the bang. And it went all the way to the floorboard, all the way to the drive shaft. Mari had to pay $4,000 for that car. <laughs> I got up and got away, but they caught me down the road. Holy shit. And they beat the crap out of me. <laughs> You're the master at escape and evasion. Yeah, and they beat me up so bad and cut my chin and they blood all over me, and I wouldn't clean up. So then the man from the German embassy came, and so when they, I stayed there a year and a half in prison, they sent me to Madrid to the big prison. And uh, they extradited me to Germany with my hands over my back like this. And I got up there, and uh, uh, because of the, the brutality of the Spanish police where they saw that blood on me, I got three days jail time for every day I was in Spain, so I didn't have to. And then I escaped from the German prison, too, after they put me in there. Why were you going to German prison? I'd never been to Germany, never made a phone call to Germany, never thought about Germany. But I bought a ship in Holland. That, they, that was under bank seizure. That was usually the cheapest ship you could get. And there was a really jolly fellow on there. And a, uh, he, was from, he was a German. And I asked him, would you like to, would you haul some hashish? And where? I said, from Morocco or, or anyhow, Middle East somewhere. Hell yeah, how much you paying? I said, I'll give you $400,000. Yeah, I'll do it. So he hauled a load. And I paid him the $400,000, and he bought him a long BMW and a cigar and was bragging, and they found him and arrested him for having the money. And they said, if you'll tell us who gave you the money, you'll be home by Christmas. But they forgot to tell him which Christmas. He got seven years and no evidence whatsoever. So they extradited me out of Germany, and I got nine years in Germany for using a German citizen in an international crime. No evidence whatsoever. We didn't ever do anything. The Tashis went to Germany and went to England. So after one year at the maximum security prison in Lübeck, Germany, I, uh, I, I escaped. Went between the bars and almost got killed and uh, skin off my chest. And I went, went through, we got on climbing on the roof where they was doing uh, some windows changing up for scaffolding and got above the guard tower. There was towers ever, everywhere, ever every hundred feet there would machine guns in it. And I got right up on the fourth floor and there was a machine gun nest on the second floor sticking out. And I waited 
until a guard was coming with his wife and a little boy and it's pouring down rain. Here I am all bloody with my chest skinned up. And I jumped right on top of that, that tower with the machine gun and the guy, hey! And I bailed over the wall and they was doing some digging on the other side. There was a pile of sand, I'd, I'd seen it. And I jumped on the side of that sand like he would have skiing and, and, and broke my fall. Uh, it was fourth floor up. And so uh, I, 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 fourth floor and then down to the tower and, and then across. And I got away and, and got to Holland. And Mari had buried $100,000 for me there and gave me $200 and it was in my shoe. And when I, when I was going, when after I got away and went to the man and his wife, he went in. Hold and, on, so your wife buried $100,000 somewhere, where at in Holland? And she's from Holland, she buried it on her cousin's farm. When? Oh, before I escaped, because I told her I was getting out of there. No shit. And she gave me two hundred dollars in the in the prison, and you know, I had that in my sock. So when when that woman got after me, the one that took her home, I heard blam 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 behind me. I'm going down a real steep hill. And I got I'm just slapping wide open. It's a maximum security prison. You don't escape from there. So I hear blam blam blam, and that fool woman's up on the sidewalk, knocking parking meters over, trying to kill me. And I jump behind the car and she tears the fender off of her car and the fender off of another car. And she has like a devil face screaming at me with a little boy standing in the seats. So I jump over a fence, a wall, and it's got cut, it's got glass sticking up. I cut myself all up on my hands and I jump over and it's plowed dirt on the other side and I bog up halfway to my knees and it's raining. And I lose my shoes and my $200 <laughs> in that. Anyway, I get away and I get to Holland. And then, then my digger, Mari had told me, says, you go to the haystack and then you turn right and you go to the linden tree and it's 10 feet from that linden tree. She didn't tell me that there's 20 linden trees in that pasture. <laughs> oh, shit. So we had to get rods and poke in the dirt till we found it, found it pretty quick. But it was kind of funny. So you got the money. Got the money. And then what? Got me some clothes. And then I, I stayed there till I could get a passport. And uh, then I went back to uh, South America to see the Columbians. They owed me three and a half million dollars and I thought they might pay me. Hold on. How did you get a passport? Are these look? My daughter lived in England and she went to a graveyard and she found a kid, a baby that would died about 1943. that wasn't registered or it was registered but no deaths. So she went in and got the, uh, the birth certificate and with the birth certificate, you go and you apply for a passport and you get the doctor and you get the dentist and you get the baker and they sign that they've known you and you're a good, a good character for those many years and the passport comes. That's the way it used to be. It's not that way anymore. I wow. got a beautiful British passport. Incredible. So then you flew back to... I flew, to, I, flew I, I took my train, I disguised myself and went to Portugal and I flew out of Portugal to... Venezuela, and from Venezuela, I went across the border and went on to Medellin, Colombia, to see the Colombians. How did you disguise yourself? Do you remember? I don't remember really. I did the clothes and the hat and the clothes and the hat. Maybe a phony beard or something that I got. You, you can buy all kind of little stuff that you get and sun visors and shorts, and you look like a tourist. So you go to Colombia and you're starting to get into. I, I backed up uh, uh, some of those years. I skipped some years way in the middle of it. Okay. After the uh, after the policeman, I hit him in the head with a rock. Uh, I started flying a few loads out of Columbia. Okay. Well, before we go into Columbia, let's take a little break. All right, let's do that. Perfect. A lot of you have heard me talk about my psychedelic journey this year and all the benefits that came from doing it, one being I haven't drank in seven months. I haven't had any caffeine in seven months. My anxiety's gone, my anger's gone. A whole list of benefits came from that. And that led me down this journey of researching benefits of mushrooms and fungi in general. And in my research, I found this company called Mudwater. Mudwater is a coffee alternative with four adaptogenic mushrooms and herbs. With a fraction of the caffeine as a cup of coffee, you get energy without anxiety, jitters, or the crash of coffee. What I really like about Mudwater is that they took the time to find the perfect ingredients to make a product that's gonna make you feel better every day. I genuinely believe 
that this is a good product. Mudwater is Whole30 approved, 100% USDA organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and kosher certified. Mudwater also donates monthly to the Berkeley Center for the Science of Psychedelics, as Mudwater believes the country is in a mental health epidemic, and so do I. Go to mudwater.com slash Sean to support the show and use code Sean for 15% off. That's mudwater.com slash Sean. Use code Sean for 15% off. I used to live in Florida. And when I lived in Florida, I learned a very valuable lesson going through hurricane after hurricane after hurricane after hurricane. And that lesson is do not wait for the last minute to get the emergency type items that you need because they are not going to be there because guess who else is looking for that? Everyone else around you, everybody on the planet. So I invested in some long-term emergency food with my Patriot Supply. This is a one month supply. This food lasts for 25 years. Doesn't go bad for 25 years. You just keep it somewhere safe hold on to it, and then when things like 2020 happened, the food shortages, the next hurricane, maybe a tornado, any type of emergency, guess what? While everybody else is scurrying around, trying to figure out how they're gonna survive this thing, you've already got everything prepped and ready to go. It's, I'm telling you, it is the best feeling in the world to be at home, see something happen on the news, and know we're already ready for this, it's no big deal, and everybody else is gonna be out there scurrying around the grocery stores fighting for a little case of water or some food. My Patriot Supply is the nation's largest preparedness company. It is currently offering a 20% discount on their popular three-month emergency food kit. Go to prepwithshawn.com right now and grab your 20% savings off each three month kit you need. That's prepwithshawn.com. All right, Roger, we're back from the break. We're getting ready to hit Columbia, but in the break you told me you had a couple more stories of marijuana smuggling. Yes, rather lively ones. Well, <laughs> we like hearing the lively ones. I, uh... Oh my goodness, I gotta tell about my sister going down with me. I, uh, a DC-3, uh, you must have two pilots. I didn't have a pilot that wanted to go with me and I didn't have one I wanted to go with me, so. But I got a, I got a wild sister. <laughs> and so she'd put her hair up and she'd fly down with me and then I'd put her out on the loads and she'd fly back, so. But she's an alcoholic, she was then. So we landed in, uh, Houston, I believe it was, and big old DC-3. I had two tanks inside that, I don't know, 1,000 gallons, I guess, that they held. And so the guys pumping it with a little hose like you have at the gas station there from a truck, and I'm pumping it from the main tank back into those, in, to the tanks inside. And he's just like, wow, how much is this thing? Oh. <laughs> Anyhow, Kay says, I'm gonna go get some sandwiches. Well. You stay sober, Kay. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so after a few hours, we all filled up, and it's raining, and I, I go over, and there's Kay at the bar. She's got the sandwiches, but she's got her foot up there entertaining the cowboys. <laughs> Kay, it's time to go. So anyhow, we go get in the plane, and she's sitting up there just fine. I get up about 11,000 feet, uh, and she's, I'm cold, I'm cold. And I said, well, go back and open my suitcase and put some clothes on. So anyhow, there's, there's two big tanks. I think there's 500 gallons strapped on this side and 500, and these big hoses, it goes in the middle and there's a lever that I can turn it to either side of them. Well, we're out there about half, about 400 miles south of New Orleans over the Gulf of Mexico at 11,000 feet and pretty good rain and bouncing along and both engines stop, bam. Got my attention, I looked, and everything looks right, and I think, what in the world? Now, we're plummeting towards our death. There ain't no way we can live through a crash in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico at night in a storm. 
And I think, that fool has turned that gas off. <laughs> so I shine my light back there. And there she is wrapped up all in my clothes, all wrapped all around her. And she got her foot on that lever. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> Both engines. Well, I jump out of my seat and run back there. And I forgot to pull the throttles back as I run back. So I, they still wide open at that altitude. And I push her out of the way and turn that thing on, and it goes BAM! And both of those engines take off and throw me all the way to the back. <laughs> oh my and here God. that thing's turning up. They just, they know, they just turn it up going up on its side. And I run up the side trying to scramble back in there to get that thing level. Anyway, that's. <clears throat> That was one of just just a funny that I tell about Kay and in my trip going down there. Are you and your sister? Is she still alive? Oh, she's just wonderful. Yes, we we. You guys are still <laughs> yeah, close. Yeah, we love one. Another. Did she go down there with you a lot? No, a few times. Yeah. Yeah. I remember on that trip, I was so upset that I I forgot to give the the people the money for the load. <laughs> it's a minor detail. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> they let her go in there. <laughs> I mean, she had, they put her on plane, flew her back. Uh. So I, I uh, was flying out of Columbia, and uh, I, I went down and uh, had, had a fellow that uh, wasn't telling me the truth. He told me the, he had three tons waiting at certain, certain place. So we left San Jose, and he was just adamant that we go further. Now, we got to go now. I said, listen, fool, this thing flies 150 miles an hour, and it's 900 miles. It's going to take us six hours to get there. What can't you figure out? Oh, we need to get that. I said, I'm not going to sit there with my plane all day long, all afternoon. In the plane. But what it was, this was a staging place, and he had planned to go me go 400 miles further, and he had all kind of pipes. So anyhow, we landed there just about dark in the rain, filled it up. And he said, well, this is not where you're going to get the marijuana. It's got to be 400 miles further. So you were, you were flying cocaine out of Columbia, no, or I'm is, sorry, marijuana this, out of Columbia as yes, well. Yes, I flew quite a lot of Columbia out of Columbia. So... Uh, uh, he, uh, we, uh, I said, all right. He said, we'll just lighten the load by and bring out two tons. You know, that's a lot of money because that stuff was, let's see, it's three hundred dollars a pound, so three six, uh, a million. What is it? Four times uh, one point two million would it would have brought. So it was worthwhile doing. But he was deception that made me go that far. So I wasn't on time. So the next morning, about daylight, or we were three or four o'clock in the morning, we took off to go on to go, and we had to find some forts in the river and finally found the place. And we landed there, and out of the bushes, it was termite hills all along. It didn't even look like a runway, just a little bit of thing in the grass. Here's these white, irate Colombians come out of there, and man, they have shotguns with banana clips, and they point out, get the hell out of here, get out of here, get out of here. This is where they live, and it's a guerrilla group, Farsk. And they didn't want an airplane there. This they they've been patrolled every day by Colombian jets. They mm -hmm. want us out of there. We had the marijuana here last night. You should have been here. Damn. Come back tonight. So we went back 400 miles to the same place for a staging place, and uh, that's where I'd give the uh, the old man would uh, that was hooting the load together. I'd give him eighty thousand dollars, and uh, he was surprised to see us and like, well, what could he do? What could we do? Either go back and leave it or, but I'm done down there, done all, all this. So I, uh, uh, there's a woman killed an old rooster and she bought it a while, but not long enough. And we got a little bit of something to eat. <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> and I went behind the house and I was in a hammock and I went to sleep in a hammock and <laughs> I looked up in the ass end of two military jets going straight up, and the other one just peeled off, and he came back in front of my airplane with 50 caliber machine gun, just tore that runway up, just <laughs> dirt flying everywhere and coming right up by the house. I like, damn. So it looked like every Colombian in town running, got on a flatbed truck and took off my $80,000. And I thought, well, they won't really shoot me. <laughs> so I took off and ran to the airplane. And I got in that DC-3, and I fired her up and took off without even warming up a bit. And the two jets swarmed right on me, one on each side. They just come right down. I think their wings was on top of my wings nearly. And they were just telling me, going, I knew where the air base was, Via Vincencia, go there. And I said, uh-uh, give them the old peace signs. And uh, 
I kept slowing slower and slower, and they just slowed down till they couldn't go no further. Now, my gear is hanging down, and those tires are bigger than a truck tire, so I wasn't going nowhere. So I said, I got to, I got to stop. I, uh, there's a pin that you put in them with a big red flag so you won't forget so when you take off because if your hydraulic fluid goes, it won't let it, won't let it go down to the ground. So there was a big pasture ahead, and I, and I put it down. That thing was rough. Oh, it was way rougher than it looked. It looked smooth when I looked. And those 105-foot wings were just flopping up and down like this as I landed, and the, and the gas cap popped off and gone. <laughs> oh, so yeah. I jumped out and took the pins out of the struts and run back and jumped in the airplane. And I guess one, one plane was low on fuel, and another one stayed with me. <clears throat> and anyhow, he got under me. And... He's shooting those tracers, and he must have been just under the airplane because they looked like they were coming up like in an arc right under the windshield, just red streaks up. And of course, some of them was live, you know. So, I, and then, then the 50 caliber cannon, boom, 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 boom. I thought, hey, he ain't gonna shoot me down. And then he come around and he just tore the tail of it up with a 50 caliber. And really? I got like 10 or 15 barrels of high test gasoline in there. <laughs> it got me on my attention. Then he started off on the wing and just eat it up with a machine gun. Uh-oh. So there was a thunderstorm straight ahead. And they hang close to the mountains down there in the tropics. And I thought, well, I get in there, I'll, get, I'll lose him. He, he ain't going in there, but I'll go in a little ways. Well, I must I climbed up. I must have been 12, 15,000 feet when I went in. And I got in an updraft, and it just popped my ears like crazy. <laughs> You know something about a thunderstorm pilot. It took me up, and I don't know how high I was, but I had ice on the windshield, and I think on some of the leading edge. And I went back out. It was thundering and lightning there, boom, boom, boom. And I went back out, and there he was, boom, boom, boom again. <laughs> I said, all right. So I went back in, and I got just as soon as I got in it, I put it in a spin. I put that thing up on its wing and put it on a spin and went all the way down. And I got down about 2,000 feet and broke out. It was so pretty down there. I blew it, and I lost him. So by now, I'm bulletproof. My adrenaline's done gone up. He done shot my airplane up. I got $80,000 gone off through the jungle. I'm going to get that load. Holy cow. So I'm, on, I'm falling the Guaviera River, and uh, down there, it's way down, and uh, close to Ecuador, Brazil, uh, Venezuela, anyway. And uh, I saw a spot that looked like it was miles long of just grass high up on a bluff above the river and I'd seen it had been uh, smoothed out by the freshets in the river when it comes up that high and I put the wheels down and I must have went a mile and the propellers are just cutting the grass like like lawnmowers and I go around I must have went five or six times I had a co-pilot in there named Dan I said I know Al and I said Al we'll put it down this time so it was just smooth as glass went to put and then as it went to Slow and I said, "Get your get your feet off the brakes." He said, "My feet not on the brakes." And they, those play, airplanes weigh thirty thousand pounds, and they just own two tires, and that was breaking through the crust. Oh. And that plane, that thirty thousand pounds, broke through that crust, and that plane started coming to us up on its nose, and it came right up, right up, right up, slowly, right up, and it crushed the nose right in on us, and I fell between the seat, and it stopped right at me. You're not. You're kidding. Pardon? You're kidding me. No. And oh, so I'm, right there. Right. I mean, the whole nose. The 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 uh, the engine stopped it. The propellers and the engine are in the mud now. They're sliding along, and it stopped absolutely ninety degrees, just like that, with that big tail, a hundred foot in the air. Beautiful airplane stuck up in the nose. Now then, the hatch is is over your head. Now it's right in front of me. So I just undo the boat, step out, get my little satchel. And uh, the co-pilot gets out with me, and uh, they, they had two guys in the back, the ones that were ranging that load, and they was all that fuel, and they got some hoses, and they opened that back door up there, and they was all right. I knew they would be. One of them broke his finger, I think, and all them drum turning around. And they skimmed down, and that big fella that had the load, he was nearly seven foot. He was too, so big he couldn't get in the cockpit and had stretch marks on him all over. And he was crying, so he couldn't even tow his suitcase. Shows you what's... <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> we took the suitcase down the down the uh, pathways. Oh man, it was hot, and they would bug just all over us. And the grass was about that high. And uh, 
So we had the suitcases and, and met a, a, a little boy and girl. He might have been 12 years old. And one of them was riding a little ox and the other one a little mule. And we asked him, uh, can you take these suitcases to the village for us? I knew there's a village about 10 miles a day. Yes, yes, they can take it. So we put tied them on and they run alongside of us and we chatted along going down the little trail through this uh, savanna type thing. It wasn't much trees. And so I, I knew it was going to the village and uh, I said, are there any police there? No, no, senor, no police there. Oh, good. So when we got close to the village, I gave them the money and told them, go home, go home. No, I know, we don't want you to go with us. I didn't want them to tell about the airplane sticking up. <laughs> so they went back and we went to a village and uh, wow, we pulled around when we got to the village, it was like a thatched roof place and a little store. And we ordered some Coca-Cola and we're standing there the four of us having Coca-Colas, when a bunch of soldiers surrounded us with, with guns. There's no police there. This was a military base. Oh, boy. San Jose de Guavieri up the river from it. So, uh-oh, what are you doing here? We had passports, but they didn't have the, the stamp in them, but they didn't notice that. And they said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm a doctor, of, uh, and we're looking for cures for medicine, and when we were studying the plants of the Amazon, and our boat broke down 20 kilometers down, and we walked here. Okay, that sort of satisfied them, but they weren't too satisfied with it. So I looked, and there was a big dugout. That thing must have been 40 feet long. The Yamaha engine looked like it had a shaft 12 feet long. <laughs> it was, that thing was big. So I noticed that and found out where the man lived. So they put us in a house. After we, we ate supper there with them. And they put a guard on the door. And before daylight, I got on the big fella's shoulders. And I removed one tile at the time from the roof. And we crawled out of that roof and got dropped down on the ground on the outside. And I went to the house of the man that had to, on the boat. And I don't know what we promised him, but a lot of money to take us down the river to our boat. Let's go, but we got to go now. Let's go now. So, boy, with the money, I handed it to him, I think, a $1,100 bills or a $1,000. And so we jumped in that boat and took off down the river. And I guess after about an hour, how much further? Just, just, and he just put it up on a sandbar and said, I'm not going any further. <laughs> we said, Mr., you got to go. <laughs> We got to get down the river. He said, "Yes, this this is an official boat, like the for, for the village. We I, I carry the mail. I'm I'm it." I said, I, "I don't know how much we promised him. We can give him a lot of money, and he'd take us on down there all day long. And before we got to Santa, we had to run empty the boat because there was some rapids, some really good stuff, like yeah. ten feet high. I stayed in the boat while he, well a, a young boy that lived there ran it, and then he wouldn't even ride in it." I don't know how he got back up over those rapids. But we went on down and we got out and uh, we went to a poor place. And it, that was where a little trail went in. And uh, we spent the night and, oh, I got eat up so bad with bugs. It was just terrible. I noticed that uh, the man and woman had two little children. They got in a wooden box and spent the night. The next morning they got out, they were just wet with sweat, stuck to them. They staying out of the bugs. And uh, I remember the man... Uh, the chickens and the pigs rooting on the floor, and he knew three words in English, I want more. I thought, uh, he knew that, I want more. So uh, we got something to eat, and I walked about, I, I guess, close to 50 miles that day. They had put me in with a young man, and he threw his hips back, and he could walk. Almost, I almost had to jog stay up with him like 12 hours. So I believe I was doing at least four miles an hour. So we got to a sawmill, and I rented a Jeep and came back and got, got the other uh, guys that was there. And uh, we started out that night uh, about midnight and we was going out the road to get out of there. And the road would be out and we'd have to go off and around it. And those t <laughs> all those people, they would just sit in the Jeep, they wouldn't get out. I'd have to get out and jack it up, hook a winch to it. I was, I was as muddy as a hog, I mean laying in the water. I was mad with them too. <laughs> they sitting right there. So just just as it was just getting daylight, the guy that was driving, <clears throat> it was the uh, he says, "Get all your passports in order and everything. Don't have anything on you because we're going through a big roadblock up here. This is Fort Gorilla territory, and everything comes out of here is scrutinized big." And I said, "Boys, we can't go through a roadblock here after what we did yesterday." 
Oh, yeah, we got $800 and you got a credit card. We can get through. These people only make $50 a month. And this guy, Dan, and I said, I'm not going through. I'll, I'll, I'll crawl on my belly a month or a year and eat snakes before I'm going through a roadblock. That's sticking your head on a noose, man. <clears throat> well, uh, we tired. We're going to go on through. And uh, I get out of there. Al, come on with me, man. You work for me. Oh, no, I'm going with Dan. Dan oh, had man. big muscles. So I got out, and I watched the taillights of that Jeep going down the road. They spent five years in prison in Bogota, and I went on down the trail. <clears throat> and I come to a, a yard, and there was an old woman there, a real old woman. She was peeling peeling oranges. And I says, and there was a well there with a curve of um, bricks around it. And I said, can I use, the, uh, use your well to wash this mud off of me? The water belongs to God. Use all you want. So I drew bucketfuls of bucketfuls, and I put my clothes over a bush, and I scrubbed, and I shaved, and I cleaned up, and put on clean clothes out of my satchel, and I had uh, brute after shave lotion. I put that all over them bug bites. I must have had a thousand of them on me. That felt so good. I thanked the, the old woman, and I went on down the road, and I found me a mossy spot under a tree, and I slept. <laughs> for most of that day. And then I went on down the trail and I came to a little house on the ba high banks of, a, of the river. And they were so nice to me, a man and a woman, they didn't have any children. And she, I don't know where he called, he must have had a net because he had a, a tub full of little fish fried up. And she had mounds of them. Those things were delicious. And so I slept in a hammock that night with a mosquito net over me and the next morning, a beautiful breakfast and wish me luck. And I went on down the road with my suitcase and got in a canoe and went down the river. I was 11 days going through the jungle and I kept asking the Indians, Don Dista Avions, where's airplanes? Loma Linda, Loma Linda. So I kept going to Loma Linda and in one of the dugouts I was standing there and I think I was just, just trying to communicate with Mari and I said, I'm all right, I'm all right. Cause they thought I was dead. Yeah. And Mari said she was taking a shower and she heard me say it clearly. And she had less worries about it. So after the 11 days, I finally came in all kinds of ways getting, getting across that country. I came to a place that is pretty as Hawaii in World War II. Ship black buildings, low, a runway there and a tower for a radio antenna, a bunch of little airplanes, Cessnas. What in the world is this place? And I went up, hello, how did you get here? I went, my name is Katie Sue. Welcome. You don't know what this is. This is Loma Linda, headquarters for Missionary Aviation Fellowship for the Amazon. Wow. And uh, I stayed in a cabin that night, and there was a redhead electrician that worked for the same electrical outfit I did that come down there to do work. And what a, what a witness for the Lord he was to me. I mean, he, he was on fire. And uh, so the next day I got in a attack, I got in an airplane with an old missionary from Canada that had retired, and they flew him out, and I flew with them. And they flew to Via Vincencia military base where the planes had tried to get me to go, and a military policeman reached in the, in the airplane and took my bag out and put it in a taxi. You so God did dead. tap me on the shoulder. So I was a I was the first plane that was shot up shot up or shot down in in Columbia and they they uh, interrupted the World Series baseball game in 1981. American DC three has just been shot by Colombian jets. But he's up he's up and away, ladies and gentlemen. That's when I stopped to take the. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, we'll keep you posted. So that was my uh, some of my marijuana. Smuggling out of Columbia. They, they interrupted the World Series. They interrupted to tell about that. Wow. So then I hooked up with some big boys. And uh, we went to, uh, I, I met up with the Davilas out of uh, Santa Marta. And they just had endless supplies of marijuana at, at $300 a pound. And they would give it to you on a credit and you give them $50 a pound after it was over. So we went and bought a, a DC-7. I went and bought it at Hollywood Burbank. Of course, I'd never flown anything that big, but that guy says, I'll have you flying in in a week. She's a sweetheart. Come on here. <laughs> I just flew it out of Mozambique. The, the bullet holes was in that thing, and it had one engine missing, and he had a great big uh, dagger on his desk, paperweight, and it says, 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because I'm the meanest son of a bitch in the valley. (laughs) 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 So I thought what a blasphemous time that was. But anyway, I remember the fellow, big South African, and I bought the plane. And uh, there's four of us going to, you know, I was going to fly it and get a help pilot. So the next morning, I, I start to go down the stairs, and my daughter, Maria, she's about 12 years old at the time, and she's there in a nightgown, and she's just crying her eyes out. Maria, what in the world's the matter, baby? And uh, I said, Daddy, it's just, I did the worst dream, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't a dream. I, I saw it. It was just you were there. Uh, you were driving your train, and the bad people had taken the, the rail out, and it was on fire, and Aunt Kay was drunk, and we couldn't get you out. And so I just shook I hadn't drove a train in 10 years. I used to work on the railroad. So uh, she said, yes, but before that, it looked like your DC-3. It had, it had the same smiley face, but it had four engines, and one of them was off, and it was all greasy inside, and the inside looked like a tube, and it was on fire. Well, my blood run cold. That's exactly what that airplane that I just bought no kidding. Like. So I said, oh, I'm not about to fly that thing. So I went and told the other guys, and they said, that's all right. We, we get somebody else. And so I got my money back. And they, no problem. Anyhow, they hired some guy to fly it, and he landed in uh, oh, at Rio, I think, oh, oh anyhow, in, in Santa Marta. He landed on the salt flats, and I think it was on 4,000 feet. And those big, big propellers have to be put in reverse at 70 knots to blow them back in position. So he held it in too long, and they stayed in reverse. So they, they had to hire a mechanic to come from Miami to fix it. And that plane sat there for two days for all the world to see. I wonder how much that costs. That thing's huge. It's yeah. almost like 747 sitting there. So... Uh, when, when the, they got it loaded with 30 tons and uh, they started left, one, engine one fired right up, engine two fired right up, engine three, engine four, yah, 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 and then it caught on fire. Well, they turned the fire extinguisher to that engine and pulled it because the, the canister that holds the, the chemicals is under the pilot seat and the co-pilot, and it, the hoses blew out in the cockpit and asphyxiated the pilot, the co-pilot, and the flight engineer. And that plane sat there and burned, and they had to go in and break in and pull those men out of there, and they were hurt really bad, broke their arms and legs. They had to throw them down down the ladders 20 feet to get them out of there on that burning plane, and it burned right there on the, on the salt flats. Wow. So I know my daughter saw that. Well, that's interesting because we had spoken a little bit about Some visions of these things, yes. Before and uh, during the break. What do you attribute that to? I don't know, but people's had them. The Bible's full of them. Yeah. You look at them, they're just there. You look at, uh, I just think it, I'd like people to look at uh, Ezekiel, like 38, 39, we're facing a war. We're going to have a war with Russia, Israel. Don't believe it, just read it. Where people have to go out and mark the bones and clean the, clean the land. Yeah. And we'll burn the fuel of the, this invading army. What could it be that were written? nearly 2,700 years ago. These, these, the people have them, and I certainly have them. And, uh, Do you have any other ones? Yes. I, uh, I was arrested in, in uh, Australia, and I, rem- I had the vision two weeks before it happened. It happened exactly like I saw it. And uh, then I was up in Lompoc Penitentiary, <clears throat> and... Uh, we, uh, Mari was visiting. She visited me every 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 Monday. She brought brought color to that place, and uh, it was a maximum security prison. Somebody killed there every month, or, or one, twelve a year. So it was, it was a bad place, just a bad place. I saw guards get killed. I slipped around in the blood. People got killed in front of me. Man cut another man's heart out and ate his heart, and then they moved me in that cell. It was it was it was vicious. Wow, but. Uh, I, I saw uh, I saw my friends laying in glass and blood and all the windows blown out. And I told all of them, it's coming. I told them, they had a, a chaplain, I told him. I said, it's coming, I have seen it. And so I, I saw them, the guards on the back putting handcuffs on people. And we was in the visiting room, and uh, uh, the blacks had a, 
a rapper to come in, and she had a slit all the way up the side of her skirt, and she was black, wrapping black bondage, black bondage. <laughs> and those boys tried to get on the stage to touch her, and her bodyguards was getting them, and they come in the melee, and a white guard came up to stop it. There was only one in there, and they put a microphone in his head. Down he went, and it was, it was on. So we was in the visiting room, and here they are, helicopters overhead. They coming through. They must have had highway patrolmen and police from all over the state coming in. Fourteen hundred men fighting. <laughs> they, they was a, uh, uh, some of the 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 guys that had blown up, uh, tried to blow up the trade center there, back uh -huh. in ninety one. They were five or six of them in there. And they grabbed a little guard and drug her in her cell, and they said she broke those windows. <laughs> Scream. <laughs> they dropped cans of balding water on the guards, and there was a uh, uh, table, a pool table, and they'd take those in pool panels and throw them, and they'd bounce off the wall, and they'd get them again. It was going on. So anyway, <clears throat> they came in with concussion grenades and all kinds of stuff. They blew 10,000 windows out of that place. <laughs> Wow. So I guess nine to ten o'clock, they uh, they let me go to escort Mari out as long as we we had a visit. I guess fourteen hours. I don't know how long we we couldn't leave the visiting room. And those guards would come in there to resuit up, and they was all bloody. <laughs> go back. Oh my god. So we uh, and so they put two guards on me and handcuffed me and took me back to M unit, maximum unit, or where it was in in the maximum unit. And there, there laying in the glass and the blood was exactly the same people, my friend Bill, Big Jim. No kidding. Just exactly like I'd seen it in the vision. Where, where, when would you have these visions? Usually about two in? weeks before it happens. So what, Just, would you, what would you be doing? Middle of the day, nighttime, uh, I'd be, dreams? I'd be, I'd be sleeping. Dreams? Dreams. It wasn't, wasn't dreams, though, for sure. I have dreams, but it wasn't dreams. But uh, what would you, what would it be like when you would come out of the vision? You just wake up and you know you've just been somewhere. You've seen it. You definitely have been through, the scientists call it a wormhole, but it's not as prophetic, prophetic visions. Well, sure, we can, I, I'm, I'm sure that there's people that meditate, do that. Yeah. And uh, the strangest thing that ever happened to me in my life, in that sort of thing, I landed at uh, Orange County Airport, and I had a business there of land development, but I wanted to see somebody at the airport or in. It's a five star hotel across the street from the airport. And uh, I walked across here. It was a rather cold Wednesday morning, let's say. And I went up to the, uh, to the desk and there was a nice looking woman, about 30 years old, blonde hair and page boy cut. And she had kind of powdery skin. And I thought, I think that book was out. Women are from Venus and men are from Mars. And I thought, boy, she looked like she's from Venus. And I went on and uh, spoke to the lady behind the desk, and it was a cut glass bowl of apples. And I wanted one, but I wasn't a guest, and I was ashamed to get one. But when I turned around, I spoke to the pretty lady, and I, I said, hello. And she said, hello. Excuse me, sir. And I stopped. She said, I know you. And I laughed like I do, and I said, I don't believe I've ever met you. Do I know I'd remember? <laughs> <laughs> and so she said, no, and tears come out of her eyes. And she said, no, I know you. And I said, perhaps if it, if so, I, I've forgotten. I'm sorry, I, but I, my name is Roger Reeves. And we shook hands. So she's flesh and blood. And she said, will you come across the lobby here with me? And I thought, this is strange. And we walked across together and there was a large lobby, nobody there. And there was a, a little ensemble with uh, leather sofas and a green hood and a little fire. And she sat down and she says, just sit on the little thing and she said, will you take both my hands and close your eyes and tell me what you see? Ooh, I get cold chills all over me when I tell this story. Wham! I'm in war. I'm in another dimension. I'm, a, I'm an officer and I'm in a cage as big as this room and it's all been from mining. It's, it's, a, it's a cave with rocks and they rough tables, these lanterns, so it was maybe World War I, I don't know World War II, and I, there I am with a with a uh, hat on, like the cap, and I, I can't see my eyes, but I have a grease coat on, and I can see where the uh, epilepsy were, any insignia I had, I was certainly an officer, had been taken off, because those were snipers, mm -hmm. targets, and I remember I had boots, and the thing came down, 
and yeah, I had a good look at it, and there were sandbags out in front of it, and there was a long row of them and some kind of metal across the top, and it was like eight feet tall. And just outside the door of it there, a shell hit, and it was hit so hard to the sand almost looked like it got in my eyes, and the cordite, cordite flew. I could smell it. It was all in my nose. And I walk there as it clears up, and there's a young soldier in that rubble, and I pick him up, and I'm walking on air, and I'm just taking one step at a time, and I'm saying, medic, medic, medic. And I look at the young soldier's face, he's dead, and it's the face of the woman that I'm holding hands with. And I have no memory of that day. From that, it was erased. Otherwise, I'd ask her, what is your name, who are you? Wow. How did that happen? That... I'm 80 years old and never before or after anything so un unbelievable happened to me. That's incredible. And it wasn't long ago I had another thing that happened to me, and I would like to, if anybody knows, to tell me how to do it, if it's possible. I had a, a daytime vision, and it was a vision of a physics formula. And it was on a grid, and it kept sliding down to the left bottom quadrant, and I kept pushing it up. And whatever it was told me to memorize this, because this is extremely important. It's what physicists are looking for all over the world. And I turned to get a pen to write it after I memorized it, and it vanished like a dream. So I've been to two supposedly, well, a, a certainly good hypnotist, and neither one of them, I, I want to know, is it possible to take me back to look at that again? And uh, neither one of them could hypnotize me. So that's, that's the strangeness other than my endeavors of life that I've, this happened to me. Wow, I've had visions. Well, I wouldn't say visions, I would say intuitions before. You gotta kinda, if, if you're there and you see it and it's bright and you're there, yeah. it's a vision. The intuition is I think I've been there, I see something, oh, I've seen that before. That's that's that, but when you're there, yeah. it's bright and you're there. You can smell it and see it and taste it and feel it. Yeah, I haven't had anything that vivid. Yeah. But I've, I've had, I, I can't make sense out of any of it. I've had it where I'll mention somebody's name and then they call, like, right yes. away, several times. People, and when I say mention somebody's name, it's not like I mention my wife's name and then she calls me because she calls me 50 times a day. You know, it's... I'll mention somebody's name that I haven't thought about, haven't talked to, don't even have their number, maybe haven't seen them in 10 years. And then, bam, we'll get an email in through the website or a text, a phone call from a mutual friend. It happens all the time. You know, There's something and, to it. We're, we're spirits in flesh. I know that. Yeah. And we, I, we may be eternal. And uh, Mary Wheeler Wilcox. I believe. I believe it. Go Be Sorry, beautiful go poet. Many years ago, she had the same thing. And just one, one line of her saying, she said, and you never can tell what your thoughts will do in bringing you love or hate. For thoughts are things with airy wings. They're speedier than carrier doves. So they, they speed over the track to bring you back whatever went out of your mind. How very true. Interesting. You, you had mentioned something about... Have you ever looked into psychedelics? No, I never have. I never taken any drugs. I don't do drugs at all. You've never done any drugs? I no, I've tried a little bit, um, but I'm like Clinton. I didn't inhale. <laughs> 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 no, I don't like them. I like myself like I am. I smoked a little pot one time. I did, did cocaine just to see what it's like. It's a nice feeling, but I don't want to be that way. Well, they say psychedelics, you know, you really tap into your inner self. They tell me that. And, and I read uh, those books, a, 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 a really good one, A Chemical Lo Love Affair. I believe it's like those boys up there. And, yeah, it's, it's good. And the peyote, I know people see things. Yeah, I, certainly they do. Maybe you could get that vision again if you... I'll try. I would try it if, with that. Somebody chain me to a cactus and... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I can't, can't do no harm to myself or whatever. I'm scared of that stuff. <laughs> yeah, I am too. I did it, but um, I did it for some healing stuff. But um, uh, about six months ago, changed changed a lot of aspects of my life for the better. Did it really? Okay, it really I've heard did. that too, really. And Washington State, I believe, has opened it up. And people said, Roger, go up there and grow that stuff. And Yeah, well, yeah, I cleaned me out. I haven't had a drink in six months since that. Oh, and good. Uh, and uh, a lot of self healing stuff. A lot of learned a lot about myself, and 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 you will have visions on that. But um, but anyways, moving on. You kind of had mentioned some reincarnation type stuff too. Well, that that was the one where the, I that, met the woman. That, That's the only thing I ever had that was just Clyde. That was so profound. Yeah. Until how can you just you can't dismiss it. No, it just was. It just something happened to a person that never even thought about such a thing. Yeah, yeah. It's just I've had two out of the body experiences, completely out of the body. Well, Zip. like I'm just come up and walk over here and go over there and come up and look in your ear if I wanted to. Do you see yourself? Yes, I watch myself breathing. All right, I got to hear this too. Let's okay. dive into I, that. I've done it twice, and uh, and uh, Bill Monroe writes a book about it called. Um, out of the body, I believe. I don't know what it is, but anyhow, it's a real good book. And if you face, if you sleep with your head turned due north, he says you're five times more likely to have one. So uh, I had. Uh, Hold on. If you sleep with your face with head due north, you're five times more likely to have an out of the body experience. And they they do it now with with a sound in your in in water, and they got sound for you to help you do this. Mine mine happened naturally. Okay. I tell you, I tell you, the more vivid one that lasted a long time. I guess it lasted as long as I wanted it to. I was working on the railroad. I was a, a fireman on a diesel electric, and it's just me and the engineer up in there. And I think we had 217 loads of stumps, <laughs> them gondolas going from Waycross, Georgia, to to uh, Brunswick to the big Hercules Powder Company. They made gunpowder out of those things. <laughs> it was the lighter stumps with with the pine stock left. Pine stumps are left there from a thousand years ago. So uh, I had uh, taken a car out to a cousin of mine in Oklahoma, and I drove it out there, and then I had to get back and I get to work. So I'd, I'd been, a, been asleep, for, been awake, except for a nap here and there, but I had to go to work. So, I mean, I had that job. It was a good job on the railroad. When the trains run, you, men, you got to be there. So I showed up, and I remember my engineer was Mr. Wendell Davis. He was a sport and the nicest fellow. Anyhow, we hooked seven of those great big diesel engines together and started off with that load of stumps across the Okanokee Swamp, and it was raining. And uh, I believe there's a, a million candle power on the front of those engines, and they go in a figure eight to warn possums or deer or people or cars, and they go like that, just in almost enchanting, you know, just... And the rain was coming down at an angle, and it was just hitting the windshield like diamonds. And the windshield wipers was going, and then when she, and that thing was going like that, and I just came out of my body. I mean, completely out of it. And I thought, wow. And I went up to look at myself, and I look at myself. I had my eyes open, and I was still looking. And I looked at myself. I was breathing, and I floated across the engine room. 10, 10, 12 feet wide, went up there, Mr. Davis, I looked right at it. I could see the pimples where he had dug them out of his face when he was a kid, could see all that. I went up there and I looked outside, I looked at all the gauges, kind of red, and, and I knew that I could just go wherever I wanted to. And I went up, sat on the radio, and I thought, I'll watch this scene for a while, I'm out of my body. And then I, I, after a while, I mean, uh, I thought, I wonder if I'm dead. And when I did, I was, bam, I was right back in my body. So that's, that's happened twice to me. And that you can do, you can have out of the body. You can work at it and have that for sure. It don't, and you can learn to travel. I understand. What was the What was the other one? Uh, another time that I was, uh, uh, me and another boy was at a log truck, and uh, the fuel pump broke on it, and so I laid across the chassis, and I'm blowing into that 55 gallon drum, and I'm breathing that gasoline fumes. And he's, and if my, and I had to keep a uh, pressure on it to keep the, make that thing, it's an 18 wheeler with all them wheels behind me and I'm laying across it, things going 80 miles an hour down the, down the highway. 
And the back window was out of that thing must have been 1938 or something. It was old. It slowed down, blow, Roger, blow, blow, and the wind blowing. And I, I became, I came out of my body. I, and I just could just come right up there in the cockpit. Just then I, I read the signs as we came by. And then he stopped. I was unconscious and he pulled me off of that. <laughs> I could see him doing it. Wow. You got to look into psychedelics. All right. You got to look right into it. it. I'm going to send you some information. A lot of people have those type of experiences on psychedelics. And I swear, it's like a veil. It's just lifted up, and you just see so much more than, 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 than what you normally do, and everything makes sense. It's really, it's, it's, my psychedelic experience is one of the most profound experiences of my life. All right, that's strong. Yeah, and uh, I don't I don't say that lightly. No, and I and, and mine these visions I have, I certainly, I I certainly just like honor them. It's yeah. just like all right, I'm blessed. Sacred. Yes. Wow, wasn't expecting to have that conversation. But, I wouldn't either. <laughs> but um, yeah, I gotta I gotta send you some stuff on psychedelics. Oh, good. It's, it's uh the stuff that. Yeah, it's not the it's not the party drug that 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 was going on in the sixties and seventies. It's 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 there's some real benefits to that stuff. But uh, but anyways, let's let's move back into uh, Columbia. All right, I've uh, I was at my house and there's a wonderful old airplane salesman salesman named Cameron, and he came to my house with a really nice looking. A lawyer from Bogota, Colombia, and they wanted to know that if they sent a ship up, if somebody wanted to ship, would I unload it? And how much was 65 tons? Well, how much were you paying? I don't know. We made, and so they said, yes, but so I made an agreement. Of course, I unloaded it. Be happy to unload it. You have to go out with small boats and get that thing 20 miles over the horizon, where up you. So, uh, they said, but now, he came up once before and the people didn't unload him, so he's shy. He wants the gasoline money for the diesel to come up. And so you have to put up $65,000 for a guarantee that you'll be there. And I thought, that's strange. But my airplanes cost more than that now on every trip. And I said, well, I won't be risking any more than <clears> the <throat> normal risk. So I gave those two shysters $65,000 <laughs> and they left. <laughs> And of course, I didn't hear from him anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I had the cards for the lawyer's address in Bogota. So I got on a flight. I'm sixty-five thousand dollars enough to go look about at that time. It still is today. But uh, so I went. And he was the nicest. Oh, I give it to the Mayan and some big tail. So uh, he says, "But I tell you what, I have a that." You can make so much more money with the cocaine. I said, I don't want to fool with cocaine. Man, there's so much money. I said, how much money? He said, oh, a million or two dollars, two million dollars a trip they'll pay you. I said, what? I said, let's go talk to these folks. <laughs> so we, his wife was a, worked with Avianca, and so we got on a flight and went to Medellin, Colombia. And at that time, that airplane landed right downtown. I mean, the wings almost touched apartment buildings on both sides. Woo! As old 707, it just shook terribly. What year is this? 19, 1980. 1980? So uh, we go uh, to a beautiful condominium, and we go to the top, and it just looks out on verdant jungle and just across the whole city. And then I, you never could see a scenery so pretty. And there was a man in there. That I'd say that he was a modern-day Winston Churchill, just a pure genius. Sloppy drunk. <laughs> and he could talk talk any language you wanted to speak with him. And he slurred, yeah, and he said, Yes, I got I got old cocaine you want to haul. Any anything you I pay five thousand dollars a kilo. Go see Marta. That was his wife. Go see Marta. But anyhow, while, while he was in there, the most strange thing happened. There was a woman came in with her two bodyguards, muscled up little fellows, and she was wearing a rabbit fur hat and rabbit fur jacket in the tropics and boots rabbit fur <laughs> and a mini skirt. And she, 
She kissed him on both cheeks. She ain't paying us no attention. And uh, she's Sonia de Atila from Santa Cruz, Bolivia. High cheekbones of Indian look. Kind of a pretty woman. And uh, so she said, Fernando asked her what she's doing. I'm on my way to Miami to buy an airplane. Well, that lawyer, Roberta Davila, he was rather smart. And he said, well, Roger has an airplane for sale. Oh, now she sees me. What kind of airplane do you have? And I thought, I had several airplanes. I said, I have a Queen Air. Queen Air? Oh, Queen Air. She liked the idea of having a Queen Air. <laughs> she said, how much do you want for the airplane? And Roberta's going like this. <laughs> so I, the, uh, Queen Air was a really a pretty nice airplane, beach crap, but... Uh, Two or three of them, the wings burned off all at one time within a few months or a year or so, and they just grounded them. So I bought several of them, about $50,000 a piece, and there's a $300,000 airplane. And I had a mechanic. There was just one hose that was giving trouble. And uh, so it had tanks in the inside. She said, okay, uh, if I like it, I buy it. Bring it to me. I said, listen, you give me $5,000, I have somebody bring it down today. Give the man $5,000. So her, her little bodyguard came up and gave me $5,000. And I called my friend David, and he flew it down to Panama. So we went to Panama to see it. And there it, there it came. Oh, it looked good. You could see it looked like an airliner coming in. And, oh, she got in it, and she just played pretend driving her queen air. And so she said, okay, I'll buy it. She said, but you got to go to Santa Cruz to get your money. Oh, boy. So... We loaded up with a whole bunch of her people, and we take off way too many for the plane. <laughs> and we take off and go to Santa Cruz, Bolivia, across the jungle. And we land in Santa Cruz, and the policemen were there, and they put the flags on their old cars, and they lead, gear her through the streets. <laughs> she is, she's a black widow of Bolivia. Wow. She's a cocaine queen. So we go out under the water tank, I remember, <clears throat> and she had a house made of marble, <clears throat> big old marble slabs. And it was new. And so she had recently made her money. And there was a, a chain link fence around the place with a kind of a homemade gate. And all the guard, all her, she had about 10 or 12 servants. And they were all out at that gate crying and wringing their hands and just going on. And she, what's the matter with you fools? What's the crap? Your lion is eating the baby. What? So she runs in the house and I go in with her and she's got this mountain lion. And he's eating a baby on the floor, and he's only left just like a diaper and some shit in the head. And she grabs that that line with his blood all over his mouth. Oh, like Tommy, ay, ay, ay. She puts him in another room, and she goes out there, out of here, you idiot. I don't want to see your face again. Leave a baby on the floor in front of a line. <laughs> she Holy had no sympathy shit. whatsoever. Was it her baby? No, it was one of the maid's babies. She didn't have any babies, so... But, so but yeah, the, the mountain lion had ate the, the maid's baby. Holy so, shit. So I saw that right in front of me, that mess of what she saw there. So that she was just a terrible person. I got my money and got out of there. I don't ever want to go back. I'll bet. They offered me to fly a uh, ether <clears throat> from uh, Columbia. I'm from Panama down there to where they make it. And ether was extremely dangerous, but they was paying a huge amount of money, a million dollars a load, just, and that was just legal. But that stuff gets to leaking and it blows up and it burned a lot of people to death. Damn. But I'd like to tell you another lying story. Look, I would love to hear it. We're going to back up to the marijuana days. All right. I, uh, Mexico? It's Mexico to Juan's, Juan's ranch. All the, right. The goat ranch. Uh, anyway, I. Uh, a lion on a goat ranch. Worse, worse than that. <laughs> he, uh, I, I landed there and I said, Juan, is there anywhere that we could grow marijuana here in the middle of Baja that I wouldn't have to go over Oaxaca and Guatemala and wherever and buy it? He said, there's a place maybe where we can go, but you need to spend the night here. So I spent the night in the hammock. Then we got the next morning oh, from fast mules. I mean, them mules are walk fast, young, fast, talking mules. And we went to walk it. And uh, we went by a mesa. And he says, I killed two, two big lions here last week. What? He said, yes. Uh, I was hunting deer, and I rolled the rocks off down in the bushes, and the deer run out, and I shoot them, and that's what we eat. But he said, this day, two big mountain lions ran out. And, I, and he said, killed them both? Yes, I killed them both. I said, what'd you do with them? Like I was saving the high. Oh, we ate them. 
You ate them? Yes, it's very good. I said, what? Yeah. So we rode the mules on and we stopped for lunch. We stopped in a mason and it had rained sometime before and it was just a paradise of flowers everywhere you looked. It was just like a, a riding through heaven. It was so beautiful on those mules. And there's dry cactus stops and we stopped and he had a stack of tortillas and a package of sausage. And uh, he uh, took them tortillas out and a great big fly, just made him one of them. He just took it and threw it away and he broke this cactus up and it made a little white flame. You couldn't even see it with a dried cactus burn. He put them cactus tortillas on it, heated them up, and took that sausage and put it in there and rolled it up. Man, we ate them. I must have ate a dozen of them. I said, that's good meat, right? Uh, one, what is it, Leon? <laughs> so I, I had line for lunch. Nice. <laughs> that two line story. So I guess it is good. <laughs> it would taste all right to me. I guess he put all them peppers in there, whatever. It just, you couldn't tell the difference. You couldn't tell the difference on a house cat. Wow, you got, you've got all kinds of stories. So uh, I'll get back to how I got in the cocaine business. I, uh, so this, this uh, Fernando, 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 yeah, I can't remember his name. Uh, and I went to see his wife, Martha, and she said, he'll sober up one day and he's got all you can do. He's got tons of marijuana. <clears throat> so I was in Belize and uh I called down there and, and I said, uh, Fernando's having a birthday party over on the Pacific. So come, Evianca is flying the people over to it. So uh, I flew down and uh, I think I flew commercially. I know I did. And so I got there and they flew me over in one of those uh, island shorts, carry about 40 people. They used to be around. You don't see them anymore. And they flew over a verdant landscape out of, uh, Medi out of yeah, Medellin and down and between somewhere between Panama and Colombia. It was just that there's no roads over there, wasn't any. <clears throat> and they they landed uphill, and it must have been a mile-long runway. They must have been loading stuff like crazy. And I met a, a couple on the plane, and the, the beautiful couple, and she she spoke English. And uh, so they we became friends on the plane going over, and we got out. And there was a river running in, and there was a log house there, and. Uh, one more, they were barbecuing hogs and goats and cows and all kind of stuff, and they had uh, little houses on stilts, uh, ten feet up, to get out of the waves. But I didn't get one of them. I got the, uh, I, I got the where the workers stay, <laughs> bunking that. But anyway, I, uh, I, um, I'm walking on the beach with a, a woman just come up to me and she's was in poor clothes, like she was from the from the slums, but she was very nice and very quiet. And she says, I have no idea. I'd never been in a helicopter before. The man invited me to come, and I no, don't know. I, how I know? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, so then the couple are coming, and this Matilda, she said, Roger, Mario says that you're walking with the girlfriend of the most vicious killer in Colombia. Oh, he suggests that you get away from her. <laughs> Oh, shit. <laughs> so we kind of come to the end of the beach, and I excused myself, and she went on her way. Anyhow, that night, uh, the people came there from all over. That was where the Medellin cartel started. They decided that so many people were killed until they all got together to have a huge party. And so they stopped killing each other. 10,000 people were killed there a month. If you had 10 kilos and you gave it to one and he's got some pilot going to take it to New York and, well, 10 kilos or 40 kilos got busted in New Jersey, so sorry. Bang, bang. Yeah. That was what was happening by wholesale. So they said, all right, uh, particularly the Ochoas and Escobar and Gacho, uh, Carlos later, they said, we're going to make an um, insurance policy and transportation. Uh, the price of cocaine at that time was fifty thousand dollars in New York. It was ten thousand dollars in Colombia. For you, what? You, a kilo for, for cocaine per kilo. Okay. Two point two pounds. So you give it to us here. We would deliver it to your man in Miami for ten thousand dollars. If it gets busted anywhere, any, any for any reason, it's lost. We will replace it here in Colombia. You can't lose. So they got a hundred tons put on them real quick. 
So that was the beginning of it. So I was there. <clears throat> Anyhow, the, the 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 pretty girl got shoved in on me. Bam! That night, about midnight. Uh oh, here come this guy, and he's angry. <laughs> I guess she won't sleep with him, and he's telling her to sleep with me. <laughs> uh, so anyway, that was uh, that was the beginning of that, and uh, it, I, some, his friends got around him. I <laughs> like, whoa, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but anyway, that's when I met the people with the uh, Mar Mario that, that knew all the people. So we went back, and I think that kind of seemed as old. So all the important people with their planes and helicopters left. There's about two days, of, and we had stand-up comedians, police chiefs from all over the city, and I mean, they they were skits, and it was it was big. So they left, and I think it was only four men there. And uh, uh, I was I, I was laying behind the, the house again, just like the other, and I was reading a book, the MMKs, and I was in a hammock, having some barbecued goat. Bow, bow, and blood spattered on me, and all on that book page. I rolled out of that hammock, must have rolled twenty feet because it was real close, and it was a big pistol. <laughs> and I looked up, and. There's a young black man, look like about 25 years old, handsome fella. And there's a white Colombian there, about 55 or 60 years old, and he's got a big 38. And that black young man tears that pistol out of the man's hand and just, just tears it out of his hand and puts that gun between his eyes. He goes, click, 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 click. There was no more bullets in it, too. And I looked, and there was a dog that had been shot in the head. And I guess he was turning, and the blood was flying, and that's what got on the book. But then I looked at the the young black man, and he's done ashen. He'd been shot right there, and his femoral artery's been cut, and the blood was just gushing down. He's holding it. Yeah. And I and I I, I have some training in first aid and on the fire department. And I said, I'm a doctor. I can, I can help you. And he put that gun at me. And I thought, <laughs> so anyhow, he went hobbling on back. And I had my friend Mario. We went and tried to talk to him, and he went on back down there and died. And. Uh, so then, oh, you could hear those people back there under those trees, oh, la, 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 screaming and crying. And so the night got there, and there was only four of us men. And uh, one of them was a tall airline pilot, and he just went to cry. <laughs> He's, I've seen some cowards in my life. <laughs> so he, he was one of them. And, I, and, and Matilda had a pistol, so I stayed kind of close to her. <laughs> and so we was at that old log house, and just, just four men and those women. And the lights went out. And uh, I went back in there with a flashlight and the, uh, the generator, the gas tank had been filled up with water and sand. They had, those black people had come and, and they said, there's going to be, there's going to be some killing before daylight. <laughs> well, we got little cans and put kerosene in them and put twisted little wicks, put around there in the bugs. What a buggy night we spent. <laughs> anyway, they, uh, uh, soldiers came and, Rounded us all up and got the, got the guy that did the shooting, and he went to take us take a shower, and he took escaped out the back. <laughs> the runway's covered with logs and drums and airplanes flying. Anyhow, they finally get it worked out, and we get out of there. But uh, I get back to Medellin, and I I meet up with Mario and Matilda, and he said, "Listen, I want to introduce you to some people." So he took me uh, up uh, to a little town called Invigada. That's where he lived too. And we went up a, a mount, a winding mountain road, real pretty, with the old bromeliads in the trees, and a gate opened, and he was allowed in, and we went up a stony road to a little, they call them Finca's, a little farm. And uh, there, there was people out there in the old fedora hats. There was like in a hitching rail in an old house. I bet it's two or 300 years old, Hacienda. And it, it was sagging, but it was beautiful, like museum. And we were ushered right in amongst all those people. And there was a really pretty woman. And they asked us for a wanted coffee or tea. And she made us a cup of coffee in a pretty little cup. And there was a hole in the floor. We had to walk around that. And it was just shiny. And went in to see Jorge Ochoa. And a mighty nice fellow. Spoke English. And uh, he had 12 t telephones on the big desk. And he was proud to show me. He said, this is New York, this is Seattle, and this is Chicago. When they ring, I know what's happening. And so then after he asked me what kind of airplanes I had, and I told him and what kind of experience, and he was happy. He said, well, I got all the work you can do. 
and we pay five thousand dollars a kilo. And uh, first load we'll put three hundred in, so that's one and a half million dollars for an eight-hour flight. So uh, he said, "Let me call my partner over." So he sent the pretty woman next door in that old house, and in come Pablo Escobar, and he asked the same things, and he and did the same thing, and shook hands, and said, "Got all the work you want." So, Do you have any idea who these guys were at the time? No, they they were just regular people, and. Uh, Jorge, I mean, Jorge Ochoa still is. He's, he's, he's a gentleman. He owes me three and a half million dollars. He don't want to talk to me, but uh, he's still all right. <laughs> Goes his people in Miami said I was paid, so he's saying I'm clear. But yeah. he's not. He owes it. And it wasn't him. I went to prison. And he owed. He should pay me. Well, before we get into uh, recovering your three and a half million dollars, let's take a quick break. All right, <laughs> real good. <laughs> I want to give a big thank you out right now to all the Vigilance Elite patrons out there that are watching the show right now. Just want to say thank you guys. You are our top supporters and you're what makes this show actually happen. If you're not on Vigilance Elite Patreon, I want to tell you a little bit about what's going on in there. So, we do a little bit of everything. There's plenty of behind the scenes content from the actual Sean Ryan show. On top of that, basically what I do is I take a lot of the questions that I get from you guys or the patrons and then I turn them into videos. So we get, right now there's a lot of concern about self-defense, home defense, crimes on the rise all throughout the country, actually all throughout the world. And so we talk about everything from how to prep your home, how to clear your home, how to get familiar with a firearm, both rifle and pistol for beginners and advanced. We talk about mindset. We talk about defensive driving. We have an end of the month live chat that I'm on at the end of every month where we can talk about whatever topics you guys have. It's actually done on Zoom. You might enjoy it. Check it out. And if Zoom's not your thing or you don't like live chats, like I said, there's a library of well over a hundred videos on where to start with prepping, all the firearm stuff, pretty much anything you can think of. It's on there. So anyways, go to www.patreon.com slash Vigilance Elite or just go in the link in the description. It'll take you right there. And if you don't want to and you just want to continue to watch the show, that's fine too. I appreciate it either way. Love you all. Let's get back to the show. Thank you. All right, Roger, we're back from the break. You had just met Ochoa, and he's bringing in his business partner, El Jefe. Yeah, <clears throat> or he was, uh, uh, spoke English, as he called the, the pretty woman. I mean, she was pretty. And I uh, called her in and uh, spoke in Spanish, and so she went next door and uh, come back with a gentleman, plaid shirt and khaki pants, all iron, very nice. And Jorge introduced me to Pablo Escobar. <clears throat> and uh, Pablo Escobar is a guy five foot eight and 180 pounds. And uh, so he asked me about what kind of airplanes I had and my experience flying across the border. And I told him that I had a DC-3, a Beach 18, a turboprop aero commander, and that I'd done over 100 loads of marijuana. And so he seemed pleased with it and said that uh, they paid $5,000 a kilo and that I haul all I wanted to. So uh, we just had a nice little chat there and just, he didn't seem anything unusual except a businessman that was next door. Who who was Pablo at the time? It was just and nobody, Jorge. Were they, nobody ever heard of him. So this is very, very beginning days. Yes. He hadn't made a name. He wasn't no the richest name man in the world right? yet. Never heard of it. Were you nervous? Not a bit. Why, why would I be? I mean, I just... Uh, 
people ask that, but it was just like if I was a on the truck and I went into a trucking company and asked for let's get a contract for me to haul some stuff across country. It wasn't it wasn't anything, and uh, I, I was looking for cargo before I'd been looking for marijuana, and it got hard to find in Mexico with all the heat that was there. So I had to move further afield. Did it bother you that you were getting into stronger narcotics than marijuana? Not so much at that time. Uh, back in 1980, uh, the cocaine was um, pure. It was made with ether and uh, rather fluffy, big, looked like big footballs, twisted on the end. And only the rich people were doing it. And uh, I don't know if you know that uh, up until not long ago, it was considered a, a non-narcotic controlled substance. So they con didn't consider cocaine a, a, a narcotic. A narcotic it has to be something like cigarettes or heroin that you want, your body, Craves. Okay. If it's mentally addictive, like a lot of things, gambling, sex, all these things, uh, but they're, they're not they're not narcotics. So uh, I understand that uh, the CIA invented crack. I don't know that they did, but uh, in the book, The Big White Lie by Clavel, James Clavel, he was a top DEA agent. He he accuses them of it and said they put it in every every city in the United States in the black communities to sell their cocaine because they're bringing in 10 ton loads. And uh, so at that time it become the most uh, narcotic substance in the world. They said, did you take a few, few hits of that and you were addicted? It puts all the endorphins in your brain until you want it again. Why does he say that they, why does he say the CIA got involved with that? What's his Reasoning to, uh, to there was a group of people in the CIA. I don't believe it's a whole group of them, but they they wanted to sell cocaine, and that boy, I mean, it just went rapid. And now then, now it is a narcotic, and uh, <clears throat> I don't know until that time if anybody had ever died of cocaine. And uh, even today, with all the people that are in prison, I'd like to just say that for cocaine, compared to cigarettes or alcohol, it doesn't even register. If you looked at a, at a chart, it might, yeah, there's some people, in, and anybody, one person dies. I, I don't want any person to hurt anybody. But if you talk about doing the, uh, the greatest evil, things on the, on the earth, it's just like, look what's doing the evil. Yeah. Look at the sugar and all the people and the, the trouble we have in the billions and trillions of dollars and health care that we have just from the, the sugar industry and uh, the things that's mislabeled. Do you realize that up to 400,000 people die each year in the hospital from misdiagnosed drugs oh, yeah. and mistakes? Uh, that might be somewhere between 250 and 400,000. Now, that's a lot of people. You look at a half million people from, from cigarettes, and here it is. The governments get their, their money in Look at the devastation that alcohol does. I don't want to take away alcohol, but if alcohol kills 100 people and, and something else kills one in a million, why in the world don't you go after the, after the cause? And it's just educate people is what's happening yeah. in this business. You so, know, I, I saw on the news that uh, cocaine, Colombia is trying to legalize cocaine right now, or at least it's... It's, it's, it's devastated their country. 10,000 a year being murdered over it back in 1980. Yeah. I was surprised to see it, but yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it in a couple of different headlines now. And uh, over, the, over the past week, they've been saying that they're trying to legalize cocaine down there. Well, they did in Bolivia. And they making, did they really? Making lipstick and face cream and all kinds of stuff out of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, I went, to, uh, I'd like to tell you how the. Uh, uh, I think I might have already told you about the insurance company that they formed down there, and those fellas did and started. So they had just, so I, uh, I went and got my airplane and flew down, and um, they, uh, I landed at a, a banana plantation, and it was a long clay strip, and it was raining, and they put three hundred kilos in there. And then they put the ugliest man you've ever seen, Namor Ronaldo, and he got in the back seat of that airplane with a Mac-10 pistol. 
He's going to make sure I went to Louisiana. <laughs> well, I took off. That fool didn't know. I could have went to Argentina. He didn't know which way was north and south. There was no doubt in my mind. But anyway, we took off, and uh, the little wheels on that airplane kicked up the mud, and the wheel wells are large, and it filled completely up with mud. I mean, I was weighted down with a load of mud, and the wheels wouldn't come up. So here I'm dragging along 100 miles an hour slower than I'm supposed to go. We are not going to make Louisiana. <laughs> so we got it for about 1,000 miles with the wheels hanging down, and I, says, I told him, I said, we've got to land. i got a strip in Belize that I can stop and clean this out and get some fuel. And boy, he put that MAC-10 pistol to my head, no, no, I'll kill you. You're going to Louisiana, going to Louisiana. I said, well, go ahead and shoot, fool. You're going to die too right now. <laughs> <laughs> so we landed, and he was all upset. And there was a, a farm that had a nice long runway at Carter Ranch up in near uh, Orange Walk. And old Mr. Carter there, he was a friend of mine, and he sent the boy out to wash the plane, and we went in with this guy, Ronaldo, and I remember we had a nice big meal, and uh, they cleaned the plane, filled it up with fuel, and we took up on off and went to, uh, went on in New Orleans and, and uh, went on into Louisiana and landed. I landed on Interstate 10. That was the best landing strip ever, ever made. They were making that thing all the way across country, and it, it took them 10 years going across Louisiana and Texas, and at the Mississippi River, there was a cantilever bridge, and about five miles from it, they had a detour, big red flashing lights, just like at the end of a runway. <laughs> I'd come over those and land on that, run, on, that, on that runway. It was five miles long. Holy cow. And how the guy there with a, a truck to unload me. How fast would it take to unload? Five minutes, something That's like that. That's it? Oh, yeah. So from wheels down to wheels back up, well, no, I would, I, I would come in like a hawk. I mean, just silent and touch down. And then the truck would come out of the bushes and we'd throw it in. And uh, the truck would leave and I'd give him plenty of time before I took off because I'm going to make a lot of racket when I leave. And then I would go over and uh, across the Lake Pontchartrain land. And then I'd get in a car and go back over there and scrub the tire marks out where that I had landed. Because really? I wanted to do it over and over again. I didn't want the yeah. police sitting there waiting on me. So so you would be wheels down for a little bit? Yes, maybe 15 minutes till he got out of there. 15 minutes till he got out, then? Then I'd take off. And as soon as he got back on the freeway, I, I knew he'd be, be back on the freeway in five, 10 minutes. Okay. So as soon as he got back in the traffic, I'd be all right. And I'd take off and make a lot of racket. <laughs> <laughs> and I did that all the way across Texas. I just landed that Interstate 10 as they built it. I had a big old truck when I was doing marijuana. <clears throat> and it was because I... Antiques Unlimited down the side, and halfway down the truck, was it was packed with nice antiques. So you opened that back door, slid it up. The chairs and stuff would just try to fall out on you. We had bungee cords on them to hold them in. <laughs> and then we had a, a, a wall built across there. I did it, and, uh, and it was smell-proof. It was sealed right up to the top. And then underneath by the driveway, I had cut four boards out and made a, a plate on the floor. And then I had a... Uh, a rack over the top of it so the marijuana couldn't fall on it. And we'd get under there by that driveway and shove that stuff up in the truck. I could put three tons in the front, front part of that truck. Holy and haul cow. it all over the country. It didn't matter. If you, we never even got stopped. But if you did get stopped, they, they're not going to take all that, unload all that furniture, not unless they already know. They're not just going to do it just as a normal stop. When would the payment happen? They, when you they land... About, okay, on the cocaine? Well, yes. It'll be about... Marijuana and all was a week or two. The cocaine was usually about two weeks. So after I did the uh, the first 300 load, I went back, and I said, it'll hold 500. No, no, senior, your good luck is 300. So they only, only put 300 on my, me. And so I was making, it was an eight-hour trip in a turboprop aero commander. I was making $1.5 million for an eight-hour trip. Oh, man. And I said, when do you want me to come back? We waiting on you, senor. Just any time I wanted to land, there it was. Just, I could have gone every day. But they'd get up about $7 million they owed me, and I'd stop. I ain't going to go no more until you pay me. <laughs> $7 million? Yeah, that's all the credit I'd give them. So, okay, so how many, how many loads would you do in a month? Later on, I did about one a week. So about one a four. week? Uh-huh. So making so about, about $6 million. $6 million a month? Yeah. What are you, what are you doing with that money? Piling it up. Where do you put it? 
I buried it and <laughs> I bought farms with it and I bought corn. I like buying rare corns. I bought the the Brasher de Bloom. And uh, right now that thing's over, worth over $10 million, about the size of a quarter. Wow. It was made for George Washington by a guy named Brasher. He was, did, he was the architect for Washington, D.C. So those are valuable little coins. That was the best I did. And I, I bought land. I bought. Re, I got into real estate investment. I had 21 oil wells. I bought airplanes and houses and mansions and anything else. But I always had to put them in other people's names. And guess what? That money just doesn't come back to you. You give you give suitcases or suitcases to some good investor, and it's just like it's got wings on it flying away. <laughs> I never saw one come back. How much money, if if you don't mind me asking, at the height of your career, how much money, what were you worth? What was your net worth? Uh, I, I remember $60 million. $60 million? What year? 1982. I wonder what that's what the equivalent of $60 million today would be. It's probably, I don't know, probably at least two times, double that. So probably a hundred and, $150 million, something like that, $200 million, I don't know. Well... I mean, a lot of things triple with this new guy in office, so. <laughs> but, uh, but, but it don't buy anything. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. But, uh, so, but yeah, that would be interesting to know. $60 million. Did, did you trust anybody to manage it? I trusted everybody. You did? That was the mistake, huh? You can't. We, uh, when Mari and I first went out to California, we, we got a job. We, we didn't was living with my sister for a few months. And so we got a job managing a 40-unit apartment building. This guy, Jack Tripp, was the nicest man. And he said, now, Roger and Murray, I got something to tell you now when you got this job. Just remember that people are no damn good. And give them a chance and they'll prove it. We thought, how awful. <laughs> 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 but after a lifetime in this business, I, I kind of think, Jack, I believe you knew something. He may have been I didn't onto know, something, you know? huh? You give somebody a million dollars, and he's going to figure out every which way in the world not to ever give it back to you. Yeah. Particularly if you go to jail. Bye bye. <laughs> what was the? What was the? What was your most prized? Other than the coin, what was your most prized investment? Wow. We had we had a couple of different homes in uh, Santa Barbara. I bought a place up on Mission Ridge that was uh, sixteen thousand square feet counting the basement and all and it was something i mean it was so pretty until it was just like it was almost sickening it was so pretty and it had been uh owned by the catholic church after a while it made back in the uh, early 1900s 1900 to 1907 and that thing was something else but it had been run down it was really run down and i went in and uh the catholic church had had it and they had little cubicles in there for the nuns to live in little cells but they weren't even to the floor. They didn't even nail them down. And so I took those out and cleaned that floor and painted that place up and made it. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt had looked at it for the Western White House at one time. What? Yes. And so we lived there. And uh, I just went up to the place the other day to knock on the doors <laughs> to, see, <laughs> to see if they'd let me in. <laughs> and uh, I took some pictures of it. I'll show them to you. But uh, that, was a, that was a prized possession. I had to run off and leave that. And uh, I walked out with the, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but just on that one little story, I just, uh, having the floor redone, and we had to go get something, and I got, I had work clothes on, I was working right with the rest of them, and I went out with the, the floor cleaners and got in a blue van and drove out. And about that time, 50 agents stormed through the place, kicking windows and doors in, it was already open. <laughs> and my wife was in, in the bedroom with a with a, with a baby, and they kept her at gunpoint all day long as they tore that house apart. We had beautiful stuff that was over 100 years old in there. They just took axes to the uh, to cherry wood interior, just cut it up. Just And uh, she said, like, they just scrubbed a, be a bed across the floor and just made gouges. She said, oh, don't you? It ain't yours no more, lady. You know, all that sort yeah. of stuff. So it was just awful. It was a sacrilege what they did to that place. Damn. So that was that was probably the nicest property I ever had. And then I uh, took an option to own every foot of the land there, what's now the city called Moreno Valley, California. And, of course, I'd have been a billion, 
<laughs> trillionaire yeah. if I could have held on to that. Wow. But I had to run off and leave all that. Did you sell it or did it get No, I just left it. it and uh, uh, the man I had it in his name, he ran into the side of a mountain and got killed. And it was just like when that old hairy hand of fate turns against you, it turns all the way against you. So yeah. Ever which way you turn. Damn. <clears throat> well, back to transport cocaine. Okay, so uh, I uh, I got above the fog one night. I was coming out of Columbia with that uh, plane 300 miles an hour, and I got out there, <clears throat> and I couldn't get down. Like everywhere, I only had maybe an hour or so fuel left when I got back. And uh, there was fog from New York to Dallas. I mean, it was white. All the way up to Chicago, closed, closed, closed. Everything's closed. When the temperature and dew point come together, you will have visible moisture. So there ain't no way to get around it, and it was exactly the same. So it looked like it was about 500 feet thick and full moon on top of it, and I'm sitting up there thinking, I'm going to die. I can't get down. So my only thing was, and I, I'm not much of an instrument flying, I'm just more of a crop duster type out in the jungle flying. Anyhow, I had to go out, and the only choice I had to save my life was to go out and come down the glide slope to New Orleans International Airport and land on the airport plane at night while the airport is closed. Oh, shit. <laughs> I sat there on that runway all night long, got out, I bounced down. I could, when I got down, it was enough visible to see a little bit. So anyhow, I got it down. But to have that nervous to sit there all night, I sat there, it must have been about 12 hours. And the next morning, the sun came out, and I could see the sun through the fog, but you couldn't see 100 feet, 200 feet in front of you, if, if that. So anyway, I just I thought that security or anything might come around and check these runways out. And I'm sitting right in the middle. I was kind of off to one side. So I, uh, I couldn't stand it any longer. It looked like it was breaking up a little bit, and I took off and 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 uh, I went across to cro across uh, Lake Pontchartrain, just thirty miles away, and I uh, had a runway over there, St. Timothy Aviation, and I could see it through the broken fog, but it was still. I knew when I got in it, it was going to be blind, so I just got off the end of it. It wasn't that long of a runway, and I pulled the power and turned, pushed the nose down, and. When I got that thing stopped, I knew I was finished. I had enough money, and I says, all right. So uh, the fellow I gave the cocaine to in Miami, Lito, the nicest fellow, and uh, I just says, I'm it. Y'all pay me up, I'm through. Oh, no, Roger, no. Because they, they, they were making lip money by, when I give it to them, they was probably getting $1,000 a kilo or something from uh Escobar and them, so they, they had their whole uh, organization. It was just like they were through. I'll back up a little bit and just tell you that uh, how I got it from Louisiana to Miami, I had to deliver it to Miami. So I had two people going to uh, automobile auctions there in Florida, around Orlando and Tampa, and they was buying uh, three big LTD Fords or marquee Mercury's because they had big trunks. And they put the air shocks on them and they put these tires that wouldn't, couldn't go flat and uh, new hoses and fan belts. I said, I don't care if they look new, put new ones on there. We do not want this car to stop. So then you could only get 100 kilos in the trunk of those cars because it was so fluffy. And so I had drivers to drive it. And then the Colombians... I would give them the car. I'd sell it to them for $5,000. And they complained. I said, listen, man, you ain't going to get anybody else in the world that's going to get you cars with no, that can't be traced with the, all, all the paperwork on it. It's in great shape. So then they really liked it. I said, I don't want that car going to your stash house and coming back to me. I don't, I don't know who's looking at you. So Good call. I suppose we bought hundreds of cars. <laughs> So over the over the time that I worked with them, so anyhow they really liked the car deal. So that was something that. I, uh, so they says, don't you know anybody anyway? So uh, I had met Barry Seal, 
and I'll tell you how I met Barry. I was uh, looking for a place of my own about halfway between Colombia and the United States. And so I went to Honduras and I went to San Pedro Sula and took my wife and the children down there. And, and we went up into the mountains. There's a lake up there called Lake Azul. And it's really pretty, really, really wonderful place. And they have largemouth bass. And uh, the largest largemouth bass was caught in, in uh, Montgomery Lake, right close to my house, about five miles away. And they were some bigger than that washed up when they had an earthquake on that lake. And uh, I like to fish. So I thought, no, that's pretty. So we went up and did look at a, at a ranch, and it was just, it was just beautiful. So anyhow, my wife didn't want to live there, so we decided. We came on back, and our clothes was all uh, muddy and dirty from being up on that ranch for a few days. And we put them into cleaners, and we had a, a reservation to fly back to New Orleans. Uh, so we went to the cleaners to get the clothes, and they said, oh, they're not ready. We'll have them in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so our plane's like at 9 o'clock. So I tell my wife, you go to the airport and get on the plane because it would be easier for me to get out standby. All the planes are full than it will be for, for all four of us. So I went to the cleaners and got the clothes, and there was a big stack of them all in their plastic. And I got a taxi driver, and I said, go faster, go faster. And I gave him $100 to go all the way faster, and he just blew the horn faster. <laughs> It didn't go a bit <laughs> faster. And we got to the airport, and I jumped out of the taxi and went around the, the building, and here's the brand-new 727 taxiing out. And I waved to the with all the clothes on my back, and I waved to the, to the pilot, and he waves back. And then I see Mari's face in the cockpit. And so I see the front tire. He, he puts on the brake, and it goes down, and he's laughing. And he puts the air stair out for me to get on. And then I come running for it, and he takes off like it's a hitchhiker. <laughs> and he gets up there a few feet, and then he stops again and laughs. Anyhow, he puts it all the way down, and I get on the airplane with all those clothes on my back. Well, all the people just clapped real big for me when I got on. And I went on back about halfway back, and my daughter Miriam, she was about that's nine years old, eight or nine years old, and she was sitting in the middle, and I sat on the seat, and after I got those clothes taken away, and uh, there was a man sitting there by the window. Nice looking fellow, clear blue eyes. And I thought, oh, oh, wonder what he is down here. So uh, uh, the plane took off and the wheels came up with a thud and went on a little bit further and got up about 5,000 feet and they were just a little click, click. And Miriam said, what was that, Dad? I said, he just turned his autopilot on. The fellow reaches over and he says, you fly these things, huh? And I got a few hours, mister. My name Barry Seal. How you doing? <laughs> no kidding. So I got talking to him. He said he just got out of jail that morning. I said, uh-huh, I bet you did. <laughs> Trying to get me to talk. I ain't saying nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so we went on and we got to be big buddies. He said he just got out of jail that, that morning. What was your initial impression? Did you think he was a... I thought for sure he was, he was some kind of uh, government agent person. Yeah. He just looked like... Well, he, he, he was princely. He, he looked... Well, it was. He wound up being one kind of. Well, right? I know he wasn't. He probably was before that too. But he just had. He just had a princely look. He just. He he, he had a demanding uh, presence. Nice looking fellow, and uh, I didn't believe him a bit. <laughs> but I talked. We talked flying and whatever. And he said he just gotten out of prison this morning. That morning he got caught with a hundred kilos of cocaine in Honduras, and it, they'd taken his airplane and. It, uh, he That's just volunteered all that, right? Well, we just talked. I just, yeah, I reckon he did. On a so flight? We just on the flight over. A light conversation on the way home? To a couple <laughs> hours. We had a nice chat over across Miriam. So when he got out, I, I didn't, I, I certainly didn't believe him. I thought he was just fishing for yeah. information from me. Well, now, there was 15 people or more, maybe 20, meeting him when he got out. There was old mother there, and there was a pretty wife and little children hanging on him and crying. Grabbing his by the leg, daddy, daddy, and this and that. And I, man, he, he had tears in his eyes, and it's like, that, that sucker's telling the truth. <laughs> so I uh, wrote my name on a little piece of paper, and I said, Barry, I may have some work for you. And uh, come out and see me in Santa Barbara. So I went out to Santa Barbara, and he called, and he came out. And so uh, I says, uh, 
told him what I had. I said, I might have some work flying cocaine. Yes, sir. Would he be interested in it? I said, well, let me see if you can fly or not. <laughs> so I took him out, and I had a 690 Aero Commander B, rather new. One three Tango Victors, 13 TV. I bought it from Channel 13 in Los Angeles. And uh, Barry took off with that thing, and I mean, he was an ace. I'm just, I, I can get him from one place to another, but I'm no ace. I mean, he was like an aerobatic Blue Angel type flyer. Oh, wow. Uh, 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 so uh, he just wrung that thing out, and I told him, that's enough. He was upside down, backwards, sideways. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, that's, a, that's enough. He yeah, about me. I mean, sick. So anyhow, he said, let me show you something. So he cut, kept, cut both engines over the end of the runway, and he came in, and they called a flying leaf. Bob Hoover did them at shows and come in just, Irk. so I knew he could fly anything he wanted to. So I gave him a job, and he took off with my plane. He said he had it, uh, that he had somebody in Mena, Arkansas, that could tank it. See, so I came after a a week or something, he called me and said, come to Baton Rouge. So I flew down there and stayed in his house in Baton Rouge and went out to the hangar. And that plane was professionally tanked. And uh, all the way from the, the uh, cabin back uh, back into the where the luggage. And that thing would, I guess, would have probably make, went from Bolivia to Canada if we wanted to. Wow. So I, I hired him to fly, and, and I, I gave him $1,000 a kilo. So then he put now, so then I said, hey, I got, I got a guy, but let's put 500 kilos on there. So now then that's two and a half million dollars a load that we're getting, but I paid Barry the million dollars a load. So I was still making the same amount mm -hmm. that I was before. But I said, no, I got this place in, uh, in Louisiana and I got the place on there. He said, no, no, I man, I, he said, I'm not going to land anywhere except in Mena, Arkansas. Before we go into that. I just want to rewind. Yes. You meet this guy in San Pedro Sula, yes. Honduras. You land, and what, a couple weeks later, he's in Santa Barbara. You're verifying that he can fly. He's doing somersaults, flying upside down, doing all the tricks. Did you ask him, hey, what, where'd you learn how to do this shit? No. You didn't? I don't think. No, I know I didn't. He you could do it, so I didn't care where he learned. You didn't care? No, he could do it. I, okay. I, I can do most all that stuff, but I ain't no aerobatic pilot like that. So, all right. You know, so it was just it just normal. But he was exceptional. He, uh, he was as good as any Blue Angel pilot out there. Did you ask if he was military or he flew for anybody before? No, he told me that he had been a, a 747 captain with Transworld Airlines and that he had gotten in trouble over a, a load to, a, I believe, a... DC-6 or DC-7 taking explosives to the uh, Cuban Contras, and he lost his job over that. So uh, he was a sport. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so you're already my friend now with what you've done. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so anyhow, uh, where were we? I went, went to his house and uh, stayed He's with him. He's not going to land anywhere but Arkansas. That's right, because he said it's paid off all the way to the top. Which can cost you fifty thousand dollars every time my wheels land. Uh, what are you talking about? He says, I can't get caught in Mena, Arkansas. And later on, whenever I would, uh, so the, the he was working with uh, he had CIA connections. I don't know where he'd flown with, and also Bill Clinton was the strong governor. man or the governor there. So. I'm not saying nothing more about that. I hear that they call it Arkansas up there instead of home side. <laughs> <laughs> and plus, I don't know anything. I never met those gentlemen. I didn't fool with it. That was Barry's end of the story. But anybody wants to look, just read about what happened in Mena, Arkansas. And that movie that they made that they called America Made was written as Mena. And when Hillary was running for president, the Democratic Party stopped it. And even the director quit. And they changed part of the script and they changed the name to America Made. The whole thing's about Mena, Arkansas and Bill Clinton and a couple of boys that got killed on a railroad track and put up there by the sheriff to get chopped up. And they, they some, some stories there. They got Clinton. They claim it is him. I'm glad I didn't meet him. 
looked like he was uh, on, on a plane somewhere that he shouldn't have been here recently, too. <laughs> yep. He's got a couple paintings down there, too, from what yeah. I hear. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> his brother, his brother Roger, got caught with some cocaine, and he pardoned him, but he didn't pardon me. And uh, Roger, Roger Clinton says that Bill's nose was like a vacuum cleaner in that cocaine pile. <laughs> But he didn't inhale. That's just a good thing. That's, yeah, uh, hey. You know. Our presidents are just such fine people sometimes. They, they are some very trustworthy individuals, oh, aren't they? They'll put you in prison. He went in and he raised the, uh, the penalty for crack cocaine 100 times. It's, they just think just political prostitutes is all they are. Yeah. It's, that's the word for them. I'm on, I like that. I'm going to use that. <laughs> so Barry was tied in with the Clintons the CIA, and he had free reign to land wherever he wants, he's not going to get caught in Arkansas. Absolutely. So I, the, it was a little far to go up to Mena, so I talked to uh, Escobar, and they said, well, that's no problem. So I landed there myself to do a, a load, and they put a fellow named Benjamin Ben in the plane with me, and we went up to a, a, a landing strip there in, in Nicaragua. And I met the generals and all that. And they said, you can land right here. Just come in. Don't say a thing on the radio. Just land anytime you want to. And uh, we'll refuel you. And you get food, whatever you want. We'll wash your windshield. And you'll be on your way. So, uh, How do you make these connections? I didn't make them. Ocho and Escobar. They're just giving them. you direction. Hey, yeah, you right. need to go to this spot. And so that, that man flew with me up there to introduce me. And he went back and got killed in a, in a helicopter crash. Real nice fellow down in Columbia. A lot of people died in this business. I'm telling you, I'm one of the only people I know still alive. So I'm blessed. A lot, of, a lot of accidents happen, huh? They, and some of them really were accidents. Yeah. A lot of them got killed violent and... Uh, Bad people in that business, and I, I told my friend, I had a friend, later on I, I hired a fellow in California, and I'll just say his name, Jerry. He's still alive, same age I am, and uh, he flew, and uh, so he was flying about once a week, and then Barry was flying once a week, and the Colombians would tell them that your California connections has got more than you are, so there was a little bit of competition with each other. So I had two airlines going, and both of them, I bought these Panther conversions. They was called Panthers. They was, oh, they was Wonderful to small tw twin engine planes, but you could put 500 kilos in there and two pilots and way overloaded, and they'd, they'd fly from Columbia to Arkansas. So uh, they were both going. But anyhow, how'd was, you find out about those those conversions? I think uh, Barry come up with that. Barry I think did. They had used him over in Southeast Asia. It was a CIA uh, a conversion of a of some kind of a Piper plane. It was a CIA conversion and right. he had they access? Had, they had made it, and that's what they was flying over in, uh, out of Burma and Vietnam behind the lines over there. They're real quiet. They put big, heavy, uh, wide blade uh, propellers on them and put Q-tips, and you couldn't hear the propeller noise. No kidding. And so uh, uh, they were, they, they were, so I, I bought, I think, seven of them, $400,000 a piece. So were these, uh, were they open market? Yeah, you could buy them. They still, you, they're out there now. So what do they say? What do you, I mean, they, who do they you look buy like, them they from? Look like, they look like any little executive airplane. They don't look like there was a big twin beaches and DC-3s. <clears throat> they look, they fit right in. Just the only thing you can tell is that large prop and with the Q-tip on it, nobody would notice that. Is Somebody knows. So the people you're buying it from, are they, do they know what you're doing? I don't think anybody cared. It was all sack full of money and they, want, they don't want to report it either. Okay. So it was buying airplanes was that, and you could just put them in anybody's name. There was nothing to it back then. Okay. Now they've closed that loop, but uh, back then it was just easy to get an airplane. So I had Jerry flying and Barry flying. And, I mean, I was putting at least eight, eight car loads a, a week into the, um, to the Columbians there in, in Miami. Uh, and the money stacked up, so I didn't hardly know what to do with it. So it was, uh, that was. How close did you get with Barry? We were buddies. Yes, sir. Best we friends? Were friends. Yes, sir. I, uh, we're such good friends. We'd done staying at the Omni Hotel, Mari and I, and my, our little boy, Rhett, was a baby. And uh, uh, so Barry, we, we went out to dinner and come back, and there was no rooms. I said, Barry, come up and stay in our room. We had big two queen-size beds up there. And, 
So Barry come in there and stripped down to his polka dot under shorts and his T-shirt. <laughs> he put the baby up on his belly and gave him the bottle. Ain't that good, Rhett? Yum, 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 yum. <laughs> so we could spend the same night in the same room with each other. So that's what kind of friends we were. So you built a lot of trust. A hundred percent. No way I didn't trust that man in my life. How long was your guys' relationship? About two years. So, um, yeah, he, Barry did exactly what he said he would do. I mean, just right on. But he was a stickler for his money. He wouldn't fly again until he got paid. So, and he would belly ache in a, in a kind of joking way, but he, he wanted his money. I don't blame him. And he, no way, he wouldn't do another load till he got paid. So uh, I owed him a million dollars, so I got it in a nice big box. <clears throat> and I got, uh, went to... Uh, there's a store I saw these stay free mini pads, played his feminine napkin, <laughs> and I put them inside of it. <laughs> and, and put a big, big pink bow on it <laughs> and tied it up for him. He opened that up. He thought it was so funny. He put, it, he put those things on his mantelpiece. They stayed up there as long as he lived. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I love Barry. He was, he was a friend of mine. I don't have many friends in life that was real good friends, but Barry was a good friend of mine. So, uh, I, uh, Were you guys ever flying together? No. Always separate? Just separate. I, I don't, I don't, yeah, I flew it a few times. We're just going somewhere, but nothing to do. Not working? No working, no. Is there uh, a reason for that, or just too busy? I, I or? didn't need anybody to fly with me. If I, anybody ever get fly with me gets scared, and it's, con, it's contagious. <laughs> gotcha. I, I'm not scared by myself. I've had some people really scare me on airplanes for crying, we're going to die. It's been a tickle up in Alaska up in an ice storm I got into one time. <laughs> so I, I own something like that. No, I don't need anybody at all. Okay. Uh, uh, well, yeah. How does, it, how does it develop with Barry? He just developed into a friendship, and he'd get his money and go about his business and I, I moved down to Key Biscayne, Florida, where I was closer to the uh, to the people, and um, I was the only one to meet those people. And the guy was Lito, was his name, and I would stay at some Cuban shop and sandwich shop in line, and we'd meet, and I'd tell him where to meet me, and so I'd point out the cars where they where they were parked, and so that was that was how we did it. There was no no talking, no phone calls, nothing, just straight out. Here's the keys. And, uh, yeah, so anyway, I was, I'll was re regress here a little bit in that. Whenever uh, uh, Barry wanted the Panthers, then I had that Aero Commander that I thought it might be kind of hot, so I had parked it at, uh, in a place in Toucan Airport down in Jamaica. So I don't know why I wanted to sell that thing for half a million dollars, <laughs> making more than that a day almost. But I took a... I wanted to get rid of it, something to do. So I flew down with a, uh, a broker from San Antonio, Texas. And uh, so we went out and washed the airplane and took the tanks out and put the seats back in it. And uh, we took off. And just the time we got to the end of the runway before that airplane went to turn in a circle, it scared the living daylights out of me. What in the world? I thought that plane had got bent. A truck's hit this thing. <laughs> we ain't going to be able to land it. We're spiraling up, going up. That thing's got a lot of power. Spiraling up in circles. Well, anyway, he's up here fooling with the uh, trim tab, and somebody had sat in that airplane and just fooled the trim tab for the trim. And it, one of them little things that's just benign on your checklist, and neither one of us noticed it. And it had trimmed over, and it's got that plane flying in circles. Got that thing straightened out when my knees was knocking. <laughs> so we landed and uh, went back to the Pegasus Hotel after our brush with death. <laughs> and uh, we had ordered drinks out on the patio. There was a, a table there over away, and there was a grandma, and there was mama and dad, and two pretty girls in kind of like evening party dresses. Pretty girls. And so they was having to hard time they 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 was speaking Spanish and they couldn't make the black waiter from Jamaica understand what they wanted. So I went over to the table and I said, I speak a little Spanish, could I help you? Oh please. And so I told the waiter what they wanted. And then they asked us, come, come sit with us. So we we moved over and set this table on the balcony with them. And they told me that uh 
they was uh, there. That Grandma had come from the United States and brought presents because it was a twin's 17th birthday. And that's the reason they had the party dresses on out on the balcony of that hotel. And they said that their whole family had gone to Miami or gone to Florida on the Muriel boat lift when Carter said that the Cubans could could come and he wanted to. And then Castro did a dirty. He, he emptied the insane asylums and all the prisons in Cuba and put them on the boats. But they just went with everybody else and every, all their family went. But Papa was a professor and he was holding back. Let's see what happens on this. And then Carter saw what happened and they closed that, that terrible mistake they made. So this family had gone to Jamaica hoping to get to uh, to the United States, but they were stuck there. And Papa was working in a machine shop for $50 a month. And Grandma had come down with gifts. <clears throat> they couldn't, wasn't even making enough to live. So I said, I asked the uh, fellow that was going to buy the airplane, I said, would you in for a little, a, little, a little adventure? And he said, yeah. So I said, I'll take you to 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 United States tomorrow. How? What? What? I said, don't worry about it. I can get you there. Well, they didn't believe me. So anyway, they called all night and they had the boss call and somebody else called up to my room. And uh, I said, go to Air Jamaica tomorrow morning and each one of you just bring one bag, one suitcase. Don't don't bring any more than one. And uh, so when I cranked up and filed my flight plan, I filed it to Merida, Mexico because I didn't know. I certainly had to stop somewhere. So I... Uh, I went into Air Jamaica, said, I need some hydraulic fluid, and I went in, and they jumped in, but they had one little travel case. They had misunderstood me. Oh. So they got in the airplane and shut the windows, and I reversed it and backed out. I'm going down the taxiway, and somebody told that these people had gotten the plane. And uh, the, the Kingston Tower says, 1-3 Tango Victor, hold your position. Rather hard. And I, uh-oh. And I nodded to the co-pilot, and I says, I said, Kingston Tower, your transmission is broken and unreadable. Good day. From down the taxiway, I went and took off. Nice. I got up about 30,000 feet, <clears throat> and the landing gear came down, and the wheel and the flaps came into the, I was out of hydraulic fluid. The line had been sitting, that plane had been sitting there maybe a year, and it just got loose. So, wow. I had to land straight ahead. And I landed at uh, where I took all the money. Anyway, we can't think of it right now. What's the island right between Mexico, uh, the British island, where all the people go for the money? I just can't think. Anyway, the I Virgin landed Virgin Islands? There. Pardon? What, what did you say? The Virgin Islands? No. I can't think of it. I know his name as I know my own. Uh, where was it that money placed it? Uh, Cayman. Grand Cayman. Grand Cayman Island. I landed straight ahead at Grand Cayman. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> I've, been, I've, been in there, I've been in there 40 times. I can't think of it. Yes. And uh, anyway, I told them, get out get out, and go around behind and, and, and get, get some coffee and hamburgers. So they went around, and here come the, the British police with their guns and their little pistol, which is unusual, and they searched the airplane, and my contraband's at the table. So anyway, we get the hydraulic fluid uh, fixed and I get back in and we file a flight plan to Merida. Now then, I can't go into Merida. I don't know what they're going to do with the Cuban people with Cuban passports. So we stop at uh, Chicken Itza and uh, we get out and we just walk into a, a, a wall of rain halfway down the runway and uh, the other pilot from San Antonio takes off and we leave, I'm leave there with mom and dad and the two girls. So we walk out, we get soaked, and we walk back about a mile to the highway. It's a small highway coming across Mexico there, and we wave and wave all afternoon, and I was so close. <laughs> the cars wave back, and I pull out a $100 bill, and I wave it, <laughs> and they wave back. And late in the afternoon, an old school bus made in Fort Valley, Georgia, stops, and they got pigs and chickens, and we all <laughs> sitting there steaming. And, <laughs> and, that, and we get to Merida that night about Mexico, and, and they've, that pilot has stayed up, and they got a cook for us, and somebody washed and iron our clothes, and they kept, I remember we had pepper steaks. And we went to bed the next morning. We went out, and uh, he filed a flight plan in New Orleans, and we had the, the big truck come between the flight planning office and the airplane, and we slipped in. So he filed it for one. 
So we fly across the Gulf of Mexico, and we land in a cane field there in southern Louisiana, and we jump out real quick, and the pilot takes off and goes on in and clears customs in New Orleans so he won't get in trouble. Well, we look down, and it looked like it's a mile both ways a canal with scum on it. And I thought, well, it might be about knee deep. Let's don't walk all the way around. There was a junkyard across the, across the way there. And so we get down in that water, and pretty soon it's nearly up to them girl's chin. It's got <laughs> green scum all over them. <laughs> that little suitcase up over the head. <laughs> Wading across the water. Wading the way across this thing. It was way deeper than it looked like. Oh, anyhow, that's twice we've been soaked wet and coming. So I'm bringing my charge on. So we come out to the uh, junkyard on the other side, and there's a man uh, with a old Buick with the fender off, front fender off, and it's got rust oil all over the plane train. And I said, Mister, I give you a hundred dollars to take me to Bourbon Street in New Orleans. You got a deal. And he opens the door and. One minute later, we're doing 80 miles an hour through the cane fields of Louisiana with, with these girls. Anyhow, we come down there, and we needed some clothes, and uh, we went shopping, went stayed in the Queen Anne Hotel, one of my favorites there in New Orleans, and uh, took them shopping, and they were so meager, and they'd just bring me back the little change. No, no, just go, just go shopping. So uh, that night, they called everybody in Miami that we're going to come down on a on a Delta the next day, and so uh, we we got in there and we landed it in, in Miami the next next afternoon, and there were so many Cuban people sitting there. I mean, with cameras flashing, and we got off, and they they had so many Chevis Regals till I couldn't tote them. The girls was covered in flowers, and they took me to Opal Lock out there, and they had a street barricaded off, and they was barbecuing hogs and goats out there. What a party. They would have put me on my shoulders and, and <laughs> taken me. So anyway, I had some money in my pocket, and I took it took it in the front room, and they gave gave it to Mom and Dad, and they just stood there and cried. So uh, <clears throat> some years later, I, uh, I jumped ahead in 40 years, and I uh, I went to prison after pretty close after that, I'll tell you, and I lost contact with them. And so somebody read my book here a few months ago, and or they did, and... I was in Miami, and I went to see them, and what a joyous reunion. They hugged my neck. They lived in a gated community. Their children with PhDs and blood spatter stuff for the, for the city of uh, whatever that business is. And uh, we just had a, a, a wonderful fiesta there with them here. And, uh, this is the video you just showed I, me I on the break. I showed you that video. That's it's, amazing. Yes. So anyway, they said, you have a house here as long as you live. So that was that was twenty years, forty years ago. Forty years, forty you years had to ago, see almost that. exactly to the day. Man, so that was it. Well, let's take a little break. Let's take a break. Promise to. Uh solemnly swear that the testimony Amid fresh reports of reckless behavior by Blackwater in Iraq, Blackwater's CEO, Eric Prince, made no apologies to a congressional investigating committee. I disagree with the assertion that they acted like cowboys. And it says three senators, Joe Biden, Chuck Cagle, and John Kerry, the future vice president, secretary of defense, and secretary of state, respectively, posed while waiting for Blackwater rescue. Their U.S. Army helicopter got lost in a blinding snowstorm and set down in Taliban territory on the side of a mountain. Do not ever discount the Iranian influence on the Biden-Obama administration then as there is now. He said, Mr. President, give us the authorities and a billion dollars, and in three weeks the flies will be walking in the eyeballs of our enemies. Prince said his employees act with restraint and professionalism. He boasted that none of the U.S. diplomats he has paid to protect have been killed or wounded. It, it was a great honor that they turned to us because it was a very important mission, right? Because the CIA is the ones who made that victory possible for the United States. We've had a better response from Blackwater than we have from the State Department. We fought back on all fronts. The one place that they had us over a barrel was in the State Department. 
Witnesses say the two SUVs were ambushed as they drove through town. Another convoy of guys that got ambushed and shot up on the Baghdad Highway. The contractors worked for Blackwater Security, a company that protects coalition personnel. Knowing that the clowns at the State Department and the Obama administration did everything they could to block a program like that, because it's not something they directly controlled, it is such a mess. It is such a fetid swamp. Trump was right to call it a swamp. It is. All right, Roger, before we get into dropping the money in the Grand Caymans, I want to, we are, we're always going to Louisiana. Yeah. We're always dropping loads in Louisiana. I'm just curious, why is it always Louisiana? Okay. <clears throat> you know, I told you that I, uh, I, I figured out how to get to marijuana into the United States by going way out 300 miles off the coast of San Diego and coming around behind the Santa Barbara Islands. Well, I went down to <coughs> New Orleans, and, and I would, <coughs> excuse me, I uh, cleaned the Russian grain ships. And I'd go fishing out there, and I saw all those helicopters coming in from those oil wells. There's hundreds of oil wells off the coast of Louisiana. They go out for 100 miles or so. That Mississippi River flooded that out, and I believe it's 6,000 feet deep of muck under that gulf there. That's where all those shrimp and they go out shrimping, and, and those oil wells are there, and they just punch it right through that muck, nothing, and then right down into the, the, the oil and the gas. And every afternoon, there's, there's a dozen or 20 helicopters going back and forth changing crews. And they just like fireflies everywhere out there about dark coming in. And I said, now that's all right. You get in amongst them, you won't be seen. So when I started flying, <coughs> out, coming out, from the other way and in, in landing out of Columbia, or I, I, would, I said, hey, I'm not going back across that, that border into Texas or California, because it's further. So I'm going straight into Louisiana because it's exactly north. Just put your compass north and that's, <laughs> it's north. And uh, so I would come over Merida, Mexico. I'd stay out, stay out in the Caribbean, off the land off of uh, Nicaragua particularly and off of Cuba. I'd fly up with the, um, in the channel between Mexico and Cuba and uh, cut across part of Merit, uh, Yucatan. And then when I got about 200, 300 miles out from the United States coast, the ADIZ zone, where they do have defense, I'd put that baby on the ground, on the water, and uh, slow it down and come in with a way just after dark. And I'd come in slow with those helicopters and I know they couldn't see me. <clears throat> and, and those oil wells, some of them are several hundred feet high. And uh, I'd come in, some of them they'd be higher than I was. Wow. And weave in and come on out there and land. So I knew I wasn't on anybody's radar. They, I, I guess they could have. Just too much bugged. going on. But they, they, they would bug my airplane sometime, but I'd always find the bugs. And they was mad, that, that was in the court records. Those things cost $17,000 a piece, and I had a collection of them. <laughs> they had to put them, they couldn't behind, put them behind metal, and there's only a few places on the airplane that's got not metal, like glass or rubber, and that's where they'd put them. And you could see right right where they'd taken the screws out, put it back in, tried to cover it up. I'll be damned. So that's why I went to Louisiana. Makes a hell of a lot of sense. Yeah. <clears throat> so Grand Cayman. Grand Cayman Island. Money's piling up. I mean, money's piling up by the millions. And uh, where are you putting all this? I'm telling you, just I, I buried it in the ground a lot of times, just buried in the sand and paint cans without without hoops on it. And uh, so at this particular time, I got up, I had about fifteen million dollars, and uh, I uh, it was too too big for me to carry. So I, I hired a, I believe it was a Falcon jet out of San Antonio. And I went out to California and picked up some and come back to uh, San Antonio and got some more. And then, and then we went to, I had to lay on top of the money. Uh, I'll tell you that uh, a, a, a bill, a United States bill from one or a hundred dollars, they, they weigh one gram. So uh, 
you got a thousand bills is one kilogram. So, uh, so anyhow, a um, a million dollars in hundred dollar bills is 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 ten kilograms. So that's that's a hundred thousand. That's that's only twenty two point two pounds. But if you put them in hundred in one dollar bills, it's it's one ton, two thousand two hundred pounds. <laughs> I think it's funny that you know this. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, you weigh your money. You don't have to count it. You just weigh it. And you, you, you just about dead on if you, you just clip through it and see if it's old 20s or 50 and put it on the scale. It's right there, what you got. Okay. And it's right. It's just about as right as you can count it. Okay. So uh, got where you didn't even have to. It. Those people, their, their money was correct anyway, right to it. So uh, anyhow, I'd weigh the money. So I, uh, I had a, I must have had a lot of 20s. Anyhow, we packed that plane so full with the pilots had to get in first and then finished packing it up. And then I crawled and laid up on top of the money. And we went to Grand Cayman Island. And uh, the they, uh, van would back up, unload the, the money in it, and then the pilots could get out. <laughs> and we'd go to the bank, and, uh, and, and they'd pretend to count it. And there's about 20 people behind it, 20 men and women, all in the starts, iron shirts and ties. <laughs> and if I'd bat my eye, I'd, Twenty hundred dollar bills that hit the gas, <laughs> the ground on the other side. You know, they stole. I, I mean, most every load they steal at least forty thousand dollars out of it. There was nothing I could do. It's, yeah. Uh, later on, they stole it all. <laughs> Banker just took it and went out of business. Now he's over in Bakersfield, California. Counting and says the Reverend Stephen McTaggart. He got a house over there with a moat around it, made made look like the English style, feeding the deer and the turkeys on my money. Wow. I went over to see him, and they said, we don't know you. We don't want to talk to you. He would have put me back in prison in a flash if I would have said something. Damn. I wonder so, how many people that happened to. I don't know. Most people would have done something to him. But that's, I that's why I'm asking. Yeah. You know? Must, just knew I would, he knew I wasn't a killer, so he just did it. Yeah. Uh, how long so, was it there for before it all went Went away. Uh, do it about whenever. three years, and I was making fourteen percent interest. So, I bought bought gold coins, cougar rands by the ton. I reckon. Damn. <laughs> so, so, with, with that, just <coughs> that was uh, that was how I got the money down to Grand Cayman Island. How did your relationship with Ochoa and Escobar develop through the years? Uh, my uh, Ocho invited my family, myself, and we went to his 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 ranch. It was just north of Barranquilla. That thing was a paradise. It looked like Africa, and he had all the out. Uh, you know, this. What I was most impressed with was a big aviary with the, all the birds in it. He had birds from all over the world in there. I like birds, and then we went out there and there were the giraffes and the zebras and all this stuff. And then he had. Uh, Little, little ultra lights on floats. I flew that around. He had boat to take you water skiing, and it was just fun. We spent the weekend with him. He had big old his great old big four hundred pound father and his mother and his brothers and sisters. His brother put on a bullfight, and a real bullfight too. I mean, there's a guy could like yeah. Fabio. So uh, that guy got with him and uh, Escobar. <clears throat> I never had any uh, real social meeting like that with the family. Uh, I remember we got in his plane and we flew to, uh, I, he must have had a lot of farm, but he had bought some place to come across it. And uh, it was just a regular place and house. We had some coffee there. And he asked me, uh, had, uh, you ride motorcycle? Well, yeah, I ride motorcycle. So they had these dirt bikes out there. <laughs> and I think, and so I boom, boom, boom. There's four or five of them ready to go and I just took over Yum! and there's a little ditch out there about knee deep and about that wide and my front field fell in there and I went skidding across that grass <laughs> <laughs> they knew I was going to do it it was like a trap <laughs> hey, it was a setup. it was a setup. <laughs> of course it was <laughs> so we rode around the motorcycles a while and then we got on horses and he wanted to know if uh, he had a machine gun pistol. You ought to use this. Yeah. Never seen one before. <laughs> 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 it 
<laughs> so we rounded up some cows and bunks of stumps and stuff and pretended like we cowboys and uh, went on back and uh, and flew on back to Med- Medellin. And so that was one time with him. And um, When you're around these guys, what's their entourage look like? Is it is it you and them alone? Is no, it 50 uh, guards around them? Uh, Ochoa had one pistol arrow. Kind of okay. stout fella. I bet he was a crack shot, though. And uh, that was the only one when he was driving, whatever. I, I went with him sometime, to, and I went to a funeral with him. And uh, uh, But Escobar had several bodyguards. Did he? They, yeah, they, he was, wherever we went with him, there was about three or four fellas there that was, you know, was well-armed. So, but uh, you didn't see it. You just, was just like a bunch of... You just knew they were around. Well, they were there, for sure. They was there, and they were there to protect him because he... I suppose he'd killed a bunch of people. He's a murderer. Yeah. And uh, so I, I, uh, I only mess, met him, I, I guess, four times. But I went down one time and saw him, and I said, listen, man, that runway is just too short in the jungle. We, we're having trouble getting off there. Uh, next time the boys went down there, they said it looked like L.A. International. <laughs> they cleaned the jungle down. <laughs> they had bulldozers down there in all clay, and it was smooth, 5,000 feet. So... He got he got it done if you ask him to do something. Okay, because it was it was a lot. I don't know, that was like fifteen million dollars worth of coke there coming out twice a week. Yeah, so they was they was interested in keeping me happy. I mean, it's kind of a mystery on who was in charge of the Medellin cartel. Was they, it they, they, they was no they was no leader. They was I suppose that uh, only ones that I ever knew was Pablo and Jorge. Okay, and uh, Jorge was the one that was my handler, let's say. And I know, I mean, because they was right there next door, and I, I knew the, um, the cocaine come and there would be, a, I believe, 25 kilos in a duffel bag, and the duffel bag would have a lock on it. And they would be um, what the people used to brand their steers, their, their animals with. They would look like brands on those duffel bags. Okay. Three rattlesnakes or three X's or whatever that they had. And I kind of learned, so I, I know that Ocho was shipping a lot more than than, es- than Escobar was. Was he? Yes. Uh huh. They, they, there was three of them. There was three brothers and the old man, and and uh, I don't know, but he, certainly they were, for my opinion, they were a lot bigger. But each one of them was individual. And I told you about how it was an insurance company with the ten thousand dollars guaranteed it. Now, yes. So that was why they had so much of it. Did they just whoever they wanted to coming out of the jungle? So I'm just I'm curious about the structure of the Medellin cartel. Is it is the Medellin cartel like an umbrella company, and then you have Jorge Ochoa and Pablo Escobar as subsidiary companies? They're no, they were nothing kind of like partners. That. It was just individual people, just like you and I and Tim over there, and we come and says, "All right, we got enough money. We big enough. That's just." Let's make this, if you, we got this organization, they call it a cartel. We, we got an, a loose agreement that we will, you, the people of Colombia, you give us your cocaine and we will ship it for you for $10,000 a kilo. Now they become just a shipping agent. Now they paid me $5,000 to carry it. So they made $5,000 just receiving it from the little people, 10 kilos, 100 kilos, putting it in my airplane, and then their people in Miami, they had a couple of, well, a lot of safe houses. and No kidding. And so they, this is, so essentially, at this time, the Medellin cartel is essentially just a illegal logistics company. A shipping, a shipping outfit. They just, just five guys got together and said, listen, we got enough money. Let's stop this killing. 10,000 people a year are killed right here in Medellin mm-hmm. over this cocaine. Let's stop that. We have no, no reason for anybody killing anybody else ever again. So we, they did that to stop the violence. To stop the violence. And plus, they got and make a shit ton billion of dollars out of it. Yeah. Listen, I we're mean, making $5,000 every time you, you bring us one. And all we got to do is put it in Roger's airplane, and he gives it to my man Lito in Miami. Yeah. Lito gives it to whoever they tell him to give it to. And that's it. Well, I mean, then it developed into more than that because they started killing everybody. Well, Ocho, I don't believe, ever got into it. I think they might have had Bear Seal killed. But other than that, Escobar was a killer. 
Mm-hmm. Nobody else, the rest of the fellows didn't. The, they had, uh, they, okay, the best I understand it was that there were three organizations in Columbia that was in the cocaine business. Mm-hmm. The military was one. They weren't as big. And then they had the FARC guerrillas that owned a third, or maybe almost half of the country, particularly all the Amazon area. And they were the growers. And plus, the people from Bolivia and, and uh, Peru were shipping their base up because they could get the uh, ether up there to, to manufacture it. So they, the FARC was big time in it. Mm-hmm. And that's where they got their money to try to take over the government. And they, they were communist. So, uh, but then you had the, I'll call them the white Colombians, the landowners that owned the ranches up in the highlands all, all throughout Colombia. Well, they were dead against the FARC because FARC was wanting to take their land. Yeah. So they was, they was at war to some scale with the FARCs. And now the military definitely is wanting the FARCs out of the way because they, they're going to take over the country and get rid of the military. Now, the military was in the cocaine business, too. That's for sure. You can't say they weren't. They was, I don't know how big they were, but they was, they were shipping it. So, but the, uh, the, the, the white Colombians landowners was, was big, too. So there was kind of a three-way war going on there. Okay. And, uh, and where did the cartels fall into this? Well, they were the, the white landowners. They were the white landowners. Yes. Of that so group. what about the what about the Cali cartel versus the Medellin cartel? Okay, now the Cal, the after the Cali cartel, uh, I mean the Medellin cartel were, were got in trouble. Then Cali sprung up, and I uh, I spent four days in the house with uh, Miguel. I can't say it. Aurelio, the one that was the uh, the the big. Um, they own drug stores down there. Okay. And uh, I'm not familiar. No, anyhow, I don't. I'm not either. But I never did any business. But I went went to Canada to unload a load for 20 tons for them. To Cali or to for the Cali cartel later on. Okay. And uh, I, that uh, I was up in Canada and, and uh, read it 2000 and uh, the the millennium. And so I was waiting on the boat to come. I had a big boat to go out and meet it and two big dump trucks to put it in and all that. And they was gonna pay twenty I was gonna make forty million dollars for one night's work. So forty million dollars. Pay me two thousand dollars a kilo to unload this ship. It was a big boat coming out of Lima, a big uh, container ship, and one of the containers was going to be on the back and they had a big rope and every six feet or so was a hook with a, with twenty kilos of marijuana of, of cocaine to it all in waterproof bags, and it was going to, it would be string out a mile. And then I, I had a salmon uh, salmon boat with a reel on it to reel that in and put it into the fish hole. Oh, wow. So anyway, I got all that, and I, and I like an idiot, they wanted to give me some money. I said, no, man, I'll, I'll take care of that. <laughs> well, I called my friend down there, Mario, where's the boat? We ready, you know, we're waiting. He said, Leila Leticia, read the newspaper. So I got went and got a a newspaper. <laughs> 700 arrested worldwide. And there's the people I'm working for, number one, <laughs> two, three, four, and five. <laughs> oh, man. I got rid of that stuff I had. I sold it at a fire sale the same morning. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went and bought We're it. having a liquidation sale over here. I went and bought me a car. <laughs> <laughs> and we headed. I didn't want to come across the border or nothing. We went east all the way to Montreal before I got stopped. <laughs> Holy shit. That's how close I came to it. Wow. Damn. We had stitches in that thing from all the way back. That was a Cali cartel. And that's, that was my only uh, dealings with them. Okay. Did you go down to Cali at all? Oh, I stayed in Cali for months. I just stayed down there, and I, I enjoyed it very much, yes. You know, I, I lived in Columbia for five years, roughly, in and out of there. And uh, well, I'm just curious, what was your favorite part of Columbia to go to? Was it Medellin? I think so, yes. And in Bigado and Medellin and out in that area there, yes. I like the mountains behind uh, Santa Marta. You go up to the mountains, it's got snow on it. You go up there and the Indian people, it's so nice and the little coffee farms. And you look down on the sailboats in the ocean and 
we'd take mules and go back into the back country. And I mean, it was just, oh, there'd be mule trains, 50 mules, some guy on the front of it. And, and at night, they'd, they'd pass each other. And I remember those two guys, and one of them, they both have cigarettes. And you'd see a cigarette glow, and those guys with a deep voice, adios, adios. And I went the world, saying goodbye. And I found out the adios it means to God. To God, adios. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, all right. <laughs> and then you see some little boy with a switch bringing up that last donkey in the back. And them huge bales of marijuana all on it. That was just so romantic. It was just beautiful. You go into a, <laughs> <laughs> you go into a place and they must have had like four or five hundred mules, donkeys. Yeah. And they'd have a tack room there that you just couldn't believe with the saddles and, and, and work saddles and just go out and lasso what you want and go. Did you ever buy any property in Columbia? No, I didn't. Did you ever want to? No. Okay. It was lawless when I was down there. I think it's, you know, I know it's better off now, but it's not. Back then, it was just like, good gracious, you don't know. Yeah. I, I actually had a, my best friend bought a condo in Cartagena and got ripped out right from under him, and that was about 2015, yes. maybe. It's, but... Um, I wanted to buy some stuff. Did you ever go down and look at, when I was going down to Medellin, um, I dabbled in a lot of cocaine, <laughs> and uh, I would go, did you ever go look at Pablo Escobar's grave? No, I didn't. I've never been there since then. Oh, you know, I did. I went, yeah, when I got out of prison in Germany, oh, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> I went to Columbia again. Did you? Yeah. <clears throat> It's interesting. I, I I went to his grave, and uh, it's really I, I was expecting something like this huge shrine or something. And it's just a little. I'll put a picture up on it right now, but it's just a little, a little tombstone, just a little headstone. Doesn't even come out of the ground. And um, his family's buried next to him. And on one side of this cemetery is all the mafiosos. And on the other side is all the politicians and the police officers, and it's <laughs> really, killed. yeah, it's really, it's really weird. And yeah, uh, yeah I would go over there, and um, I just wanted to see all this stuff, yeah. you know. So it's history. Throw a little cocaine on his tombstone and <laughs> blast a line off of it. I wonder if he even did any cocaine. I do too. I don't think he did. It didn't seem like the fella to do it. Well, you knew him better than I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, some wild times down there. I don't think the Ochoa's ever, ever. I went there, I stayed there several days at their house with my family. There's not, not even a cigarette was smoked. They're just gentle people. Really? Just, just really nice people. Just, you just wouldn't think. It's like I am. I'm not, I'm not a bad person because I did that stuff. So, I mean, they, they weren't either. Okay. It's just people that fell into it. They were rest in tears. They had money. They was good good people. And hey, you give me a million dollars to move that chair from one side of the room to the other, well, I'll see if I can't get it across there. Yeah. Why do you think, I mean, Escobar got labeled the richest man in the world, the most wealthy man in the world at one time. But then I'm sitting here talking to you, and you're saying that, the Ocho that uh, Jorge Ochoa was shipping out way more than Escobar. Do you think that Jorge just didn't give a shit about being in the limelight and maybe he didn't Escobar? Want it at all. And when they built that prison, he stayed in the prison. Like, lay down, Escobar, lay down. He, 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 was, uh, he wanted in the limelight. He was going to be in it, I reckon. He, But when I met him, he didn't seem like But later on, I mean, I'm sorry I ever knew him. I'm sorry I ever shook his hand. It's an evil man. I mean, somebody blew an airline yeah. and bring up, kill all those people. I mean, I can understand in war, you're fighting somebody, kill them. But just to kill babies and women and children, just just airplane full of people flying along and just get blown out of the sky. Yeah. They, they ain't no place in hell hot enough for him. They, they have tours now in Medellin where you can go and they give you the tour on all the government buildings that he's blown up yeah. and all the church, all the stuff, you yeah, know. It was, it was awful. Went to the, uh, but there's a church where all the the sicarios or the assassins go to pray before they do their hits. It's 
it's still a very interesting culture down there if you can yeah, if you dig it's, in. Uh, it's satanic, yeah. diabolical. Same thing with Putin right now doing over what he's doing. What are these people, what, what, are they, what in the world gets in their mind to do something like that to kill all these, all these wonderful innocent people? Yeah. Or kill them anybody, whether they're innocent or not. That just, take lives is just precious. It's just no way. Yeah. So <clears throat> when you were involved with the, with the Medellin cartel and doing trans, transportation for them, um, did you see the violence start to develop? I didn't ever see any violence. Any violence. Or hear about me. it, I mean. Well, I told you about the blood spattering on me when somebody shot the dog and shot yeah. the, the man. But other I than mean, that, even in Miami, Miami became... I mean, yes, but Miami was a war zone in the well, 80s. I was living there when they shut up that liquor store down there. <laughs> but you had to know that all this was I knew centered they, around they, cocaine. Of course it was. And they, Miami was just thriving on it. It was just... But it just... It just seemed like, like if when we was in Vietnam, you're in a war out there, but you don't, you're not in Vietnam, you don't see it. Did it bother you at all that, because I mean, from, from the time you met Escobar to, I mean, things have developed and changed so much. You know, did you, were you glad you weren't dealing with Escobar? Were you glad you were dealing with Ochoa? Did it bother you? How much violence was starting to pop up about you know because of the I didn't drugs. I didn't know much about any violence and I I didn't feel it or I didn't see anything with me landing an airplane and getting the windshield wiped and putting the gas in it throw that stuff in there and taking off and flying back and getting it out of the airplane it was just like I was worried more about getting caught with a DEA and those yeah. planes that was out there with me and I wasn't even thinking about those people down there. Well, they had that covered. Okay. So he was just, he landed in Nicaragua, all the generals there and everybody there and just like, it was all, y'all yeah, would have been hauling corn. Nobody cared. It was just like, this is, this is money. And I didn't, I didn't see any violence. And I, I mean, I, as far as cocaine at that time, it was not killing anybody. Not that I've ever heard of. Now yeah. people say that it did, and people may have a heart attack from it making the go uh, the heart go too fast. But uh, I, I don't. It, now I understand with the with the crack and stuff they put it with it to kill you. But pure cocaine is, from what I understand, is not all that bad for you. And plus, it was just rich people doing it. And I was a hero for bringing it to them. So it was just. And then, then later on, it did change, completely change. But I was in prison during those years. At some point, and I'm not sure where this fits in with your story, you moved to a 130-foot yacht, I believe. Yes. And I, you moved I don't know which, which one you're talking about. Well, <laughs> there, there, <laughs> there we go. You moved 100 tons of cocaine. Oh, no, that was way, way later. Let's, don't skip that. Let's go in 20 more. Okay. Well, get, get, get some years in front. I did, um, <clears throat> I took, took a, uh, uh, an 80-foot sailboat and went around the world and bought, got three and a half tons of hashish. Did I tell you about that? And took it into Canada, went around through from Pakistan. And uh, then I think I mentioned that. And then I, I bought a 125-foot Coast Guard cutter and was going to take it to... Uh, Thailand to get a load and bring it back. And the crew abandoned it in Kwai High Harbor. They got scared. <laughs> and I found out from the newspaper that a mystery ship abandoned Kwai High Harbor <laughs> and dragging the and, and hippies had gone over there and, and claimed it for salvage. <laughs> and we went over there and it took a month or two to get that thing straightened out. They had stole every piece of brass off of it, all the instruments out of it, and sold it. That was a crew. Thank you, Paul Ray. Paul Ray Gibson, my fan out of Florida, did that to me. So I had some. So anyhow, that was that one. Uh, that was a two that I hold. But you were on the boat from uh, Pakistan, correct? Yes. Uh -huh. How long did that take? It took several months. What do you, I mean... What are you doing on there for so? How did you stay awake? 
Just There's kidding. four of us. <laughs> I'm just kidding. One, You're shipping we, a thing of cocaine. I'm asking well, we, how you stay we, uh, <laughs> I, I like country music, and the other three was uh, was rockers. So anyhow, I, I think I had, you know, some of my stuff, Hank Williams, and I'm missing a Hank Williams tape. They thrown it overboard. <laughs> so I throw two of theirs <laughs> overboard. And by the time we got to Gibraltar, they wanted a tape on that boat. <laughs> There was four of you. Yes, uh huh. We didn't know what we were doing. I, I went and took a, a eight tracks and plugged it in and, and learned to navigate celestial. So I'm a celestial navigator. Incredible. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> I got us around the world. Well, let's, um, let's fill in the blanks then before we hit the, the 130 foot yacht. All right. Yes, there's a lot of them. I can't even, oh yes. All right, I took a load of money down, another load of money down to Grand Cayman Island, and I decided I'd just fly back commercially. And I had the little receipt for how many millions of dollars I had in my pocket. <laughs> and I got to Miami, and there was a warrant for my arrest, and they took me in the little office and said, you're, you've been arresting this from LA. And I thought, was that Los Angeles or Louisiana? And I didn't think too much about it. I hadn't done anything. I hadn't been caught doing nothing. I hadn't done nothing in a while. So anyway, they took me took me in back in the customs thing and said yes. And so I went into the bathroom and I got rid of that receipt for that $15 million or whatever it was, flushed it. And uh, they took me to jail and I found out it was. I was charged with continuing criminal enterprise which carries up to life without parole for marijuana importation. And I was the number 41 person in the United States to ever be charged with that terrible crime. John Gotti was number 42, and he died in there. Most of them do die, they just get charged with that. I said, what do you mean? What's it, 848, Title 21? Well, you have to uh, be organized three different organizations with five people or more. I've never done that. He said, who, who was the mechanic on your airplanes? Who gassed it up? Who put the marijuana in there? Who unloaded it? Who sold it? <laughs> we can think of a dozen. <laughs> it's in that chain yeah. that you were responsible for. Wow. So I hired Albert Krieger, I guess the smartest and best lawyer I've ever heard of. And uh, my bail was $5 million. Five million dollars. I, I had it near about back, back pocket money, but it called Nebby to hearing, and you had to prove where it come from. Well, I'm not getting out of jail no time soon. So anyway, I I, I go, I uh, I give up my property. I give up millions and millions of dollars to the to the government and um, pay the cost of prosecution, whatever else they wanted. So I wound up with um, 35 years with a five-year sentence and 30-year special parole probation. Mr. Reeves, oh, and the prosecutor got up there, Lane Phillips, and had a hole in his shoe, and he's, he's preaching. Your Honor, Mr. Reeves is not a drug dealer. Oh, he was like he was a movie star. And I know he practiced this in the mirror. Your Honor, Mr. Reeves is not a drug smuggler. Your Honor, Mr. Reeves is a drug industrialist with a fleet of planes and a navy of ships at his disposal. He spanned the globe for three decades with his death and destruction. We ask for nothing but a life sentence. The old judge gave me 35 years, and uh, I think he was on my side, but he had to go along with what the prosecution, so anyhow. And then he gave me 30 years of parole, probation and uh, pay the cost of prosecution and so I wound up, and I had to do two years, a little over two years on that five years. So I went to prison, and oh boy, I was down at Terminal Island, and I was in, uh, rather interesting that John DeLorean came in on cocaine charges, and he was in the cell next to me. And uh, Mari, pretty woman, 39 years old with a baby, and she came in and we had a new Mercedes, and John DeLorean's wife, uh, what was her name, Christine Ferrari, she looked, they had similar 
features, and she had a Mercedes just like we had. So when my wife would come to the jail, the helicopter would fly, flop on her. <laughs> All the news people would get out. Anyhow, they got the wrong beauty. Anyway, I got to be friends with John DeLorean, and so um, I saw him with those lawyers coming from New York with the shark skin suits on, and he didn't know what to do, and neither did I. So I said, John, I don't, I don't know, and I wouldn't advise nobody on the lawyer, but when we go to try, when we go to court, that judge, I, uh, I got uh, my lawyer from Florida paying him big money, but we got a, a little lawyer named Howard Weitzman that for $10,000, he's the lawyer for local attorney that we have to use to go. And the judge says, how you doing, Howard? How's, how's the wife and the young'uns and that dog have puppies yet? And I said, man, they get along fine. I said, if I had anything, I'd, I'd get law, rid of that big lawyer and get that little lawyer. <laughs> and he said, well, you introduced me to him. And I said, yes. So I called Howard up, and he got John DeLorean as his lawyer, and, uh, and they won that case, the biggest entrapment case ever in, in history, where the, they, the DEA had tried to entrap DeLorean. They didn't know anything about it. They just put him in a room with a lot of cameras all hidden. This stuff is more valuable than gold, isn't it? How many kilos can I have to have? I'm 100? I mean, why? You could get 100. <laughs> he won. Anyhow, John DeLorean sent me a, a, a Christmas card every year for as long as he lived. No so, kidding. So, so uh, I made friends in there with that. And uh, then uh, after I got sentenced, <clears throat> I, uh, they put me on a bus going north to Pleasanton. Pleasant in prison, I never heard of it. Well, I was in there and they had like 40 little cages. They had a guy in the front with a driver and then they had another one with a shotgun with a banana clip and then they had another one behind us with a banana clip. And we took off and went to Lompoc Penitentiary and I, wow. Well, they put off a couple of guys and picked up a couple and they went across the street to the farm and picked up a couple. And then they went on up to Pleasanton. I had no idea. And went in that gate and man, there's pretty blonde women in the clothes and long dress, and they waved to us. This is a co-ed prison they put me in. There's 400 women in there, <laughs> young, good-looking, they're all federal. <laughs> Most of them were bank robbers, or not really robbers. They were in there. That They worked in banks across the United States, <clears throat> and uh, they were secretaries to the president of the bank. Well, they had boyfriends or husbands, that needed a loan to build a house for $400,000. So they signed the president's name. And the boyfriend got the loan, he didn't pay it back. And they got about five years apiece, and they were just coming in there regularly. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, they let us wear our own clothes, and we could walk with the girls. The girls had two chalets, and the men had one. There's 200 men in here and 400 women. And those women was that's a good ratio. Rather frisky. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm telling you what, <clears throat> so uh, I went in and I uh, we went into our chalet and they showed me my cell. And so the nice guard lady, a tall woman, thin and about 30 years old, and she's give us an induction. Well, she just come from where we started and she opened the first door. I mean, I've never been there an hour. And I'm having induction. And when she opens that door, there's two guys in the compromised position with their pants around their legs, <laughs> around their ankles. And they look like George Bush when they told him that the trade center blew up. Their eyes look like two owls turned that way. And she said, Senor, Fl Senor Flacco, would you please un uninsert your penis from Senor Gordo's rectum oh and Lord. come to my office? But... Uh, Clean up first, please. And she shut the door. <laughs> I thought, damn, I mean, is this what prison going to be like? But after 33 years in prison, it's the only time I ever saw something like that. <laughs> well, that's good. So anyway, that's the homosexuality that I saw in prison. <clears throat> so he went on down. Anyway, uh, that, was, that was a delightful time that I spent in that prison up there. Those women, I mean... We had, uh, I, guess, I guess there was a, a woman there, every month they'd give you, a, have a dance, and the band would come in, you could dance with the girls on the big place door. This is prison? This is prison. We wore our own clothes. I had a trench coat with a scarf around my neck and cap. <laughs> so, 
And uh, they had guards that would slip up in the wheat and they had binoculars on their days off trying to catch people having sex. <laughs> <laughs> and if they did, they caught you, they'd put you on a bus and they send you, the, they called it diesel therapy. And they put you on a bus nonstop for six months. It'd go like to Phoenix and then it'd go to Portland and then it'd go to Chicago and then it'd go to Miami. And you come in at a jail somewhere out in the country and they'd hose you down with a hose and give you a jumpsuit. A few hours later, you was up with a sandwich and some tepid coffee and on the road again. You didn't have a chance to write letters. You didn't have a chance to write court documents. They called it diesel therapy. And those big bad men was broke after six months. They'd cry to get off that bus. <laughs> Damn. So, uh, uh, and also, if you got caught with uh, having sex with those women, they'd, they'd send you a pic uh, letter to your family, to my wife, and say, your husband has been caught having sex with another inmate. They didn't say which <laughs> man or woman. Oh, man. So, I, I behaved myself. Anyhow, my wife came to see me with the children. We had a love. It was a really beautiful place. But it was sad. Some of those women have babies, and the government would take it, the prison would take it from them and never know what happened to them. They give them up for adoption. So they, uh, it, that didn't last long, and, and they took the men out of there. But that was that was the first prison I went to. For two, how many years? I stayed there about a year, and then I, I, I begged to go to Lompoc Camp because it was near home. What a mistake. I came out of a, oh, let me just tell you, I got another story. I had, a, I had my roommate named Mike Nix. He was a strong young fellow, maybe 25 years old. And he could take a big uh, telephone books that thick, even with the plastic on them, and rip it down, just tear it apart like that, any of them. And uh, he, he didn't do much, but he was, he was a little, he was a, a soldier in Germany. And he got some trouble. And his paperwork was all in a little courthouse, like, like a little shack, and he set it on fire. So he got 25 years for burning down the courthouse. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway... The girls loved him, and he talked ugly. He wrote the ugliest letters back and forth to him, and he'd slip into women's, women's dorm and service two or three of them at a time. <laughs> so one time, he come in, he come back in the cell, and his nostrils was blaming. And, and I mean, he was wild. They had locked the the women's dorm while he was in there, and he knew somebody had told. So there was big picture windows there. They was like six feet by four, and he had kicked that out with a with a brick working all and got out of there and came back around and got in our unit. <laughs> Damn. And uh, <clears throat> there's one more story about Mike. The last time I ever seen Mike, I guess we had breakfast together, and he went over to slip into the woman's dot. Uh, no, he wasn't. He worked in the kitchen. And the, a lot of girls worked in the kitchen, so they went into the freezer unit. And there was a table in there, and they was, they was having fun. <laughs> And so the woman guard, I remember her name, she's a really nice old lady. She came in and she said, get down, Mike. And him and the girl just laughed and shook their head. They knew it was over. <laughs> <laughs> so he just kept going on. And so she had to call back up. And them guards said that they took six of them to pull that stallion off and said when he did, his pecker was just steaming in that, <laughs> in that cold. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, they put Mike on the bus, and I never saw him again. What a wonderful guy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way my prison life started off with John DeLorean and, and a bunch of women. And then I came to the camp, and what a letdown. Oh, my goodness gracious. So uh, sagging bunks and guys farting and jacking off and all night long all around you. <laughs> it was 100 people in a dorm. And it was old. Anyway, they put me, I got a job as a cowboy. I, I, well, not a cowboy, fixing fence out on the Vandenberg Air Force Base. And uh, it was just rifle rattlesnakes. And uh, they were docile rattlesnakes, and I don't mind rattlesnakes at all. And I'd catch one in each hand, make his mouth open, I'd run the guard with him. <laughs> Guess what? I'm in the kitchen the next day, <laughs> washing dishes. <laughs> so I had fun there. And uh, I... Uh, I, uh, after when you're one year short of your release date, you can get a furlough from a federal prison camp. So if you go over a thousand miles or over 500 miles, I believe 500 miles, you get seven days. And if you local, you only get five days. They give you travel time both ways. So I went to Georgia 
and uh, my wife and children was all we on the airplane on Delta, and they all over me and hugging me, and the stewardess says, what is going on here? And my wife said, he just got out of prison this morning, and we were on furlough, and she went back and brought us two big bottles of champagne. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was... Uh, when I went back, the guys wanted little sunny televisions, those little things with little one-inch square. Uh, you don't even remember them, but that was back in 1983. So I brought back a sack of those, and I got caught <laughs> coming back in with them. Bam, I'm shipped back to the prison in Terminal Island. What a mess. So I, I stand up that time with, with that. And I got out of prison after a little over two years, and I'm so happy to be home. I'm in front of the television, I got it in the kitchen in the morning, and there's Ronald Reagan's blue eyes. And he says, we have absolute proof that the communist Sandinista government of Nicaragua is in the cocaine running business, cocaine trafficking. And there's Barry's plane, the fat lady, belly in on the runway. <laughs> and I thought, oh shit, Barry has done it again. I'd heard he had switched over and gone going with the police. You'd heard that? I'd heard it. Somebody told me that Barry may be working with him. I don't know who told me, but somewhere. I think. So guy... how did, before we get into that then, because how did you guys just, did communications just fall off? Because he was working for you. Yes. Well, whenever I got arrested, Barry went and got the lawyers. And sent, he sent a lawyer there from Baton Rouge in, and it robbed me, and... And then he got uh, Albert Krieger, the best lawyer that I tell you I've ever seen, and, and a whole he did a whole crew, and he had I believe three of my airplanes, and he he gave Mari the money for him, hundred percent, helped her whatever he could, and uh, but then he I wasn't there, and I was just cut out of the deal. Okay. So he just kept on flying. So he of course he knew the people by then, by the, it, was, it was too much together. I couldn't keep it apart. Didn't even try to, but uh, so. But now he's he's crashed his plane on the Nicaragua one runway there where we refuel, and the phone rang. And he said, "Roger, I'm uh, I want to I got to see you. I'll, I'll come out tonight at a French restaurant. I forgot the name of it. it says I'll be there at nine o'clock. All right, Barry. So I went in at nine o'clock in the room, not a very big restaurant, and maybe ten or fifteen tables." All of them looked like 30, 40 years old, leather skirts and sports coats and blue jeans. <laughs> and Barry's leaned upside the wall at the back, he's gained weight. And I walk up to him and I say, Barry, are you wired? And he said, no, I'm not, Roger. I said, well, you just talk, I'm gonna listen. And he said, all right. So I sat down with him and he went to talk and he said, Roger, I was, uh, I was protected there in, in Mina. You know about that. And he said, and they all, when the shit hit the fan, they all ran, left me holding the bag. And I was indicted in three, in, in Miami, in, in Florida, Louisiana, and Arkansas, facing three life sentences. And uh, so I've told everything. I've been before Congress. I've testified to everything that was going on. But you're under my umbrella. I told them I would not testify unless they protected you. So you're, you, you and I are partners. He said, you've got to come to Miami and testify before a grand jury. I said, the old DEA agents? He said, every one of them. I said, well, bring your head honcho over. He put his hands between his eye, over his eyes and the tears run down between his hands. He said, I just couldn't do it, Roger. I just couldn't do it. I'm so sorry, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do life in prison. So that's when I told him, bring your fella over. I felt sorry for him. I mean, I really did. So the guy came over, lanky fella, crop duster from Alabama, I believe, Jake Jacobson. He's the one that was in that crashed airplane in Nicaragua. And uh, he told me the same thing. He said, well, you can come tomorrow. He said, well, we, we had some Chevis Regal and got a little pie-eyed, and I liked him, except we was on different sides. He said, you can come tomorrow to Miami in first class with, with Mari, or I'll take you down in chains. And the only place you're gonna ever see your family again as long as you live is in a federal prison visiting room, I promise you. That's all. I'll make sure to come first class. So 
I, I did. I, Mari and I went down to Miami the next day, and I went in to see a lawyer. I went to see Gould is his name. I didn't realize his partner had been blown up and killed because he's representing a snitch. <laughs> so, but he's supposed to have been the best at the time, and I went in to see him, and uh, he just says, you know, he says, I'll represent you for $600,000, but I, I don't talk to snitches. I said, I'm not a snitch. He said, well, that's what you're talking about. I said, no, I'm not. I'm just trying to get what you said. He said, listen, man, being a snitch is like being pregnant. You either are or you're not. He was nasty. <laughs> he said, once you start talking, if you don't tell them everything, you will receive a life sentence because everything you've ever done, everything else they said about you will be used against you. He said, you got to go. you got to tell everything from day one to now. And so I left his office, and I thought, damn, that guy. I went to see another, and he told me the same thing. And I said, listen, man, I, I've got to say something. I've got to. He said, you can't. If you're going to do it, you've got to do it all, or you will be convicted and get life. So I went to the, the, uh, the that afternoon, I went to the courthouse. And I was going to tell him I'd. And so I spoke to meet him like at 3 o'clock. And I was standing, it was hot, and I was standing behind a pillar, the big, big marble pillars at Miami Federal Court. And I was up the stairs, and here come the, the three cars. They had about four of them with their machine gun pistols in the front, and I think two in the front and two on each side of Barry in the back. They was looking out this way and that way with Barry as they come to the court. <laughs> and Barry's car pulled right up and stopped beside me. And I just stepped down that step and hit the top of that car. Wham! You should have seen them. <laughs> they tore that car up trying to turn around. <laughs> I said, see how easy it would be? <laughs> they didn't appreciate my humor. So I said, listen, I'm having trouble with lawyers. I'll get one tomorrow. And Barry said, use mine, use mine. I said, all right, give me your card. So he gave me the card. And I had no intention of it. So anyway, I just tried to put it off so I didn't Rested that night. So anyway, I, uh, I went to a festival restaurant there, and Carl Gable was my favorite restaurant at that time. Still is. I think it's closed now. And I was having dinner, and, of course, Barry knew it was, and he came in with Debbie, and we had dessert together. And I said, Barry, they're going to kill you, friend. Oh, no, this and that. No, there's Fabio's in jail. No chores in the end of that. This and that. I said, Barry, they're going to kill you. There's no way on earth you're not going to get killed. And... I hugged his neck. I might have kissed him. I said, Barry, they're going to kill you. And I took Mari and the children, and we fled to Brazil. And we was down there about six months, and uh, I got word that Barry was dead, killed. And uh, I, 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 had, I shed some tears, told Mari and Miriam, and they cried. And we were, so, I mean, the biggest snitch in the world did, and I'm facing a life sentence, but I'm still sorry they killed him. But he should have known. He Who killed him? Uh, the guy that was in the, the that uh, the guy that went, flew up on the first load with me with a machine gun pistol, he's the one who killed him. He's still in Angola. There was four of them. One of them died, and uh, three of them still left up there. They're doing life, never going to get out. Ronaldo was his name. That ugly man. I mean, he was ugly. <laughs> I'm sure he still is ugly. Yeah. Yeah, that's who killed Barry. What, how long were you down in Brazil? Six months, you said? No, it's a little over a year. Oh, over a year. Yeah, huh? <clears throat> and we had nice Brazilian passports, and, and I left there and uh, went down to Argentina, all the way to the bot, all the way to Ushuaia. I was looking looking for a home. Ushuaia, uh, Brazil would have been good, but then I had Brazilian passports. I didn't speak Portuguese. I was afraid if I made investments in soybeans and all that, somebody come take it away from me. Yeah. So, Did you still have all your money in the yeah, Caymans? So, Pardon? Did you still yeah, have I, money? I moved some of it out by then, but that, that guy done stole it. Uh, most everything. It, most a, a lot of the stuff is gone. How much money did you have left at this point? About four million dollars. Four million? Yeah. So you went from. Were you at the height already? Did you go from sixty million to four to, million? To four, yeah. Shit. I was talking about sixty million because I had invested all kind of money in real estate deals, mm -hmm. and. We, hydroelectric plant and oil wells, all that just got wiped away when that guy got killed. And so, and, and he just got taken by the government and bankers and lawyers. Everybody touched me, stole it. They, they just, just wholesale. And you go to prison and your money's out there, it ain't there when you get out. Yeah. Um, not, not unless you're a bad fella and want to kill somebody. And then, and then 
kill them, you go back. <laughs> so it was just like, all right, you catch 22 there. But how was like, how was Maury doing down there? Maury did fine. She just kind of let it, she didn't get involved. She stayed away from it. I didn't, I didn't tell her much and just, uh, she just thought I was bulletproof and I said, I'm going to go do it. I'd go and come back that night or the next day. And Did she ever get frustrated with all the moving around? And well, we didn't move so much, you see, until then. Now, now, now when we owned the, see, now, the government's done kicked in our door and held her hostage all day long and took, took her home from us twice. So she's not too happy with them either. Yeah. And so now, see, I've never been caught with a, with a, with a dollar nor, a, nor one gram of marijuana. And I get 35 years just because everybody got caught, sometimes five, six, seven years later, pointing their finger at me. Roger did it. Roger did it until they build a case against you. Well, you don't have to. And like I told, they had me for bringing that money to the Grand Cayman Island. I said, some of that money, I never even touched it. The lawyer said, you don't have to fondle it to be guilty. So I kind of like <laughs> <laughs> So it's like anything else. It's, they don't have to catch you shooting somebody for murder. Two people say you, they saw you do it, you gone. Yeah. So it's the same thing with marijuana. They say, say you did it. And, and I pled guilty to a lie. There's a guy that, I don't know why he told him, he said he drove by my house and saw 400 pounds of marijuana in my garage. You can't even see the garage from my house, from the highway. And I've never had anything in my house. I'm never, not even a, an ounce of marijuana at my house or on property. I, no, I don't use it and don't. I just don't have anything to do with it except fly it. Yeah. So that's why she was. Uh, I will tell you a little. Murray, Murray did get involved in the marijuana business one time. Did I'll she? I tell that. Uh, I flew into a, a little airport over there, over the mountain, uh, Santa Ines, and I landed, and the unloader was supposed to be there to to uh, to unload me, and it was. I don't know, about Christmas time. And uh, I, I, had, I had a ton of marijuana in the airplane. And uh, so I got out and there's nobody there, nobody. There's a little runway out, way out in the country. And I was so angry with him. What in the world? What am I going to do with this load? The guy with the truck's supposed to be here. So I think I had $2,100 bills in my pocket, but I didn't have a dime to use that phone. <laughs> so I had to walk to Solvang. It's about five miles away. And I took off walking, and I got to got to solving, and I I called Mari. I says, Mari, come over here just uh, as quick as you can. Pick me up and come sign come sign some kind of little truck or something so we can move this stuff. So she borrowed a little El Camino truck with a little low body from a friend of mine, and she came over, and we went back out, and the the plane was empty. And I said, Oh man. This unloader, Wild Bill, done stole that load. <laughs> so we went back home. I didn't, I didn't know what had happened. I thought they might have gotten it. But it's about 2 o'clock. Hey, I got a nice Christmas present, Roger. Oh, da, 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 da. And I thought, you rascal, you. And uh, he said, we saw, we saw you land at 8 o'clock. We thought it was an airliner had that big lights on that plane. We didn't know your plane was so big. <laughs> so we went to McDonald's <laughs> to get something to eat. We come back. Man, the present was there. And we left me hanging for about six hours. <laughs> so anyway, the next morning we took that little truck and went back over there just at daylight. And uh, I got in there. I said, well, wait just a minute, Marty. Let me see. Let me sweep this thing out because I know they didn't. So I got in there was sweeping the plane. Out. I had linoleum all in the planes right up to the windows so the seeds couldn't get in there. They convict you on a seed or two. So mine was, I had a professionally linoleum from one end to the other. I get up in there, and there was a little spot there where the stewardess would make coffee and stuff. And under that was a big bag of sticky buds, maybe 60, 70 pounds. I said, oh, the idiots. Oh, my goodness gracious. I've been convicted like this uh, with the same load. <laughs> so I drugged that thing out, and I tried to put it in that truck, and it wouldn't go in. So I throwed it up in the back. I got to get out of here. And I said, Mari, just go get rid of it. She said, I can't lift it. I said, just let the tailgate down and... And back up and slam on brakes. I don't care. Get rid of it. <laughs> so she took off with it. And I took off and I flew across and I landed at the airport and I had a hangar. And I, I went in the hangar. So she came up and I said, you get rid of it all right? She said, yes, but you're not going to like this. I said, what? She said, I heard it, it, it went in water. 
I said, honey, there's nothing but a desert between here and Santa Inez. How did you get it in water? She said, I don't know. I did what you said. I backed up to a cliff and I put on the brakes and it went a long way down and I heard it hit water. <laughs> I said, let's go see what you're talking about. She had backed up to a cliff six or 700 feet high and slammed on brakes, and that thing went down <laughs> to the poison oak and poison ivy, and it hit a little stream down and bounced out. <laughs> I had to get ropes and everything else. She just always laughed about her and her one marijuana trip. So she did do it once. <laughs> I'll be damned. Yeah. <clears throat> well, back to Brazil. All right. So you're down there for about a year, about then you went to Argentina. Year, yes. And then we went on down to Argentina, and I didn't find it there. And Mari said, if I, if I die in this place, Roger, please don't leave my bones here. I was oh, out there man. looking at a place to grow soybeans. So I said, all right. So we bought a ticket and went to Amsterdam. And we stayed in Amsterdam for a while. And then uh, then went to the south of France. And we lived there for a year and had a nice time. And then my friend Jerry, the one that used to fly for me, he came over and... Uh, he said, let's go to, I want you to introduce you to somebody. I want you to introduce you to Howard Marks. So we went to Mallorca, Spain, and I met Howard Marks, which was my Waterloo. Biggest mistake I ever did in my life was meeting that man. Well, so he knew everybody. He'd been traveled around the world, and he had a guy named John Denby that had walked across India and China, and that guy knew a lot of people, and Howard was using him. And so he hooked us up to, uh, uh, I went to Pakistan and again, hooked us up for a 10 ton load out of there. And I think I put a million dollars or so up and we hauled the load and it was so bad stuff. It was too much yak fat in it, it wouldn't stay lit. <laughs> Couldn't hardly sell it. So just one, one backle after another with him. So I, uh, I don't know how, well, let's take a quick break before let's we get into it. Hey guys, let me tell you about this subscription service that I've been working real hard on called Vigilance Elite Patreon. Basically on Patreon, we have it broken up into three different tiers. We got tier one, tier two, and tier three. Let's dive in. Our Tier 1 patrons get all the behind-the-scenes footage of The Sean Ryan Show. That could include behind-the-scenes photos, that could be side conversations that we have in between breaks, that could be specific questions that our patrons give us for the guests on The Sean Ryan Show, and a ton of bonus content that doesn't really fit into any specific category. For our Tier 2 patrons, they get access to our tactical training library which consists of well over a hundred videos. We've broken those videos up into separate categories and those categories are rifle fundamentals, pistol fundamentals, drills, tactics, driving, gear and weapon setups, and everybody's favorite, mindset. Also on tier two you will get a live update from me on the 1st and the 15th of every month where we talk about the upcoming guests on the Sean Ryan Show, plus all the benefits of Tier 1. Our top tier, which is Tier 3, gets full access to all the other tiers, plus they get full access to me where we do video teleconferencing, VTC, once a month. We discuss anything from tactics to current events, to who's coming on the show, I take suggestions, and it's very interactive. No matter what tier you choose, the support is greatly appreciated, and it is the only thing that makes this show drive on. So thank you for all the support. See you on Patreon. All right, Roger, we're back from the break. You're starting to get involved with Howard. Oh boy, <coughs> Howard, my Waterloo. That's right. <laughs> so uh, I was living in the south of France there uh, in Biot. And uh, my friend Jerry 
come over and met me. We had a nice time reunion. He'd been the one that had been flying the same as Barry. And he came over with his entourage. And uh, so my daughter, Maria, was there, and she wanted to fly over. They had chartered a private jet and was flying around the world. And she flew with them to Mallorca, uh, no, yeah, to Mallorca, Spain. Well, it was M. Reeves. So the DEA thought they had a lead on me and that I was living in France because the M. Reeves, Mari Reeves, got on a plane with Jerry Wills to fly to Mallorca. It caused me to leave France. Anyway, we went over and met Howard, and I liked Howard all right. He had a lot of contacts, and so uh, he uh, said that he could get all kind of stuff out of Pakistan. So anyhow, I was the one wound up buying, uh, paying for, I give him a million dollars to pay for for uh, a load of, yeah, it was a million or two million. Uh, yeah, a million, a million dollars I gave him to put down on another load of hashish. So uh, they pulled a, a big scam on us. We had to boat over in the Maldives. It was a hundred and, I believe, 108 foot Alaska king crab, crabber, almost new, that thing was nice. and. Uh, so they went over there, Howard and his guys, Doby and Hobie, <laughs> and they put a bug on it. And they says, all right, we have information there with the CIA, they're with the DEA, and there's a bug on that boat, and for $250,000, we'll tell you where it is. I said, oh, shit, I ain't paying you nothing to find out one. I can find a bug in a few minutes if it's on there. Oh, sorry, we've already took it off. Here it is. And I've given them 250000 of your dollars. And that's when I about come undone with Jerry. I said, Jerry, I ain't putting up with that. It's just a scam. So he took me out in the hall and said, Roger, this deal's worth $20, $30 million. Don't mess it up for $250,000. They already got the money anyway. So anyway, we, we did the uh, fool around. And he says, oh, uh, mileage can't get the hash and this and the other. So, but I got a deal for you in Thailand. Thailand? Thailand. We can get the military to load you 20, 200 miles off of the coast, but we need $2, two million. The military is going to load you up? Yeah. With so, what? Mar marijuana. So I went over to Thailand, and I gave the other million dollars. Now he's already got one, but we can't transfer it and this and the other. So uh, he, uh, the, the boat came, and, and they loaded us with, I, I went and looked at marijuana. It was good stuff. It was, uh, half of it was in nitrogen seals. Uh, so it stays fresh, but I understand it deteriorates pretty quick after you open it. But when you open it, it's just like it come out of the field. Anyway, we put the uh, 17 tons on the, on the boat. The military went out and loaded it with a military cruiser. And uh, the boys took it on across the Pacific right quick. So Howard wanted me to stay. He says, Roger, I got a guy named Rummy here, and he's got a 85-foot wooden sailboat, and he wants to get loaded, and with you put some money on it. I said, Howard, if I put any more money, I would, uh, I would uh, put it on my own boat. Oh, just another. But anyhow, I flew them back to Mallorca. We'd done move there near Howard a, a few miles, 20, 30 miles away. But uh, Howard was a week or 10 days later, and he stayed over and loaded that old boat with a wooden boat. Got, got it somehow. And the unloaders unloaded our boat and was selling it. They said, don't take it to the United States. Just sell it up here. We can get $1,400 a pound. Well, that's about $50 million for that load. So my friend Jerry and said, Ron says, okay, let's do it. So they're staying in a, they're staying in a nice condo or a hotel. A hotel and uh, money's coming in, 2 or $3 million a day. Every two or three days, they rented a uh, storage place, and they got... Six, seven, eight million dollars in there, and it's got the little tag in Ron's pocket. And they got three million dollars in the hotel room and two or three million dollars downstairs in his car. And uh, Howard sends John Denby, his old friend that's hooked up with the Cray brothers out of out of England, and he lands in my in in Vancouver. And of course, with him comes a telex to the Mounty Police. This is a notorious criminal who's entering your country. <laughs> So they followed him, and he happened just out of chance to go to the same hotel that Ron and Jerry are staying in. No way. 
and they hug in the library. <laughs> click, 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 all the pictures on it. Now then, they're watching Jerry and Ron. So they all eat and drink and have a good time, and they got people with pointy shoes and plaid pants following them around holding hands and taking pictures of them. So now the old wooden sailboat comes in, and the same unloaders that have unloaded us and selling are unloading. And they swarm on them. There's a DEA agent on that old wooden sailboat. I don't know if Rummy's a DEA agent or his, one of his crew is, but uh, they arrest them all. So they didn't, they didn't put them all in jail, and everybody's out the next day, all the Canadians, for a $100,000 bond for marijuana. But Ron, Jerry, and Denby can't get out. So hmm. they keep them in jail six months, and the lawyer comes in for the unloader said, everything's going to sell, fine, we're selling it, we're doing good. So when, after six months, Jerry and Ron get trans uh, deported to the United States and Denby gets sent back to England. Well, they, my boys wanted to see about the money and they says, fuck you, we don't owe you nothing. You brought the heat on us. $50 million, zip, gone. Wow. So Jerry hires a guy from the as, as Assad to go and collect it. So the guy meets him in the Belvedere Wilshire Hotel. <laughs> So yeah, I'll get it for two hundred fifty thousand dollars. How do you get in contact with that? I don't know. So anyhow, they got in touch with somebody that's going to collect that money. Well, that guy didn't stay there. He stayed there with the girls for four days. Called Jerry, come in, get your money. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> so Jerry goes down there and he comes and sits down. He puts a Glock to his head. He said, "They don't know you anything. If you don't give me two hundred fifty thousand dollars, I'm fixing to blow your brains all over this hotel room." Jerry calls Ron. Pay me two hundred fifty thousand dollars quick. <laughs> <laughs> now he's lost fifty thousand. He's lost two hundred fifty thousand dollars on top of it. And he's I don't want nothing to do with it. Goodbye. <laughs> Damn. So anyway, that's gone. But anyhow, in the meantime, I'm I've been arrested uh, there. You know, in Spain, I've been extradited up to Germany, and I'm serving time in a German prison. Yes, that was that was another load. I get them mixed up with Howard, but anyhow. Howard owed me the two million for the to hold that load out of Morocco, and he wouldn't pay me, and he turned me in. So that was my my time with Howard. He turned you in. He turned me in completely. After all that, he didn't want to pay. He, he knew he was fixing to go down, so he didn't want to pay, and uh, turned me in. So where did the, the yacht come in? The hundred and thirty foot yacht with one thousand. Okay, I, I'm, up in, I, I'm up in uh, uh, Germany, and in 1990, I'd I escaped. I tell you, I tell you, I tell you, tell you about getting out of Germany, the Spanish court jumping on the car. I told you that. You did. And then I went up to Germany. Did I tell you about escaping from that prison? You didn't. All right. So I believe it was 1990 that I'm in Lubeck Penitentiary, a Lubeck prison, a fortress with gun towers all around it. They had the Red Brigade and the people in there from all kind of bad folks. And they put me in there with that. And after one year, I escaped from that prison. I went between the bars. You did mention this. Got all of it, and that woman tried to run that over me. Okay. Uh, I think you had mentioned you went to prison in Spain, too. Yes, I spent 17 months there. We did not talk about Spain. Wasn't much to talk about. Yeah, I did some tours to talk about. Uh, since I'd, I'd jumped on the car and got away, they, they had me naked in Mallorca in the, in the cell day and night. They wouldn't let me have any clothes. They thought if I didn't have any clothes, I could escape. <laughs> and that's when they put, everywhere I went, they put my handcuffed over my shoulder. Anyway, I got up to, uh, to German and uh, they sent me to Madrid. And uh, rather picturesque. They put me in, there was a, a, a modern prison there. I mean, it was modern, and they had modulos, and each modulo had 50 prisoners in it, and it was nothing much to do. There was a thing about small tennis court and uh, a spot there where you could buy coffee and cupcakes, and you could buy three kilos of food a week, and they'd bring it in, and you had prison money, and there was about five or six of us had a lot of money, and we'd give the other poor people the, the money to buy theirs, and we just had copious amounts of food, salmon, and chams and salads and stuff come in. 
I, I, know, I guess they brought it in two or three times. I forgot. But we had a big table out there where everybody could just eat all they wanted to. And one of us would pay for the coffee one day and the, the little cakes. That the, there was a kick fighter there from Turkey, and he could keep ordering at his little store. <laughs> <laughs> and they threw the, the, the domino chips down, and they just made a lot of rackets. And if they played uh, backgammon, which I played backgammon, they wanted a wooden box so it could make a lot of noise with the dice roll. They wouldn't, they wouldn't roll it on felt, uh-uh. <laughs> so that was the Turks I was in with. Anyhow, wonderful people. So I spent 17 months there in that place. But I was bored, and at the end of it, uh, at the end of that place was a little little wall about knee high, and on top of it had a chain link fence just to keep you in that. Beyond that was a big wall with catwalks on it and uh, towers and guards up there with guns. But uh, and then they had like a moat with all electronic wires. They, I don't think no way in the world get out of that thing. So it was it was impenetrable. So but anyway, there was a little place there, maybe ten feet across. It was dirt. And the boys, they got little cups for your coffee, and they'd poke them through that chain link fence, and I guess there were thousands of them there. And I decided I wanted a garden. I didn't have nothing else to do. Let me make a garden. I'm a country boy. So I took a mop panel, and I made it sharp, and I stuck it through those cups one at a time and brought it back up and squashed it through the fence and brought it back until I, I cleaned the spot about four feet wide. And then it was hard, hard red dirt, rather hard. And I guess it was all wet, but the other end of the place was a spigot. And I got a five gallon bucket and I come and I poured, for a week I poured water on it till I got that thirsty soil softened up. And then I made it like a spade on the end of a, a big heavy mop handle and stuck it through there. And I pushed it down in the soil about six or eight inches and turned it like a turning plow until I did it all the way across. I guess I get maybe not less, 60 or 70 feet across there. And then uh, out of the vegetables that we bought from the grocery store, I put little jar lids and put dirt in them in my windowsill, and I got plants started. And then I would take the, I would dig a little hole on the over there, and I'd put that little plant on top of the end of the stick with some dirt on it with a little bit of mud, and I'd put it in that hole and break the dirt back around with the stick. Now I'm working through a fence. It's like trying to build a, a ship in the bottle. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and then the, the, the mop panels come with a plastic tube on them, and I'd take that and take a cup and pour the water around my plant. And so I got all kind of plants growing on the other side of the fence, watermelons and cantaloupes and zucchinis and just about anything that you can imagine that we could order in the grocery store. I got the seed and, and planted it. Well, those plants grew, and I would bring the cut all the vines off but one and bring it to the fence and weave it in that chain link fence until I had big watermelons hanging and cantaloupes and eggplants and quash and zucchinis and just tomatoes and all kind of bell peppers. I just had a, a garden that was just unbelievably beautiful hanging in. That whole fence was covered with it like a mosaic of, of fruit. <laughs> and the warden came and stood in front of it and there was a newspaper article about it. <laughs> there was a newspaper article newspaper about it? About, about that garden in the prison. So, of course, they didn't let me stand in front of it. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to almost fight to keep the other prisoners from, they laughed at me for a while, and then they wanted to pour water on it. And I said, go drown it, get out of here, this is my garden. <laughs> <laughs> so that was in Spain, uh, and it's pretty nice there, it really was. You want to get into the fishing yacht? Into which one? The 130-footer with okay. a thousand tons. I got out of, I got out of, so I, after I escaped from the German prison, I, uh, I went back to South America to, um, to see about collecting that three and a half million dollars that Ocho owes me. Well, he wouldn't see me. And uh, my friend helped keep me from getting there, I believe. So anyway, I, I left that. So, but anyhow. Uh, to help keep, keeping you from getting where? Getting to Ocho and getting to the money. He, he knows something. They all know something. But they, they're not telling me what's happened. They don't. They done, they done divided that money up. So uh, I, uh, he said, let me introduce you to somebody. So he introduced me to somebody, and the guy said that he had paid me $20 million to take a shipload of cocaine to Australia. I said, well, sign me up. Here I am, a fugitive. <laughs> so I... Uh, I uh, Where do you put $20 million when you're a fugitive? 
I don't know if I was going to get it in Australia, and I'd have figured it out after I got it, but it better not having it. <laughs> I'd have got, I would have got it probably and put it on a, I'd have bought a sailboat and probably went to Dubai, right up the Indian Ocean. Why well, Dubai? I think that they have uh, less DEA, U.S. influence than some other place. Okay. I would, I've been afraid to go into India. They would have probably just taken it. Yeah. But I think Dubai would have probably, you could have hid the money on a boat and taken it off and put it in the bank. I think that's what I was thinking about. Well, it's another safe haven for, I mean, they're, they're well known for the their banks not being influenced. I think all the heroin money coming with. out of Afghanistan and all that Pakistan goes there and is laundered. Yeah. Uh, that's, um, it's a haven. But that, 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 wasn't, that wasn't the problem was getting it. So anyway, they, uh, uh, they, they bought an a, a offshore supply vessel. I found it there in Louisiana. And uh, those things are worth $12 million. But when they get 40 years old, about 39 years old, at 40 years old to the day, they can't get insurance to go anymore. So they, these, these Exxon and all, all these different places own these oil wells. And these ships have to be insured to go out there. These they're all offshore supply vessels, and I think this one had been in the North Sea, and it had it was like five or six stories high, and had all the oil well firefighting equipment on it. And I mean that thing was that it was palatial. It was nice. You could eat dinner off the off the floor in the uh, engine room. It was sparkling, and uh, so I bought that thing for three hundred thousand dollars. Its price is kept crap. Wow. At that time, and I took that thing and I went and uh, went to uh, Cape Verde Islands and uh, put some more fuel on, and I was supposed to load up the cocaine there. And I went back out. Then I had to go back a thousand miles towards Columbia <laughs> to meet the boat. And finally, they didn't show up. Had me going around under the satellite for four or five days, three days. And finally, it came. And they put a, a, th a thousand kilos, a ton of cocaine on. Just threw it overboard. Now he had that on it. And uh, there was one Colombian got on there with us and it had me and another fellow from Georgia there on. Uh, and so we took it and I went around. Uh, what does what a thousand tons of cocaine look like? A thousand kilos. A thousand That's kilos. 2,200 pounds. Me. Okay. Uh, now, kilo used to you be real fluffy and big, but now it's made with, um, uh, they do something with uh, microwave ovens. In those places, you'll see two or three hundred microwave ovens, and they cook it in there. So it's oily and dense. So it's almost as dense as water. It'll almost sink. So one cubic meter, thirty-nine point four inches cubed, is one ton. So this much and this much is a ton. Okay. And so this stuff would just float just above the water, so it's a little less. So you might say fifty inches cubed. Okay. That's how that's how big it is. Yeah, I ate it on the boat and made it in a fuel tank. And I took it and went around, went way down, went down uh, on the Brazilian side of the Atlantic Ocean because in the southern hemisphere, the uh, oceans, like in your toilet, they turn counterclockwise. And in the northern hemisphere, it turns clockwise. So the oceans run that way. And it, on the equator, is zero. You got a little boy at, over on the Equatorial Hotel in Kenya. It burned down, but he's there. And he'll put a, he got a five gallon bucket with a funnel and he said, come over here. And he pours in a jug of water and it goes, Zzz. and he goes over here and it goes, Zzz. and he pours it and it goes straight down. He said, now that's the equator. So that's how sensitive that, that force is I'll around be the world. That's interesting. So anyway, I was following the current down and then we went way south of Cape Town, uh, of the Cape of Good Hope and went down, and I kept going south. I, did, I wanted to stay out of any traffic, and so no, no boats or ships ever saw me after I left the traffic off of the, uh, coming out of South America. There was a lot of traffic that I crossed. Got down there, we didn't see anything, and uh, uh, one morning I woke up, and the, the swells was just monstrous. I can't tell you how big they were. I fished in Alaska. They were babies compared to this. They were coming off of that Antarctica, it swirls around there. I don't think a swell gets 100 feet, but they looked taller than that. And it looked like they were just falling down on the back of the boat. And I remember that on the old sailing ships that they had to put a blind up there so that uh, the man on the wheel wouldn't run. And they put two men on there. It's, it's phenomenal to look to see that much water standing up behind you. And the boat would come up, and when it comes to the top, 
the two big propellers whoop, would come out of the water and that boat would surf down that wave. Wow. And it'd go like 25 knots on the GPS. <laughs> <laughs> and the nose would stick under about a third of the boat and it would just stay under there for a while and it'd slow, it'd slowly come up and oh, that water man. would rush off the back of it. And I thought, uh, uh, I thought that was nerve wracking. This boat might not be made for that. It was made for the Caribbean. So I turned <laughs> and, and, uh, and went north out of there. I was going to go under Melbourne, but then I saw the guy at the place that the Columbians had chosen from had a lot of shoals, and he just looked at it from the from the sea without. And I said, "It will never do if it's if it's any wind or any southern wind, which it may be. We could never get ashore there." So I uh, I chose a plot spot up uh, oh near Sharks Bay, in Western Australia, about halfway up or four up the side of it, and. Uh, I, I went and uh, we, we came in at in, in 2 o'clock at night, and I saw an airplane up there blinking too slow. Uh oh. And I said, all right, we were watched. And uh, so I uh, went ashore, put the, put the cocaine, I had two 20 foot rubber Zodiacs, and I left the big boat out there with my friend Joel on it, and me and the Columbian went ashore. And uh, that guy talked a big talk, but. Uh, I put it in, and, I, and so I told him to get in the other one. No, no, no man of heart. I can't drive. <laughs> so I had to hook them together, one behind the other, and drag them. And we went in, and there was a surf, and it was pitch black. And I went over that surf and went inside like a lagoon. And then, no, you couldn't see. And I tried to come back over that surf and finally got over to the side. And uh, one of the uh, Zodiac busted, and we got out, and I got to carrying the cocaine up, up a cliff up to high so we could see it. And it was dark, and it was raining. Couldn't see anything what we was doing. So finally I got it up there and the, my sandal got tore off and the whole bottom of my foot got torn off. I had to have new, new skin grafted on the bottom of my foot. So uh, got that stuff in a hole. And then I, uh, I went to go back to get the boat and to take, go get Joel. So one of the Zodiacs had busted and was tied up there. And the other one had drifted away. And it had the motor on it. I said, How, what in the world am I going to do? So I jumped in to swim. Now, this place is called Sharks Bay. It's got thousands and thousands of sharks out there. It's just a, a, a bay in there where they come in the hole. So as I'm swimming, the, the boat just drifting just a little bit faster than I can swim. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> this never turns out well. No, it not. So that <laughs> thing going away from me, and a, and a, a fin cuts the water. Sticking out about that high. Get the hell out of here. Are you serious? Cut around me. Well, I draw my feet up and I pray, Lord, don't let it happen now. <laughs> don't let it. Oh, I don't even hardly breathe. I'm trying to stay up like this. <laughs> and he cuts his fin around closer. Then that sucker comes up. And he blows. I like to laugh my head off. There's a dolphin looking at me. <laughs> I didn't have any problem catching that boat. I almost <laughs> dove over it when I got to it. Gave you a little uh, extra motivation yeah, it gave me some to swim faster. I didn't know I had. <laughs> so we took it out there, and I, I went in and uh, got me a hot shower. And uh, they always had some coffee on the cup, and I took a cup. Then I'd cut a big hole down the side of the ship and reversed all the pumps. And then I got in the... Uh, Got the Zodiac, Zodiac with Joel, and going twelve knots. I couldn't even untie it. I had to, had to cut the, uh, cut the rope, and then I <laughs> nearly dove over when it stopped. And I went back in, and uh, uh, we covered up the cocaine real good with blankets and, and rocks and brush. And it rained, and we got under kind of a rock. And some fishermen at daylight came, and they were they had a cable that they must have put out, and they were catching these great big. Looked like red snappers, about 20 pounds, and he was pulling them up the cable. They put something to go over their mouth once they catch them, and that, that brings them up. Hmm. And they was taking them off one after the other. Dang, what fishing? And then it was down, 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 you sons of bitches. They knocked me in the head, picked me up by my groin, treated me real bad. And there was three of them. They were called the TRG, and they were stealing that cocaine like crazy. They were throwing it back in the surf where it was rushing back around. <laughs> I said, I hope they get it all. They had a gun to my head. Don't you look. Don't you look. <laughs> Damn. And then after a while, I saw the federal police coming. So uh, they arrested us and 
took us took us down to Geraldton and stayed there for a day and then they put us on a Brinks truck and, and took us to a prison in, in Perth. And uh, I got 25 years. And uh, then I testified that Joel, who I put the boat in his name, didn't know that it was cocaine and he, th he, he thought we was gonna sell the boat in Indonesia and, and when the cocaine come, he couldn't swim a thousand miles. So he, after three trials, he won his trial and he went home and they appealed my sentence and raised me to life. So and they said they was gonna do it if I testified. So anyway, I, uh, I got a life sentence for testifying and, uh, but they put it 18 years as a minimum before I could apply for parole. So that but whenever they found out that I had escaped from all those prisons before and the police, they come and arrested me in the prison and put me in what they call the shoe. And uh, I was in the shoe there. And there was a, there was only three other ones when I went in there, and uh, that was the worst of the worst. I mean, it was like the silence of the lambs. Really, and just exactly like that. And uh, they had uh, one-way mirrors that they looked at you, five or six cars, and we cooked our own food. They care ourselves. They came at six o'clock in the morning, opened the cell with about six of them with truncheons. They was ready to beat you to death if you moved, and. Uh, and it was quite boring in that place. I stayed in there just a little over a year, but there was a computer in there. And after I got life, I thought, you know, my, my children, grandchildren, great grand they never gonna know who I am. And some of these stories, I believe I'll tell them about when grandma bought me the little pony. <laughs> and I started, I didn't know how to, how to turn that computer on, but I could type and it didn't have a program on it. It just had a thing called paintbrush. And so I, I got to typing and I painted over a, mil, I print type over a million words before I quit. And so then when I got out of there, I got a computer and got it, got to a computer. And it took me, I reckon, a year to figure out what I wrote. It was all red, yellow, and green because <laughs> I didn't worry about spelling or punctuation. Yeah. I just wanted to tell the story. So I wrote the book there called Smuggler while I was in prison. Do you have any idea how long it took you to type a million words? About three or four months. Three or four and months. I was just, that's all I did. Didn't have nothing to do. Did you like doing it? Yeah, because some of the times, and it's a lot of the stuff that I put, I just cried and the tears come out. I think it did me like something good to remember my grandpa, grandma, and my daddy, and the, the stuff, the, the ghost stories that told around the fire and all that sort of stuff as a youth. And it's it, like therapy. It, therapy, for you. yes, it did good. And uh, I took all that out because nobody wants to read about my grandpa. <laughs> but uh, this, I just left the stuff that I did in it. Yeah, in the truth. So that's what I did, and it, it was it was enjoyable. And then, of course, I couldn't send the book out after I got it all typed together, and uh, they allowed me to buy a computer for my cell. And Australia's prison was was more progressive than here, much more so. So I had the computer, and there was a skydiver in there, and he had a illegal telephone. So, and so he said, "Oh, you want to get that to your wife? What's her email number?" <laughs> Click, and in one second, Mari had that book in the United States, so she published it for me while I was in prison. That's amazing. Yeah. When did you get out of prison? I got out of two years ago. Two years ago? I came back from Australia. After, uh, I was coming up on the 18th year, and, and nobody hardly gets uh, parole on their first uh, year eligible. They, anybody, no matter what, they'd say, okay, you got life, you got 50 years or 30 years before you can apply for parole. And most everybody, come back in five years, you're not rehabilitated. So I wrote my neighbor, Mr. Jimmy Carter, a letter, and I asked him, uh, Mr. Carter, I mean, I'm, I was your neighbor, remember back yonder, da da da. And uh, we Jimmy grew, Carter was your neighbor? Was your neighbor, was a neighbor, yes. So I had a farm there right, right close, to, close to his. So uh, he wrote a letter to the Attorney General of Australia and said, if appropriate, I uh, would ask that you will, uh, or I hope that you will consider for parole my neighbor and friend, Roger Reeves. And so things started rolling and I got paroled. So they put me on a plane. I, I, on the day 18 years, I got out. Of course, I hadn't gotten any trouble. And uh, I got, uh, flew back laughing across the Pacific and with three Marshals from Australia, I think they knew what was going on. But anyhow, the plane emptied and I stepped out. And five little Mexican-American 
Border Patrol guys grabbed me hard, slammed me into the wire, bruised my face, kicked my feet apart, <laughs> handcuffed me, two leg irons on me, put the handcuffs on me so hard. There's one ugly woman there saying, eyes ahead, eyes ahead. I said, if I had a bulldog look like you, I'd shave his ass and teach him to walk backwards. <laughs> <laughs> they took me and put me in the, in the chokey there in Los Angeles. And I couldn't get out of there. I said, I've been in open prison for 16 of the last years. I said, what in the world? And the lieutenant says, I can't move you, man. So one day, the little window slid open, and a nice-looking man standing there said, my name is uh, Assistant Warden Short. He says, we saw your National Geographic documentary, and it does me pleasure to keep you in isolation. Click. I never could get out of there. I stayed in, in isolation for months. Just a, a National Geographic did a, did a thing, and I was part of it down in Australia, Australia's hardest prison. And I kind of bragged about cutting a hole in that place when it was brand new. <laughs> so that, that cost me. Yeah. So they... Uh, the pro board supposed to give you. There was pro, pro for marijuana thirty forty three years ago, and by law they're supposed to give you a hearing within ninety days. They never gave me one. I went to Oklahoma City to get a hearing, and I got there about three thirty four o'clock. And a nice lady says, "Oh, you're Reeves. There was a man from Washington here, and uh, he waited, and he said that he'd come back next year." So there, I got out on the floor, but I had to count. I had to register every two hours. Did I'd go back in the shoe when I was in Oklahoma. And so I had to come in and sign a thing on the floor, right where I was. I was on like the 18th floor or whatever. Uh, so I guess they thought I was <laughs> going to escape again after that. But anyway, she said, would you like to have a, me to ask for a parole on the record? I said, I've never asked for it. I said, please do. So it's the next day she's come and said, yes, I have your parole here. You get out in 90 days from today and they're sending you to Terminal Island, California for the rest of your time. So they took me back and took me a week or two to get back there. What a mess uh, getting back. Uh, when I was in, uh, there's so much corruption. Let me just tell you how much corruption is in our government. It will make you sick from everybody in it is. When I was in Lompoc Penitentiary, I watched them move dirt about the 10th of April they got big bulldozers and them. They moving dirt from one place to the other, back and forth. Somebody's because cousin's they, getting paid they off. They want to use up all the money that they have. Yep. So we can ask for more next year. I saw that in my own eyes. And then on this, I would be. I saw a nice young fellow from down in South Georgia, where I'm from. He said, "Where are you going?" He said, oh, "I got caught with two grams of methamphetamine. I got to go to Los Angeles for psychiatric evaluation. I've been here three months waiting for a plane." Then I meet another fellow. He said, well, I'm from Long Beach. And what about you? He said, I got caught with two grams of methamphetamine. I got to go to Atlanta, Georgia for psychiatric evaluation. I believe that Fed Air has 23 planes flying prisoners around the United States. It's a Canadian company. You better not ask anything about that. That's interesting. It's like we had... Uh, it's a Canadian company, huh? I heard it was. I, I don't know. I've never looked into it really, but I believe it is. But anyhow, you know who it's owned by. It's owned by our politicians for sure in the borders mm -hmm. of the prisons. It's their retirement. It's yep. the same thing with these uh, you know, with these places that make things in prison. You better not ask about them. You'll be put in the shoe and transferred. So they make office furniture for, or, or cables for space stuff. Uh, all kinds of stuff in prisons are made. My prison labor, dollar an hour. Yeah. So, that was a, I don't. Where was I now? I, was, I regressed <laughs> to the. You were getting transferred from Oklahoma. Yes, yeah, so I got back there, and and after a year, uh, after uh, three months, they let me out. Right, and oh, they put me in the. They, I got out. I come out of the chow hall, and the guy said he had uh, cut my hair. He said, "When you come out of the chow hall, turn to the right." Well, I did. And the guy said, walk between us. And he went up like, boof. And I said, I bet I could outrun you. And they tackled me to the ground. 
put me in the choke in the shoe and wouldn't let me out because I'd threatened to assault an officer. So I'm in there, and I don't particularly want to get out. They got COVID coming out there. And uh, I'll tell you one one little story just about. Uh, they come, Reeves got, got somebody for you, so they put somebody in there with me, and it was a young fella from El Salvador. And uh, his name, he wanted to be called Pablo. I think he thought Pablo Escobar. Anyway, he had uh, he was a transient farm worker that had been five times caught, and uh, he told me that he was from a pineapple had a home in a pineapple plantation down there, and they had a wife and children, but he was a dullish knife in the drawer, but uh, he had some kind of a lot of them have psychiatric problems, and he had, uh, I guess sleeping on the ground in the fields here in Washington, the United States, he said he made two hundred dollars a day and shipped it all home. And he lay down and a bug got in his ear and they had to cut his whole ear out to, to take that, to get that bug or whatever infection it was out of there. And they put that in so he was still sick from the stitches. And they gave him medicine and sometimes he would just turn completely red, just bright red, and he'd just wring his hands and walk back and forth. I said, Pablo, sit down here. How long has it been since anybody touched you? And he didn't know. And I said, just sit down there. And I just sat down and went to massage his shoulders. And he was, oh, 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 just pitiful what people in there without love, without touching, without no, nobody, nobody for years. Yeah. And, and tell me, you see the color just come back to him. Oh, thank you, senor, thank you. And it just, it's all mental coming to him. And uh, so I had a lock for my little little container there. And it had a three ways, like eight, 12, 14. And so he wanted to play with it. And so I said, okay, now come on, do it, do it back eight. And I'd tell him it'd pop open, he'd be so smile. <laughs> and but then he wanted to write it down. I said, no, you can remember three things. So he worked at that thing and worked at it with him and helped it. And when that thing popped open, you should have seen the smile on his face. For the rest of the time I was in there, that's what he did, open and close that lock. And so uh, we wouldn't go out. Uh, he was very shy. We had to hang towels up for him to go to the bathroom or to take a bath. But we, neither one of us wanted to go out with those guard, guards. was all covered up in cloth every which way, and it was just like dead men walking out there. <clears throat> there was eight people died in there with us. Really? Yeah, you know, the most of any place in, in the United States was right there in Terminal Island. And we was in a in a sick ward and, and in the lockdown. So... There was a little, a little uh, sink there, with a a bowl. She had to push water hard, real hard, to get a little stream of water. Well, we put a straw in it. And now you can put a sock under it. <laughs> we, we wash ourselves. We don't come in here. Just put the food through the through the slot. So we stayed in there for the last six weeks, and then they 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 came and bummed me all up and put me out on the street. And I got a ride home. I got a ride home, I come home and uh, How long all at once were you in prison? Eight, uh, 19 years at that time, when I got out that day. So I, I got home and uh, Mari was there waiting and I had on the prison clothes. And of course, uh, I just, first thing I wanted to do was just throw those things in the trash. And uh, I, uh, I went in there and just showered and scrubbed myself, shampooed, <laughs> shaved and cleaned up. And I went to the closet and all my clothes from 40 years ago and older, wow. pants I got around there, 50 years old, was hanging in the closet. She had washed and ironed and so stark, just each one of them was hanging there so pretty. And that made me cry. And my shoes, she had shined them shiny. And I put those clothes on and I put those shoes on and I took a step and the soles of the shoes stayed on the floor. All the strings had rotted. Wow. So I got the shoes with no soles. <laughs> oh, man. And I went to the table and I sit down. There's an oak table that over 50 years ago that I, with a carving knife, I cleaned all the claws and took the paint off of it and stripped it. And there was a, our, she had made a meal for me and uh, the placemats and the plates, same plates that I'd left 40 years ago. 
Same pictures on the wall. It was a small apartment now where we used to have a mansion to live in, but it was still the same. She had saved it for me just like that. And I just sit there and cry. I'll cry to tell about it right now. It just like, it took me three days. I wouldn't, I still won't look at photographs of her and her children growing up. You will not? I won't, I don't, it makes me cry. There she was, 40, 50, 60, and 70. I wasn't there for none of those birthdays. Sometimes I was out on the skate for a few years and she had joined me, but it was like I wasn't home. Damn. And she raised those children and they did well. So whatever she wants, I do now. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. That's, that's one hell of a woman. Yeah. That's amazing. I saw only three other play people in all the years I was in prison. Their wives stayed with them when they got life sentences. Yeah, it stayed a long time. I said, what'd you tell them? She said, I just told them I'm not available. Beautiful woman. Huh? I joke and say, I, I thought for sure I was going to have to shoot a husband-in-law when I got home. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't one there, thank goodness. <clears throat> Do you regret anything? Of course I regret it. Do you? Terribly, yes. I, I wasted half of my life in, the, in a cage. Yeah. Couldn't you? I mean, yeah, I had 10 years of fun and 33 years of prison. My goodness, just not worth it. And I look back on my life, I was, I was uh, immature. I had good sense, but I was just immature. And I trusted people. And I went through school with a lark. I didn't, high school, I didn't study. I didn't have to study. And I went off to college and it was like, Irk, I don't want to do this. But if I had to train myself from young to study, I, my, my middle daughter's a doctor. She just went through it, skipped right through medical school. And I could have done the same thing I kind of wanted to. I signed up for it, but I didn't have the stickability to sit down and study that stuff. And uh, I wish I had. I'd, I'd, I'd love to help people all over the world and just, uh, yes, I would, I would have loved to have done something like that. What in the world I want to do this for? Yeah. I want to farm. I want to a, a, a farm and to grow tobacco and cotton and corn. That's what I had in mind to do. That's what I wanted to do. You think you would have got, you could have got away with it if you would have just... If I would have just quit way back yonder, of course I would have got away with it. Yeah. And like when they said to make $300,000... And you could buy, in the United States, you could buy most any house you wanted for $3,000 down back then. That would have been 100 houses. Yeah. Now, if you'd done that in California, that would have been one or $200 million now. And somebody else paid for it. Very just true. Just that simple, nothing. It was just there. And I just stuck my head in deeper and deeper into the noose until it got <laughs> pulled around it. That was it. Damn. What went through your head when you found out that Pablo Escobar was dead. Uh, nothing. I thought got what he deserved. Were you happy? No, I wasn't happy or sad. I, I, I think he should have been killed. I think he should have been executed. Anybody does what he does. But uh, gives gives people like me a bad name. It had nothing to do with stuff like that. Yeah. And the Ochoas and a lot of other people that give a bad name. The man is a, was a megalomaniac. You know, different than Putin. No different than Hitler. He just made some money and puffed his chest up and think, I'm going to rule the world. And uh, everybody gets brought down, all of them. Yeah. Yeah. He was a bad for I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I ever knew him. I'm sorry he was ever involved in something like that. Do you have anything else you want to talk about? Yes. We should talk about the prison system. You want to talk about the prison system? Yes. It's so diabolically evil and unfair, unjust. It's full of poor people, poor uneducated people. It's full of people with mental illnesses. Ronald Reagan stopped the mental health program in the United States when he came in. Bam. Jimmy Carter had it. All for, for all people, for mental health. Reagan thought we don't need it. Let's put that money somewhere else. And now tens of thousands of people are on the street, homeless, 
You don't have any insane asylums. You have to be absolutely a babbling idiot to get into one of those places. So you got all these people that are just everywhere you go. They're in the parks and in the freeways asking for money. I don't mind them asking for money, but those people, they need help just like a person that's got cancer. They, their, their mind is cancerous. Something's wrong with them. And some of them look, look pretty nice, but they're not. And they come into prison. They'll be sleeping under a bridge. And a policeman or a DEA agent, I'm, I'm just saying, they'll go under that bridge and they'll, they'll do drugs with them and got a big tattoo and tattoos all over them, big mustache. And they'll get one of them to sell the other one two or three grams of methamphetamine. It's real cheap. And they'll arrest both of them. Now he's got two arrests. And he does that every month or two. Guess who makes captain? Guess who makes chief? The guy that does that kind of crap, so it's kind of terrible stuff, just entraps these ignorant people. I'm not ignorant, or mentally ill people. Alan, you've got a young lawyer, and he gets a job as a prosecutor. He wants to make judge, and the judge wants to make governor, and the governor wants to make president, and they're working their way up. So he lie, cheat, and steal anything. I want a conviction. So he gets that poor fellow that's got two grams, and he says, you plead guilty to this today, and we'll give you five years. If you don't, I'll guarantee you I'm going to get you 10 years. And that happens from two grams of methamphetamine right up to murder. And the fellow that didn't murder somebody, they said, we'll let you, we'll, if you plead guilty to manslaughter, we'll give you 10 years. But if you don't, you're going to get the needle. You're going to get the electric chair. And it scares these people that are mentally ill. They don't have a lawyer. They don't know anything about how a court system works. They don't know anything about their rights. They get a public defender that don't know much more than they do. So, and they plead guilty to these things and the prison system fills up. And the prosecutor says, I have a 98% win ratio. Yeah, he scared people into signing confessions. He know better than the Mexicans do when they beat me and stuck chili up my butt. <laughs> that's, that's the way it works. It shouldn't be that way. We should be humane. We have a wonderful country here in America. We have it. And the people just don't know. And you look at these people and you think, I don't like those people. They, they stink. We don't want them. Put them in jail. Lock them up. And that's what Mr. and Mrs. Nice out there think. They should look at them what they really are. So that, that's our prison system today and our judicial system. And it needs to change. Those people need to come out of prison and they need to go to mental health. The people that are in there for drug offenses, all of them should be out of there. If two people sell each other something, yes, we can't have that. But it shouldn't be life in prison, 10 years, five years. There's punishment and you got your laws to do it. But it's, it, the crime should, the time should fit the crime. I agree and, with that. And, st and take away from this penitentiary. Nobody's doing penance anymore. That was Quakers. They're not. It's just like, it's just evil. I will shut you in a cage and treat you bad. And in Australia, they tell you straight up. The warden says, you, when the judge sentences you, that's your punishment to be away from your loved ones and away from your society for this number of years. We are not here to punish you. Not so America. And the discontent between the blacks and the browns and the whites is just awful in there now. When I first went in there 40 years ago, we all got along. And they do to some degree. But I got sent down there. When I got sent to Terminal Island, I got in the misplaced a lot of people in their wheelchairs and limping around and dying and bags on them and i went into the tv room and no 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 senors no senor you white you don't don't come here this is this is for the latinos i said i speak spanish I'm like, no senor por favor no I really he said no this this is only for the latinos and i go across and then one across the way what you doing <laughs> This is black, tell him, get the fuck out of you, man. They weren't, what? 
we play chess out here. Yeah, that's out there. But in here, it's black. You know, they don't come across that door. What? So I have to go plumb to the other side and another TV. And there's old white men in there with a the long hair and yellow mustaches from smoking. They're in the wheelchairs and sitting around in there. And I come in, they says, show us your paperwork. Don't come in here till you show your paperwork. What are you talking about? I ain't showing you shit, man. Well, we'll take you out. Well, you gonna take me out in that wheelchair? <laughs> so, no, man, don't, don't come in here. You gotta see you have, you might be a pedophile. You might be a snitch. You might be a homosexual. I said, what? They can't come in here? No. They got their place down at the gym. I, what in the world's the matter with you people? That's, so that's what it's got to. Just hatred between people from yeah. the races of what they did. And in the chow hall, you don't dare sit at that table over there. Boy, that's the important boys. And these over here, they, they are informers. And these over here are pedophiles. And these over here are these. And they're all separated there in the chow hall. They're all in prison. Of course, I can understand some of it, but it's gone way too far. Wow. That's the U.S. prison system, and that's the U.S. how they got there. Do you think you will become an advocate for prison reform? Oh, absolutely. If anything, they got all kind of stuff that's going on, and just it's, people worry about where a little boy's going to go pee-pee. I mean, they ought to be worried about something worthwhile. <laughs> and prisons is a good spot to start, and mental health is even right up there with it. Those two things. And it's so simple to straighten out. Just absolutely. What do you think the solution is? Mental health programs, money, a lot of money, and trickle down to the right people. There's plenty of money. Yeah. Billions and trillions of dollars, these corporations. I, I'm, I'm completely against all this big corporations on everything. Whatever in the world happened to the store, the little donut shop, the little whatever, they all own by... Walmarts and mm -hmm. all, all these big ones. How did we let them just take over? Nobody can make a living anymore with, with a business out there. What happened? That just, I don't know if that'll ever change, but it's, it's wrong. I should be able to open a store on the corner and make a living. You can't. You can't, can't compete with those people. They buy out of China, get it shipped over here, and have labor that's $5 a day made it. Yep. You, can't, you can't work with it. I, uh, I had bees. I was a beekeeper. I had 500 hives of bees. And I was getting 42 cents a pound for honey and using pollination. And the government says, okay, we're going to free trade. We're going to let Brazil and every other country ship. Honey went to seven cents a pound. <laughs> I couldn't even look after the bees. Had to, get, had, had to give them away and nobody wanted to buy them. So that stuff is happening to all kind of human beings, not little people, people that want to work. Yeah. So do you get a job driving a truck for UPS or whatever for 25 bucks an hour? You, oh, man, my wife's got one too. And, and try to make a living that way. But it shouldn't be that way. But I'm not talking about big business. I'm just talking about the, the government should take some of these trillions and billions of dollars that they're spending and put it in the right position, right place. That uh, we talk about how much money was wasted in uh uh, Afghanistan and the Middle East in that war. I don't say that it wasn't necessary, but they said when you talk about how much it was, I read you can't you can't have any number when you get numbers with, with ten and or nine and, and zero from here to the wall. It doesn't make any difference. Yeah. But I understand it cost in goods and services. An, it cost every human being from a little tiny baby to the oldest person in the United States a brand new three bedroom home. Now, you put it in that perspective, and you say, wow. Well, there's a lot of money being laced on a lot of things. Of course you know? it is. And uh, put, I mean, everybody's put it to complaining use. about school shootings right now, which they should be. Of right? course. Should and stop then they it. hired 89,000 IRS agents. Yes. They could have hired the 89,000, I don't know, people to protect the schools. Yes. But, but they hired 89,000. Thousand is it eighty seven or eighty nine thousand? To, to try to make sure new ones, new ones. I, I saw that. 
Where in the world? What did they come for? You know, we sent fifty-four billion to Ukraine. You know, instead yeah. of spending it on our own infrastructure. But I think it all just comes back around in these guys' pockets. You know, a little goes to Ukraine, funnels back in. You know, oh, obviously the IRS. Oh, so dishonest, so yeah. Terrible. But anyway, if they would put up the money, first off, for mental health, that would, that would, and I mean for sure, you take, treat those people right. They don't have to pamper them. Just get them off the street and give them something to eat and clean their clothes up and give them a haircut and a, and a shave and oh, I mean, you know, just yeah. absolutely clean. Give them a, they got a, a prison cell for them. Why in the world can't they make a little room for them somewhere outside of the town where they got a where they got a streetcar, a, a bus service right back and forth, and and if they the ones that need mental health medicine, the ones that need mental health nurses, doctors, get that, and make it go. Now then, you're going to stop the influx to the prisons if those people have somewhere else to go, and then next go into prison. See about those people. If they are deemed possible and not dangerous, and they got mental health, you put them in a facility out there that was made for that problem, not a not a penitentiary. Let them go. Let them get a little, little humanity. Let's just show some love in this country. Take care of our own. I mean, it needs to be done. It needs to be stomped hard down done. And we need to teach in schools family, family values, about how many children you can afford. How old do you have to be to have a child? My daughter is a doctor, and she delivered a baby to a 10-year-old girl. Oh, man. Four generations in the visiting room, all of them on welfare, and all of them with a bunch of children in each generation. And I say that little boy's like Elvis Presley's song in the ghetto. She doesn't have much of a chance. Poor, poor little things. I said, it shouldn't be. You have to have a permit to ride a moped in the United States, the most anywhere else. How much more important to bring a child into this world? I say that a little sparrow builds her nest before she lays an egg. We don't have that much sense. That's very true. What was it like when you got out of prison? You made a video about this. It got, what, six million views in 12 hours or something? Yes. And then they took it down. But I'll play the video right now. Hello, folks. I just got out of prison after doing 33 years of marijuana. And the first sign I saw when I come down the road, relax, we deliver your marijuana to you. But what was it like for you to come out of prison, and you'd spent many years in prison for marijuana, not counting the cocaine stuff, but for marijuana, and then you saw that sign, we'll deliver it right to your front door. It just made me smile all over, and I say, how ironic, how stupid the world is. I mean, it's just <laughs> absolutely that. It was, it's just ridiculous. And how many people, they were shot and killed and put life in prison for marijuana. Yes. And now it's, now it's okay. <laughs> now they deliver it to your front door. That's right. It was the same thing when I was making whiskey in Georgia. You go across the river in Florida, my wife couldn't understand it. Well, it, it's, you can go down there and buy all you want. And up here, they'll shoot and kill you. Yeah. Just one state to another. So I made the old moonshine. <laughs> and it's, now it's in every town, everywhere, same place, liquor stores, you go in a little store and a little gal behind the counter can hand you a jug of whiskey just like nothing. Take the, take the cigarettes off of the counter and just give them out. I mean, it's just so much stuff. It's just, just yeah. ridiculous. Well, Roger, I, I want to wrap this thing up, but um, you have got one hell of a story behind you. And... Um, for anybody listening, I just want to say all the links. If you're looking to get in touch with Roger or follow him on social media, all the links are below. The book is linked below. 
I hope your book sales go up. Yeah, and, don't forget that book, folks. <laughs> and what um, what do you got coming up? I know you got some stuff maybe in the works. Do you want to talk about that or no? Nah? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that uh, I, I want to make a, a series about this, and, and there's uh, people looking into it. But uh, I, ho I hope they do. And I uh, had a couple of writers, and they, they say they have a, a deck laid out for 30. But we'll see if it, it goes. It, it, it's a, there's a chance of it. And uh, so I'd like to get the story out there. Well, it'll be a hell of a story to watch. We'll be watching. And uh, I just want to say it was a real pleasure to meet you and your wife and hang out with you guys. And, and, and it was a real pleasure to get your story out. And I, Thank you, I just Sean. wish you the best of luck. The likewise for us. It was really good to invite us. Cheers. Good. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.